This is Audible. Audible Frontiers presents Bleak Seasons, written by Glenn Cook and narrated by Jonathan Davis. Incessant wind sweeps the plain. It mutters across gray pavements that sweep from horizon to horizon. It sings around scattered black pillars, a chorus of ghosts. It tumbles leaves and scatters dust to come from afar. It teases the hair of a corpse that has lain undisturbed for a generation, mummifying. Impishly, the gale tosses a leaf into the cadaver's silently screaming mouth, tugs it away again. The wind carries the breath of winter. Lightning leaps from pillar to ebon pillar like a child skittering from base to base in a game of tag. For a moment there is color on that spectral plane. The pillars might be mistaken for relics of a fallen city. They are not. They are too few and too randomly placed. Nor has a one ever fallen, though many have been gnawed deeply by the teeth of the hungry wind. Chapter One Fragments Just blackened fragments crumbling between my fingers. Browned page corners that reveal half a dozen words in a crabbed hand. Their context no longer known. All that remains of two volumes of the annals. A thousand hours of labor. Four years of history. Gone forever. Or are they? I do not want to go back. I do not want to relive the horror. I do not want to reclaim the pain. There is pain too deep to withstand right here, right now. There is no way to recapture the totality of that awfulness anyway. The mind and heart, safely over to the farther shore, simply refuse to encompass the enormity of the voyage. And there is no time. There is a war on. Always there is a war on. Uncle Doge wants something. Just as well to stop now. Teardrops make the ink run. He is going to make me drink some strange filter. Fragments. All around. Fragments of my work, my life, my love and my pain scattered in this bleak season. And in the darkness, shards of time. Chapter Two Hey there, welcome to the City of the Dead. I don't mind those guys staring. Ghosts don't see a lot of strangers, at least of a friendly persuasion. You're right, they do look hungry. That happens during these siege things. Try not to look too much like a lamb roast. Think that's a joke? Stay away from the gnar. Welcome to Dejagore, what the Taglians call this death trap. The teeny brown Shadowlanders the Black Company grabbed it from call it Stormguard. People who actually live here always call it Jaikur, even when that was a crime. And who knows what the Nguyen Bao call it? And who cares, huh? They aren't talking and they aren't part of the equation anyway. 
That's one of them, that rascal there. No meat on him and a skull face. Everybody around here is some shade of brown, but theirs is different. It has a gray cast to it, almost deathly. You won't mistake a Nguyen Bao for anything else. Their eyes are like polished coal no fire will ever warm. That noise? Sounds like Mugaba, the Nar, and the First Legion rooting out Shadowlanders again. Some get inside almost every night. They're like field mice. You just can't get rid of them all. Found some the other day that had been in hiding since the company took the city. How about that smell out there? It was worse before the Shadowlanders started burying the bodies. Maybe a shovel was a little too complicated a machine. Those long mounds that radiate from the city like spokes have corpses stacked like cordwood inside. Sometimes they didn't pile the dirt on deep enough and the gases of corruption burst the mounds open. That's when you hope the wind is blowing their way. You see how positively they're thinking, all the not-yet-filled trenches they're digging. A lot of the dirt goes into the ramps. The elephants are the worst. They take forever to rot. They tried burning them once, but all that did was irritate the buzzards. So, where they could, they just dragged the bodies over and incorporated them into their ramps. Who? The ugly little guy with the uglier hat? That is one eye. You must have been warned about him. How come one eye? On account of the eye patch? Clever, huh? The other run is Goblin. You should have been warned about him, too. No? Well, stay out of their way. All the time is best but especially if they're arguing, and most particularly if they've been drinking. As wizards go, they're no earth shakers, but they're more than you'll be able to handle. Puny as they are, they're the main reason the Shadowlanders have stayed out there in the country roughing it, leaving the wallowable luxuries of the city to the Taglian troops and Black Company. No, now pay attention. Goblin is the white one. All right, you're right. He is overdue for his annual bath. Goblin is the one who looks like a toad. One eye is the one with the hat in the patch. The guys in the once upon a time they were white tunics are Taglian soldiers. Every day now, every one of them asks himself what damned fool notion made him enroll in the legions. The folks wearing the colored sheets and unhappy expressions are locals. Jaikuri. Fancy this. When the company and the legions swooped down from the north and surprised Storm Shadow, they hailed the newcomers as liberators. They strew the streets with rose petals and favorite daughters. Now the only reason they don't stab their liberators in the back is that the alternative is worse. Now they're alive enough to starve and be abused. Shadow Spinner is not famous for kindness and kissing babies. The kids all over. Those almost happy and fat urchins? Nguyeng Bao. All Nguyeng Bao. The Jaikuri nearly stopped making babies after the Shadow Masters came. Most of the few that were born failed to survive the hard times since. The handful still breathing are protected more fiercely than any treasure. You won't find them running naked through the streets, squealing and totally ignoring strangers. Who are the Nguyen Bao? You never heard of them? It's a good question, and a hard one to answer. The Nguyen Bao don't talk to outsiders except through their speaker, but the word is that they are religious pilgrims who were on the homeward leg of a once-in-a-generation Hodge who got trapped by circumstance. The Taglian soldiers say they hail from vast river delta swamps west of Taglios. They're a primitive, minuscule minority, abhorred by the majority Guni, Vedna, and Shadar religions. The whole Nguyen Bao people makes the pilgrimage. 
and the whole people got caught right in the deep shit here in Dejagore. They need to work on their timing. Or they should sharpen their skills at appeasing their gods. The Black Company cut a deal with the Nguyen Bao. Goblin and their speaker gobbled for half an hour and it was settled. The Nguyen Bao would ignore the Black Company and Taglians for whom the company is responsible. The Nguyen Bao would be ignored in turn. It works. Mostly. Their men are a sort you don't want to upset. They don't take shit from anybody. They never start anything, except, according to the Taglians, by being too damned stubborn to do what they're told. Sounds like one-eye-style reasoning at work there. Just kick those crows. They're getting too goddamn bold. Think they own the place. Hey, you got one. Grab it. They aren't good eating, but they're a sight better than no eating at all. Shit. Got away. How that happens. Head for the Citadel. You get your best look at the layout from up there. Chapter 3 Those guys? Their company. Never guess, huh? White guys down here? The one with the wild hair is Big Bucket. He turned into a pretty fair sergeant. He's just crazy enough. With him are Otto and Hagop. They've been around longer than anybody but Goblin and One-Eye. Those two have been old crew for generations. One-Eye ought to be sneaking up on 200. That bunch is company too, shirking work. The antique lunger is Weezer. Not much good for anything. How he got through the big brawl, no one knows. They say he busted heads with the best of them. The other two black guys are the geek and the freak. No telling why. Nothing wrong with them. Look like a couple of rubbed ebony statues, don't they? You think these names just come out of a hat? They earned them the hard way. Usually they come out from under one eye's hat, really. Yeah, they probably have real names. But they've been called by nicknames so long, even they have trouble remembering. Goblin and One-Eye are the main ones not to forget. And to remember not to put behind you. They do not deal well with temptation. This is glimmers like Dewdrop Street. Nobody knows why. A real mouthful, right? You ought to hear it in Jaikuri. A jawbreaker. This is the route the company took coming in to snatch the tower. Maybe they'll rename it Runs with Blood Street. Yeah, the company charged through her in the heart of the night, killing anything that moved and jammed in there before they had any idea what was happening. With shapeshifters' help, they roared on up the tower, where they let him help finish off Storm Shadow before they tagged him. It was an old company grudge. They owed Shifter from another generation when Shifter, helping Soulcatcher break the city's resistance, murdered One-Eye's brother Tom Tom when the company was in service to the Syndic of Beryl. Croker, One-Eye, and Goblin, Otto, and Hagop are the only guys left from those days. Hell, Croker's gone now, isn't he? History-worshipping slob is buried out there in one of those mounds, fertilizing the plain. Mogaba's the old man now, sort of in his own mind. Those who form it come and go, but the company is forever. Every brother, great or small, is a snack just not yet snapped up by the devouring maw of time. Those big black monster men watching the gate are the Gnar. They're descendants of the black company of centuries ago. Scary beasts, aren't they? Mogaba and a whole herd of his pals joined the company quest at Geazli. The old crew have had no pleasure of them. You mix the whole crowd up and squeeze them dry you could not come up with two ounces of sense of humor. There used to be a lot more of them than there are now, but they keep getting themselves killed. They're bone crazy the whole lot. For them, the company is a religion. Only their company is not the black company of the old crew. That becomes more apparent almost by the hour. All Nars stand more than six feet tall. 
All Nar run like the wind and leap like gazelles. Mogava chose only the most athletic and warriorly to join the quest for Kadovar. All the Nar are quick as cats and strong as gorillas. All the Nar use their weapons like they were born with them in their hands. The rest, the ones who call themselves the old crew, yeah, it is true. The company is more than a job. If it was just a job, just selling swords to whoever would pay, the Black Company would not be in this part of the world. There was work aplenty in the North. The world never lacks for potentates who want to bully their subjects or neighbors. The company is family for those who belong. The company is home. The company is a nation of outcasts, alone and defying the whole world. Now the company is trying to complete its cycle of life. It's on a quest in search of its birthplace, fabled Katovar. But all the world seems determined that Katovar shall be unattainable. A virgin, forever hidden behind a veil of shadow. The company is home, sure. But Croker was the only one who ever went completely misty-eyed over that damned angle. For him, the Black Company was a mystery cult. Though he never went as far as Mogaba and made it a holy calling. Watch your step. They still don't have all the mess cleaned out from the last attack, if you couldn't tell by the smell. The Jaikuri don't help much anymore. Maybe it's lack of civic pride. The Nguyen Bao? They're just here. They stay out of the way. They have this notion that they can stay neutral. They'll learn. Shadow Spinner is going to teach them. Nobody stays neutral in this world. The best you can do is choose your spot to jump in. Little out of shape, you'll come around. A few weeks running hither and yon, blunting Shadow Spinner's probes and hustling out on Mogaba's spoiling raids will get you as sharp as a Nguyen Bao sword. You thought sieges were all just laying around relaxing and waiting the other guy out? Man, this other guy is a foamy mouth lunatic. And not just nuts. He's a sorcerer. A major player, though he hasn't shown much here. Before the old man got himself off in the big slugfest that trapped everyone here, he hurt Spinner real bad. The old devil just hasn't been himself since. Poor baby. This is it, top of the tower. And there is the whole stinking burg, laid out like it is on one of those sand tables Lady always liked. Oh, yeah. Those rumors have made it here, too. They started with some Shadowlander prisoners. Maybe that was Keena up north, or something. But it could not have been Lady. She died right out there. Fifty guys saw her taken down. Half of them got killed trying to rescue her. How can you say that? You can't be sure. How many eyewitnesses does it take? She's dead. The old man is dead. They're all dead. Them what did not get inside before Mogaba sealed the gates. The whole mob is dead all but the crowd in here. And they're caught between lunatics. It's a toss-up who's crazier, Mogaba or Shadow Spinner. You see it all? That is it. Dejigore enduring the siege of the Shadow Masters. Not real impressive, is it? But every one of those burned areas memorializes a ferocious hand-to-hand, house-to-house negotiation with the Shadowlanders. Fires start easily in Dejigore. Hell is supposed to be hot, isn't it? Chapter 4 Who I am on the improbably remote chance that my scribblings do survive. I am Mergen, 
standard bearer of the Black Company, though I bear the shame of having lost the standard in battle. I am keeping unofficial annals because Croker is dead, one I won't, and hardly anyone else can read or write. I was the heir Croker trained. I will do it, even without official sanction. I will be your guide for a few months or weeks or days, however long it takes the Shadowlanders to force our present predicament to its inevitable end. Nobody inside these walls is going to get out of this. There are too many of them and too few of us. Our sole advantage is that our commander is as mad as theirs. That makes us unpredictable. Don't add much hope, though. Mogaba will not give up as long as he personally is capable of hanging onto something with one hand while he throws rocks with the other. I expect my writings to blow away on a dark wind, never to be touched by another eye. Or they might become the tinder Shadow Spinner uses to light the pyre under the last man he murders after taking Dejigori. If anyone does find this, brother, we begin. This is the Book of Mergen, last of the annals of the Black Company. The long tale winds down. I will die lost and frightened in a world so alien I cannot understand a tenth of it when I focus all my soul. It is so old. Time lies heavily here. Two thousand year old traditions underpin incredible absurdities taken completely for granted. Dozens of races and cultures and religions exist in a mix that should be volatile, but has persisted so long that conflicts are just reflexive twitches in an ancient body mostly too tired to bother anymore. Taglios is only one large principality. There are scores more, mostly now in the Shadowlands, all pretty similar. The major peoples are the Guni, the Shadar, and the Vedna, names which define religion, race, and culture all at once. The Guni are the most numerous and widespread. Guni temples, to a bewilderingly broad pantheon, are so numerous you're seldom out of sight of one. Physically, Guni are small and dark, but not black like the Nar. Guni men wear toga-like robes, weather permitting. Their bright mix of colors declare caste, cult, and professional alliances. Women, too, dress brightly, but in several layers of wraparound cloth. They veil their faces, if unmarried, though marriages are made early. They wear their dowries as jewelry. Before they go out, they illustrate their foreheads with the caste cult professional markings of both their husbands and their fathers. I will never decipher those hieroglyphs. Shadar are paler, like heavily tanned whites from the north. They are big, usually over six feet. They do not shave or pluck their beard, unlike the Guni. Some sects never cut their hair. Bathing is not forbidden, but it is a vice seldom indulged. Shadar all dress in gray and wear turbans to define their status. They eat meat, Guni do not. I have never seen a Shadar woman. Maybe they find their babies under cabbage leaves. The Vedna are the least numerous of the major Taglian ethnic groups. They are as light as the Shadar, but smaller, more lightly built, with ferocious features. They share none of the Shadar's Spartan values. Their religion forbids almost everything, rules honored in the breach quite often. They like a little color in their costume, though not bright like the Guni. 
They wear pantaloons and real shoes. Even the poorest conceal their bodies and wear something atop their heads. Low-caste goonies wear nothing but loincloths. Married Vedna women wear only black. You can see nothing but their eyes. Unmarried Vedna women, you don't see at all. Only the Vedna believe in an afterlife, and that only for men, except for a few female warrior saints and daughters of prophets who had balls big enough to be honorary men. Yuang Bao, rarely seen, usually wear loose-fitting long-sleeve pullover shirts and baggy lightweight pants, generally black, men and women alike. Children go naked. Any city down here is glorious chaos. It is always a holy day for somebody. Chapter 5 from the Citadel Tower, it is obvious that Dejagore is a complete contrivance. Of course, most walled cities are shaped by the probability that, part of the time, neighboring states will be managed by thugs. Your own city's masters will never be worse than benevolent despots, of course, and their worst ambition will be to heighten the hometown glory until the appearance of the Shadow Masters one short generation ago, war was an alien concept throughout this part of the world. It had seen neither armies nor soldiers in all the centuries since the Black Company's departure. Into this improbable paradise came the Shadow Masters, lords of darkness from the far reaches of the earth, who brought with them all the wolves of the old nightmare. Soon, inept armies were about. They stalked unprepared kingdoms like great cruel behemoths even the gods could not stay. The dark tide spread. Cities crumbled. A lucky few the Shadow Masters chose to rebuild. The peoples of the newly founded Shadowlands were given their options. Obedience or death. Jaikur was reborn as Stormguard, seat of the Shadow Master Storm Shadow. She who could bring the winds and thunder howling and bellowing in the darkness. She who had borne the name Stormbringer in another age and place. First, Storm Shadow raised a mound, forty feet high, on top of the ruins of captured Jaikur. At the heart of a plain she had flattened absolutely by slaves and prisoners of war. Earth for the mound came from the ring of hills completely surrounding the plain. With the mound complete and faced on its outer sides with several layers of imported stone, Storm Shadow built her new city up top. And that she surrounded with walls another forty feet high. She did not overlook the latest theories about towers for enfilading fire and barbicans to protect her elevated gates. All the Shadow Masters seemed driven by a paranoid need to make themselves safe in their home places. Never once in her planning, though, did she take into account the possibility that she might have to resist the onslaught of the Black Company. I wish we were half as wicked as I talk. Dejagore has four gates. Each stands at one point of the compass rose. Each is at the end of a paved highway running straight in from the hills. Only the road from the south carries any traffic these days. Mogaba has sealed three gates, leaving only sally ports which are guarded by his gnar at all times. Mogaba is determined to fight. He is just as determined that not one of our raggedy-ass Taglian legionnaires will run off and not go down with him. None of us, be we Black Company old crew, gnar, jaikuri, Taglian, Nguengbao, or someone else who had the bad luck to get caught here, is going to get out alive. 
Not unless Shadow Spinner and his gang get so bored they go looking for someone else to bully. Right. You've got the eight and ten of swords, and to go down, you're going to bet your ass on pulling the nine. Your chances of pulling that nine are better than hours of getting out of here. The fortified encampment of the Shadowlanders stands south of the city. It is so close we can reach it with our heavy artillery. You can see charred timbers where we tried to burn them out the day of the big battle. We have raided them a few times since then, too, but no longer have the strength to risk. We can't seem to discourage Shadow Spinner, though. Like most warlords, he doesn't let reality get in the way of his doing whatever he wants to do. The artillery gives them a wake-up five nights out of five, pick a random time. That keeps them cranky and tired and a lot less effective whenever they attack. Trouble is, so much effort keeps us tired and cranky, too. And we have other projects going as well. Shadow Spinner is a puzzle. He's not the first of his kind in company experience. The heavyweight killers in our past, though, when faced with a situation like this, would have stomped on Dejagore like jumping on an anthill before looking for a real challenge. But here... Lightweights, Goblin and One-Eye, can slide around quickly and treacherously enough to parry Spinner's every feeble thrust. His weakness is a mystery. Makes you nervous when an enemy doesn't do everything you think he can. And a Shadow Spinner doesn't become a top badass being gentle. One-Eye sees everything in its wickedest light. He says Spinner is slacking because Long Shadow has a hold on him and is weakening him deliberately. Your basic old-time power politics with the company in the middle. Before we came along, the Shadow Masters did find their biggest challenges in fighting one another. On principle, Goblin seldom agrees with one eye about anything. He claims Shadow Spinner is lulling us while he recovers from wounds that were more serious than we suspected. My guess is six of one, half a dozen of the other. Crows circle the Shadowlander camp. Always they circle. Some come, some go, but a baker's dozen minimum are there all the time. Others haunt us day and night. Wherever I go, whenever, a crow is nearby. Except inside. They don't get inside. We don't let them inside. Those that try end up in somebody's pot. Croker had a thing about crows. I think I understand it now. But the bats bother me more. We don't see the bats as often. The crows get most of them. These crows are not ashamed to come out at night. And those that the crows don't get, we do, most of the time. Inevitably, though, a few get away. And that isn't good. They spy for the Shadow Masters. They're the far-ranging eyes of wickedness out here, where our enemies cannot always manipulate the living darkness. Only two Shadow Masters remain. Spinner has problems. They do not have the reach or control they showed back when they could and did run the shadows into the very heart of the Taglian territories. They are fading from the stage. One dreams. Dreams, too easily, become nightmares. Chapter 6 When you look down from the citadel, you have to wonder how the Jaikuri manage, all jammed inside Dejigore's walls. Truth is, they don't, and never did. At one time, the hills surrounding the plain were covered with farms and orchards and vineyards. After the shadow came, enterprises gradually disappeared as the peasant families abandoned the land. 
And then the anti-shadow, the black company, came, ever so hungry after the long sprint south from the victory at Goja Ford. And then came the Shadowlander armies which battered us. Now the hills bear little but memories of what once was. Vultures never picked bones much cleaner than those hills have been gleaned. The wisest peasants were those who fled early. Their children will repopulate the land. Later, the stupid ones ran here, inside the false safety of Dejigore's walls. When Mogaba is particularly cranky, he drives a few hundred out the gate. They are just mouths crying to be filled. Food must be husbanded for those willing to die defending the walls. Locals who fail to contribute or who demonstrate a weakness for getting sick or seriously injured go out the gate right behind the peasants. Shadow Spinner won't take any in, but those willing to help raise his earthworks and dig his burial trenches. The former means laboring under falls of missiles directed by old friends inside, while the latter means making the bed where you will lie as soon as you are useful no longer. Hard choices. Mogaba cannot fathom why his military genius isn't universally hailed. He doesn't mess with the Nguyen Bao. Not yet. They haven't contributed much to Dejigore's defense, but they don't sap resources either. Their babies are getting fat while the rest of us tighten our belts. You don't see many dogs or cats now. Horses manage only because they are militarily protected, and then only a handful of them. We're going to eat hearty when the last fodder is gone. Small game, like rats and pigeons, are becoming scarce. Sometimes you hear the outraged protest of a crow taken by surprise. The Nguyen Bao are survivors. They are a race possessed of a single, impassive face. Mogaba does not bother them mainly because, when anybody does, the whole bunch gets pissed off. And they consider fighting a really serious, holy business. They stay out of the way when they can, but they aren't pacifists. A couple of times, the Shadowlanders have regretted trying to push through their part of town. The Nguyen Bao generated an amazing amount of carnage both times. Rumor among the Jaikuri says they eat their enemies. It is true. Human bones showing evidence of butchery and cookery have been found. Jaikuri are mainly of the Guni religion. Guni are vegetarians. I do not believe the Nguyen Bao are responsible, but Ki Dam refuses to deny even the blackest allegation against his people. Maybe he will accept any canard that makes the Nguyen Bao seem more dangerous. Maybe he wants that kind of talk, so fear will build. Survivors grasp the tools at hand. I wish they would talk. I'd bet they could tell stories that would curl your toes and straighten your hair. Ah, Dejagore. Those halcyon days, slouching through hell with a smile on. How long before all the fun goes out of the town? Chapter 7 Bone tired, just as I had been every night for as long as I could remember. I went to take my turn on the wall. I had no ambition at all and even less energy. Seated in a crenel, I heaped aspersions on the ancestors of all my bitty Shadowlander buddies. 
I am afraid I lacked creativity, but I made up for that with virulence. They were up to something out there. You could hear rattlings and mutterings and see torches moving around. There were all the harbingers of a night without sleep. Couldn't these people be normal and handle their business during regular hours? It didn't sound like they were more enthusiastic than me. I caught the occasional sharp remark about me or my four daddies. Like this mess was all my fault. I guess they were motivated mainly by their sure knowledge that they would never go home if they didn't recapture Stormguard. Maybe nobody on either side would get out of this one alive. A crow called, mocking us all. I didn't bother throwing a rock at it. It was misty out. A half-hearted drizzle came and went. Lightning stalked beyond the hills to the south. It had been hot and humid all day, then had turned viciously stormy toward evening. Lakes of water stood in the streets. Storm Shadow's engineers had not made good drainage a high priority, despite the natural advantages available. It would not be a good night for attacking tall walls, and not much easier for anyone defending them. Still, I almost felt sorry for the little buggers down below. Candles and Red Rudy finished the long climb from the street, groaning. Each carried a heavy leather sack. Candles grumbled. I'm too old for this shit. If it works out, we'll all get to get old. Both men leaned on Merlin's while they caught their wind. Then they dumped their sacks into the darkness. Somebody down there swore in a Shadowlander dialect. Serves you right, asshole! Rudy growled back. Go home! Let me sleep! All of the old crew invested time hauling dirt. I know, Candles told me. I know. But what good is alive if you're too damned tired to give a shit? If you read the annals, you know our brothers have said the same thing since the beginning. I shrugged. I could come up with nothing inspirational. Mostly, you don't try to justify or motivate. You just go on. Candles grumbled. Goblin wants you. We'll cover you here. In battered Shadowlander, Rudy shouted downward. Yeah, I know your turkey gobble. Fuck you. I grunted. It was my watch, but I could leave if I wanted. Mogaba didn't even pretend to try to control the old crew anymore. We did our part. We held our ground. We just would not conform to his ideas of what the Black Company ought to be. But there was going to be one hell of a showdown if the Shadow Master and his circus ever hit the road. Where is he? Down three. That he signed in finger speech. We use deaf speech frequently if we talk business out in the open. Bats and crows can't read it. Neither can any of Mogaba's faction. I grunted again. Be back. Sure. I descended the steep, slippery stair, muscles aching, anticipating the weight of the sack I would be carrying when I came back. What could Goblin want? Probably a decision on something trivial. That runt and his monocular sidekick, religiously avoid taking on any responsibility. I run the old crew most of the time because nobody else wants to bother. We have established ourselves in an area of tall brick tenements close to the wall southwest of the North Gate, which is the only gate still fully functional. From the first hour of the siege, we have been improving our position. 
Mogaba thinks in terms of attack. He does not believe a war can be won from behind stone walls. He wants to meet the Shadowlanders on the wall, to throw them back, then to charge outside and stomp them. He launches spoiling raids and nuisance attacks to keep them wobbly. He won't prepare for the possibility that they might get inside the city in significant numbers, although almost every attack puts Shadowlanders on our side of the wall before we can concentrate enough to push them back. Some day, some time, things won't go Mogaba's way. Some day, Shadow Spinner's people are going to grab a gate. Some day, we are going to see full scale city war. That is inevitable. The old crew is ready, Mogaba. Are you? We will become invisible, your arrogance. We have played this game before. We read the annals. We will be the ghosts who kill. We hope. Shadows are the question. Shadows are the problem. What do they know? What will they be able to find? Those villains have not been called shadow masters just because they love the darkness. Chapter 8 with the exceptions of three hidden doors, all entrances to the company's quarters had been bricked up. Likewise, every window opening below third-floor levels. Alleys and breezeways are now a maze of death traps. The three usable entrances can be reached only by climbing outside stairways subject to missile fire their entire rise. Where we could manage, we have fireproofed. For the Black Company... There's no inactivity during the days of siege. Even one eye works, when I can find him. Every man stays too damned busy and too damned tired to dwell upon our situation. After entering a concealed entrance known only to the brothers of the old crew, the crows and bats, the shadows, the Nguyen Bao watchers down the street, and any gnar who care to keep track of the North Barbican, I trundled down flight after flight of steps. I reached a basement where Big Bucket dozed beside a lonely, fitful little candle. Quiet though I was, he cracked an eyelid. He wasted no breath on a challenge. A ramshackle twisted wardrobe tilted against the wall behind him, its door hanging crookedly on one damaged hinge. I pulled the door gently and eased inside. Any outsider force reaching the cellar would find the wardrobe stuffed with desperately meager food stores. The cabinet fronts a tunnel. Tunnels join all our buildings. Mogaba and anyone else interested might expect as much. If they got down into our cellars, a little work would show them what they hoped to find. That ought to satisfy them. The tunnel entered another cellar. Several men were asleep there amidst tremendous clutter and a smell like a bear's den. I moved slowly until recognized. Had I been an intruder, I would not have been the first never to return from the underworld. Now I entered the real secret places. New Stormguard rose atop old Jaikur. Little effort was made to demolish the old town. Many of the earlier structures had been in excellent condition. We have a bewildering maze dug out down where no one ought to think to look. It gets a tad bigger whenever a sack of earth goes to the wall or into one of our other projects. It is no cozy warren, though. It takes willpower to go down into those dank, dark places where the air hardly moves, candles never come wholly to life, and there is at least a chance that any shadow may harbor a screaming death. And me? I have a thing about being buried alive. It gets no easier with practice. 
Hagop and Otto, Goblin and One Eye and I, went through this before, on the plane of fear, where for about 5,000 years we lived like badgers in the ground. Cletus, where's Goblin? Cletus is one of three brothers who serve as our engineers and master artillerymen. Around the corner, next cellar. Cletus, Loftus, and Longinus are geniuses. They figured out how to bring fresh air down the chimneys of existing structures up top, then into the deep tunnels, let it flow slowly through the complex, then send it up other chimneys. Plain engineering, but it seemed like sorcery to me. A flow of breathable air, though slow and never pure, serves us well enough. It does nothing to lessen the damp and the smell. I found Goblin. He was holding a candle for Longinus while the latter slapped wet mortar onto freshly scrubbed stonework about eye level. What's the problem, Goblin? Rained like a bastard up there, eh? God swiped a river somewhere and dropped it here. Why? We've got a thousand leaks down here. Big problem? Could be later on. There's no drainage. We're as low as we can go unless the twelve tunnel goes good. Sounds like an engineering problem to me. It is, Longina said, smoothing the mortar. And Cleet did anticipate it. We've waterproofed from the start. Trouble is, you can't tell how you're doing until you get a really nasty rain. We're lucky it didn't go on the way it does during the rainy season. Three days of that, we might have gotten flooded out. Still sounds like an engineering problem. You can handle it, right? Longina shrugged. We'll work on it. That's all we can do, Croker. Little dig there. Like telling me, let everybody do their own worrying. That's why you wanted me? It seemed a little weak, even for Goblin. No. Longo, you don't hear anything. The toad-faced man made a complex gesture with three fingers of his left hand as he said that. Some half-hinted glimmer trailed behind his fingers momentarily. Longinus went back to work like he was deaf. It's so important you need to cut him out? He talks. He don't mean no harm, but he can't help repeating everything he hears. And makes it better when he tells it, I know. All right, tell me. Something has happened with the Shadow Master. He's changed. Me and one I only decided for sure about an hour ago, but we think it's been going on for a while. He's just kept us from seeing it. What? Goblin leaned closer as though Longinus might yet eavesdrop. He's gotten well, Mergen. He's just about back to normal. He's been getting his feet under him before he comes down on us with them both at once. We also decided that he is hiding the change more from his buddy Longshadow than he is from us. We don't scare him that much. I stiffened, recalling strange behavior on the encircling plane going on right now. Oh, shit. What? He's going to come tonight. Real soon. They were moving into position when I came down. I thought it was just the usual, we'd better go full alert. I headed out of there with what energy I had announcing the alert wherever I saw anybody. Chapter 9 Shadow Spinner did not hurry. The company took its positions on the wall. The Taglian rabble we led got as ready as they ever get. I sent warning to Mogaba and Speaker Kidam. 
Mogaba is a jerk and a lunatic, but not a complete fool. He believes he keeps the job separate from personalities. If Goblin claimed we were in big trouble, he would listen. Alarms sounded everywhere. Shouts of anger at being anticipated rose outside the wall. The civilian population began to respond. Fear swept the darkened streets. This felt bigger than usual. As always, the old-timers among the Jaikuri recalled the first coming of the Shadow Masters. Back then, the enemy first wave consisted of deadly flickers of darkness. One eye. Any shadows out there? Won't be any of those, Mergen. They have to come up from Shadow Catch. Long Shadow would have to be in on it. Good. I've seen what the shadows can do on a small scale. The Jaikuri were right to be scared. I promise you some sorcery, though. It's already gathering. I love how you can always cheer me up, runt. I surveyed the walls beyond our section. Hard to see much, but it looked like any assault would meet a ready defense. Which meant nothing if Spinner was in good form. Morgan! What? Behind you. I looked. Kidam, speaker of the Nguyen Bao, accompanied by a son and some grandsons, by gesture asked if he could come up to the battlements. Only the son was armed. He was a squat, emotionless man, rumored to be some kind of master swordsman. I nodded. Welcome aboard. The speaker looked like he was about a thousand years older than One-Eye, but was spry enough to climb without help. He didn't have a lot of himself to move around. His hair was evenly distributed around his head and face, but very little of it remained. It consisted of white wisps. He was covered with liver spots. His skin color had faded. He was more pallid than some of us northerners. He bowed slightly. I responded in kind, trying to match his bow exactly. That would indicate an honor between equals, which ought to earn me some good guy points, because although junior in years, I was senior here, because he was on company ground and I was company top dog. Clever me. I make every effort to be polite to the speaker, and I keep reminding the guys to be respectful and protective of all Nguyen Bao even if provoked. I am trying to encourage the taking of a longer view than is usual with ordinary people. We have no friends anywhere in these strange lands. Kidam faced the darkened plain. His presence was strong. Many Jaikuri believe he is a sorcerer. Goblin and One-Eye say he can be called a wizard in the world's most archaic sense of wise man. The old boy drew a breath that seemed to enhance his aura of strength. It will be different tonight. He spoke mainstream Taglian with no accent. Their master has recovered his powers. The speaker glanced at me sharply, then at Goblin and One-Eye. Ah, so. Exactly. I've always wanted to do that when some old fart made cryptic noises. I couldn't help myself when the perfect opportunity arrived. I eyeballed the speaker's escort. The swordmaster seemed too squat and bulky for his reputation. Such as it was. Not a lot crosses the cultural boundary. The grandsons looked like most Nguyen Bao men in their prime. Like, if they smiled or showed any emotion whatsoever, they would forfeit their souls. Like they had cactus plugs up their butts, in Goblin's words. I went on with my work while Kidam considered the night. His escort stayed out of my way. Big Bucket checked in. All set, boss. 
and the Shadow Master's men sounded like they were ready to play. Their horns began calling like bulls in rut. I grumbled. It won't be long. They could put it off for another twenty years, though. I wouldn't mind. I was in no hurry. A Taglian messenger stumbled up from the street, fought for breath, croaked out word that Mogaba wanted me. On my way, less than five minutes, I told him. I scanned the darkness. Hold the fort bucket. Just what this outfit needs, another comedian. Oh, I'll slay them. Kidam said something. The sword master squinted at the night. For half a heartbeat, there was a ghostly flicker in the hills. Star? Reflection of a star? No. The night was cool, wet, and overcast. The speaker said, There may be more happening than is immediately apparent, bone warrior. Perhaps. Bone warrior? But unlike Nguyen Bao, we are not warriors. We are soldiers. The old man got his mind around that quickly. As you will, stone soldier. All may not be as it seems. Was he making these up as he went? He did not seem pleased by his speculation. He turned, hastened down the stair. His grandsons had trouble keeping up. What was that about? Bucket asked. I don't have a clue. I've been summoned by His Holiness, the Prince of the Company. As I stepped to the stair, I glanced at one eye. The little wizard was staring toward the hills about where Kidam had done the same. He seemed both puzzled and unhappy. I didn't have time to ask, nor did I have much inclination. I had had bad news enough already. Chapter 10 Mogaba stands six feet five. Any fat on him has to be between his ears because there isn't an ounce anywhere else. All bone and muscle, he moves like a cat, his slightest twitch, pure liquid grace. He works hard to stay hard, but not to become overly muscled. He is very dark, but a deep mahogany more than an ebony. He glows with conviction, an unshakable inner strength. He has a ready wit, but never smiles. When he does show humor, it is entirely surface, for effect, an illusion spun for his audience. He doesn't feel it, and probably doesn't understand it. He is as focused as any human being who ever lived. And that focus is the creation and maintenance of Mogaba, greatest warrior who ever lived. He is almost as good as he wants to be. He might be as good as he thinks he is. I never saw anyone who could match his individual skills. The other Nar are almost as good, almost as arrogantly self-confident. Mogaba's self-opinion is his big weakness but I don't think anyone could get him to believe that. He and his reputation stand squarely at the center of his every consideration. Sadly, self-indulgence and self-admiration aren't always traits that will inspire soldiers to win battles. There is no love lost between Mogaba and the rest of us. His rigidity split the company into old crew and nar factions. Mogaba envisions the Black Company as an ages-old holy crusade. Us old crew guys see it as a big, unhappy family, trying to survive in a world that really is out to get us. The debate would be much more bitter were Shadow Spinner not around to snap up the mantle of bigger common enemy. Many of Mogaba's own people are less than thrilled with the way his mind is working these days. Something Croker harped about, from the moment he first set Quill to paper, is what might be called matters of form. It is not good form to bicker with your superiors. 
however wrong they may be, and however one-sided their determination of their superiority is. I try to maintain good form. Croker quickly elevated Mogaba to third in the company, after himself and Lady, because of his exceptional talents. But that did not automatically entitle Mogaba to assume command if Croker and Lady were gone. New captains were supposed to be elected. In a situation like the one here in Dejagore, the custom is to poll the soldiers to see if they think an immediate election is necessary. If they think the old captain has become mad, senile, dead, incompetent, or otherwise in need of permanent replacement, then an election will be held. I cannot recall any instance in the annals when the senior candidate was rejected by the soldiers. But if an election were held today, a precedent might be set. In a secret ballot, even many of the NAR might declare no confidence in Mogaba. There will be no vote while we are besieged. I will oppose any effort to hold one. Mogaba may be mad, and I may not be able to go along with him in areas he considers religious, but only he has the will to control thousands of skittish Taglian legionnaires while keeping the Jaikuri in line. If he should fall, his assistant Sindawe would step up, then Ochiba, and only then, maybe, if I can't hide fast enough, me. Soldiers and civilians both fear Mogaba more than they respect him after all this time besieged. And that troubles me. The annals demonstrate over and over that fear is the most fertile soil for treachery. Chapter 11 Mogaba holds staff conferences in the Citadel. There is a war room there, once the toy of the sorceress Storm Shadow. Mogaba considers meeting there a great concession to the distances us underlings must hike. He does not like leaving his own part of the action. For that reason, I could count on this being short. He was polite enough. Though it was a strained courtesy, obvious to all, he said, I received your message. It was not entirely clear. I garbled it intentionally. I didn't want the messenger telling everybody on his way to see you. It is not good news, then, I assume. He spoke the Jewel City's dialect the company picked up when it was in service to the syndic of Beryl. Most of us used it only when we did not want the natives to understand what we were saying. Mogaba used it because he did not yet have enough Taglian to get by without interpreters. Even his Jewel City's dialect was badly accented. Definitely not good news, I said. Mogaba's friend, Sindawe, translated for the Taglian officers present. I continued, Goblin and One-Eye tell me Shadow Spinner is completely healthy again, and means tonight to be his big comeback show. So tonight won't be just another raid. It will be a big punch-out for the whole works. A dozen pairs of eyes stared, praying I was making the sort of bad joke Goblin and One-Eye would find hilarious. Mogaba's own eyes were icy. He wanted to make me recant by sheer weight of his gaze. Mogaba has no use for One-Eye or Goblin. They are one of the big sources of contention between him and the old crew. He is sure that real wizards, however puny, have no place among real warriors, who are supposed to rely on their strength, their wit, their will, and even, maybe, their superior steel, if they have it. Goblin and One-Eye, besides being wizards, besides being sloppy and undisciplined and rowdy, worst of all, fail to agree that Mogaba is the best thing that could have happened to the Black Company. Mogaba hates Shadow Spinner, 
in part because he knows the Shadow Master will never meet him in a trial by combat that can be sung about down through the ages. Mogaba wants his place in the annals. He lusts after a major place in the annals, and he is going to get that, but not the way he wants. Do you have a suggestion about how to deal with this threat? Mogaba showed no emotion. Though Shadow Spinner getting well meant the date of our executions had been advanced. I considered suggesting prayer, but it was obvious Mogaba was not in the mood. Afraid not. There is nothing in your books. He meant the annals. Croker tried hard to get him to study them. Croker was big on looking for and deferring to precedent, mainly because he lacked much confidence in his mastery of strategy and leadership. On the other hand, Mogaba lacked no confidence whatsoever. He always had an excuse not to study company history. Only recently had it occurred to me that he might not read or write. Those are skills considered unmanly in some places. Maybe that was true among the Nar of Geazli, despite the fact that keeping the annals was a holy duty of our black company forebrethren. The Nar say very little about their beliefs. The rest of us are aware that they consider us heretics, though. Very little. The time-honored tactic is to attract the wizard's attention to a secondary target where he will do less damage than he wants. You hold his attention there till he gets tired or until you sneak up and cut his throat. Sneak-ups aren't practical here. This time, Spinner will protect himself better. He might not even come out of his camp if we don't make him. Mogaba nodded, unsurprised. Sindawi. Sindawi is Mogaba's oldest and closest friend. They go back to early childhood. Sindawi is now Mogaba's second in command and leader of the Taglian First Legion, which is the best of the Taglian formations, and the oldest. Croker put Mogaba in charge of training when first we arrived in Taglios, and the first is the juggernaut Mogaba built. Sindawe can pass as Mogaba's brother. Sometimes he acts like Mogaba's conscience. Mogaba values his good opinion, possibly more than he should. Sindawe said, We could try to outrun them. Woga, I'm joking. Mogaba didn't get it. Or if he did, he failed to see the humor. I offered, use artillery to distract him, wherever he is. And if we do catch him in range, we can hope we get lucky. We did that during the big battle that ended with us trapped. And it worked. We even got lucky some, which was why we were alive to be in deep shit now. But we did not come near eliminating Shadow Spinner. We will include motion in everything, Mogaba decided. Our artillery men will shoot and run. Wherever the Shadow Master attacks directly, we will fade away instantly. We will cover with enfilading fire till his attention is drawn elsewhere. We will not look him in the eye. Mogaba looked me in the eye. He wanted help from Goblin and One-Eye, but his pride would not let him ask. He is on record as saying he cannot abide sorcery, that sorcery has no place in the Black Company. It is wicked, dishonorable, the alternative of rogues. The man just cannot lay off the flattery. He spreads that stuff all over those two clowns every time he sees them, too. He has made them some big offers, intended to get them to retire from his company. Help. Ain't it funny how flexible you get when absolute destruction looks you right in the eye? Sort of flexible. Mogaba never addressed the matter directly. I did not twist his tail. I never do. 
and I hope that drives him crazy. I said, we will all exercise all our talents to their limit. If we don't get through this, our differences don't mean shit. Mogaba winced. Among the many things a Nar warrior does not do is employ colorful language, whatever language he uses. Good thing we were using the barrel dialect. Our discussion had gone on long enough that the Taglian officers were beginning to doubt Sindawe's bland translations. We tried to show the outside world a single face. It was especially important to deceive our employers. In the tradition of these things, they are, likely, already figuring out how to screw us as soon as we save their royal butts. Counting sworn brothers taken in since our advent in this forsaken end of the world, the Nar and old crew factions together total sixty-nine men. Dejagore's main defenders are ten thousand inadequately trained Taglian legionnaires, some willing but ineffective former Shadowlander slaves, and some even less effective Jaikuri. Each day snaps our numbers. Old wounds and current diseases thin our ranks as swiftly as enemy attacks. Croker tried to teach good field hygiene, but it has not stuck anywhere outside the company proper. Mogaba awarded me a small bow, the way honors are paid in these parts. He would not thank me outright. Sindawe and Ochiba now had their heads together over some unit reports that had just come in. Sindawe announced, No time left for talk. They are about to attack. He spoke Taglian. Unlike Mogaba, he made a grand effort to get beyond Pigeon. He strove to understand the culture and thinking of the several Taglian peoples, weird though they are. Mogaba said, Then let's go to our posts. We don't want to disappoint Shadow Spinner. You could see the edge on the man. He was eager. His excitement was almost unreasonable. He reviewed the tactics he wanted used to reduce friendly casualties. I left without a word, without being dismissed. Mogaba knew I did not consider him captain. We discuss it occasionally. I will not acknowledge him without a formal vote. He does not want an election yet either. I suspect because he fears his popularity is not what a captain's should be. I will not force the issue. I might get elected by the old crew faction, and I don't want the job. I am not qualified. I know my limitations. I am no leader. Hell, I don't even handle these annals very well. I don't see how Croker kept them up and did all the other stuff he had to do at the same time. I ran all the way to my section of wall. Chapter 12 Something hit me, like a small, silent cyclone of darkness that dropped out of the night and nowhere. It devoured me, unseen by anyone around. It grabbed hold of my soul and yanked. I went into the darkness thinking, boy, the Shadow Master came back in a huge way, didn't he? This was unlike anything I had encountered ever before. But why come after me? There were few players less significant than I was. Chapter 13 I was summoned. I could not resist. I fought, but soon I realized that a strong part of me did not want to win. I was confused. I had no idea what was happening. I was sleepy. Was all this just because I wasn't getting enough sleep? A voice called my name. The voice seemed vaguely familiar. Morgan. Come home, Morgan. I felt violent motion, 
probably due to a blow I didn't feel. Come on, Mergen. You have to fight it. What? He's coming. He's coming back. I groaned. A major accomplishment, apparently, because it generated more excitement. I groaned again. Now I knew who I was, but not where I was or why or who that voice belonged to. I'm getting up, I tried to say. Must be some kind of training. I'm getting up, God damn it! And I tried, but my muscles would not lift me. They were rigid. Hands pulled on my arms. A new voice said, Stand him up, get him walking. The original voice said, We've got to find a way to head these seizures off before they happen. I'm open to suggestion. You're the doctor. It's not a disease, Goblin. You're the sorcerer. It ain't sorcery either, Chief. Then what the hell is it? Anyway, it isn't any sorcery like any I ever seen or heard of. They had me upright now. My knees would not cooperate, but these guys would not let me fall down. I opened an eye. I saw Goblin and the old man. But the old man was dead. I tried my tongue. I think I'm back. This time I had it. This time my words were slurred but understandable. He is back, Goblin said. Keep him moving. He ain't drunk, Croker. He's back. He's aware. He can hang on here. You can hang on here now, can't you, Mergen? Yeah. I'm here. I won't drift away as long as I'm awake. Where was here? I looked around. Oh, there. Again. What happened? The old man asked. I got pulled into the past again. Dejigore? It's always Dejigore. This was the day you came back. The day I met Sarie. Croker grunted. It hurts less each time. This trip wasn't bad, but you lose a lot besides the pain. I didn't see half the horror I know was there. Maybe that's good. Maybe if you can shed all of that, you can break out of this. I'm not crazy, Croker. I'm not doing this to myself. Goblin said, It's getting harder to pull him back, not easier. This time, he wouldn't have made it without us. My turn to grunt. I could get caught in a cycle of reliving the nadir of my life over and over. Goblin had not guessed the worst. I was not back yet. They had dragged me up out of the deeps of yesterday. But I was not home. This was my past, too. Only this time, I was aware of my dislocation. And I knew what evils lurked in my future. What was it like? Goblin stared like that every time. Like some facial tick of mine might be the one clue he needs to unravel the puzzle and rescue me. Croker leaned against the wall the way he does, satisfied now that I was talking. Same as every other time. Just less painful. Although this time, when I started out, I wasn't really me. That was different. I was just a disembodied voice. Just a viewpoint, giving a guide sort of speech to a faceless visitor. Also disembodied? Kroger asked. This variation had him interested. No, there was somebody there. A complete person, but he had no face. Goblin and Croker exchanged troubled looks. At that time, Otto and Hagop were still away. What sex? Croker asked. 
wasn't clear. It wasn't the faceless man, though. I don't think it was anybody from our past. It might just have been something out of my own head. I might have separated me into pieces so I wouldn't have to deal with so much pain and such big blasts. Goblin shook his head, not buying that. It ain't you, Morgan. Something is doing this. Besides who, we want to know why and why you. Did you catch any clues? How did it go? Try for specifics. It's teedy details that will give us our handle. I was detached completely when it started. I went down into it gradually. Then I was the Mergen back then, living it all over again, trying to get it all down on the annals, unaware of the future at all. You remember going swimming when you were a kid, when somebody would come up out of the water behind you to dunk you? He would jump in the air and put his hand on top of your head, then let his weight push you under? If you were in deep water, instead of just going straight down, you would sort of curve through the water and lay out flat. This whole thing went like that. Only once I was out flat... I couldn't float to the top. I forgot that I've done it all before. Almost always the same way. Who knows how many times. Maybe if I could remember the future back then, I could change the way things went, or maybe at least I could make extra copies of my book so they don't get... What? Croker was alert now. Mention the annals and you have his undivided attention. What was that? Did he realize that I was remembering the future? In this time, my volumes of the annals are still safe. The fear and the pain swarmed in on me then. The despair followed. Because despite all those plunges back there and despite the visits here, I cannot stop anything from happening. No amount of willpower can divert the river from the horrors. For a moment I could not talk because I had so much to say. Then obliquely I managed. You came here about the Grove of Doom, right? I knew this night. I have been through this country often enough to know its terrain well. Here... The landscape varies slightly from visit to visit, but afterward, time becomes the same relentless river. If I squinted, I could almost see the ghosts of other versions playing out alternate dialogues. Croker was surprised. The Grove? You want me to take the company out to the Grove of Doom, right? It's time for some deceiver festival. You think Narayan Singh himself might show up for this one. You think there's a good chance to catch him or to catch somebody who knows where he has your baby hidden. Worst chance, you think we'll get the opportunity to kill lots of them and make them hurt more than they already do. Croker has been implacable in his resolve to exterminate the deceivers. More so even than Lady has been, I think and she was the more deeply insulted of the two. Once upon a time, he wanted his legacy to be the completion of the Black Company's historical cycle. He wanted to be captain when the company returned to Katovar. He has the dream still, but a nightmare shoved it aside. The nightmare demands satisfaction. Until its gossamer thread of terror, pain, cruelty, and revenge has been spun. Katovar is going to remain nothing but an excuse, not a destination. Croker eyed me uncertainly. How could you know about the grove? I came back knowing, which was true, but the two of us would not give the same meaning to back. You'll take the men out there? I can't not. Goblin eyed me weirdly, too, now. I would do it. And I knew how it would go, but I could not tell them that. There were two minds inside my head. The one doing this thinking wasn't the one heaving on the running lines and reefing the sails. 
I'm all right now, I told them, and I think there is a way to keep me from falling back. At least to keep me from going so far back. But I can't get it out. I would have shared gladly. I did not want to keep stumbling off the edge of time to fall back into those two real dark dreams of Dejagore's past. Not even if I tumbled into a viewpoint almost blind to the horror and cruelty everywhere then. Croker started to say something. I interrupted. I'll be down for the staff meeting in ten minutes. I could not tell them anything directly, but maybe I could get something out sideways. But I knew nothing would change. The worst of all horrors was waiting up ahead, and I was powerless to avert it. I'd still do my best in the grove, just in case this time that would come out differently, if I could remember the future well enough to make the right moves. You. Whoever you are. Whatever you are. You keep dragging me to the wellsprings of pain. Why do you do that? What do you want? Who are you? What are you? As always, you give me no answers. Chapter 14 The goddamned wind had teeth. We huddled in our blankets, shivering, as unmotivated as guys get without hanging it up. Weren't many of us wanted to be in that haunted grove in the first place. Yet something I could not quite catch, some elusive emotion deep inside me, told me this was critical. That this had to be done just right. That more than I could imagine hinged upon that. Unseen trees creaked and cracked, the wind groaned and whined. It was easy to let your imagination get away and brood on the fact that thousands had been tortured and murdered there. You might hear their moans inside the wind their pleas for mercy ignored even now. You might expect to see broken corpses rising up to demand vengeance on the living. I faked being a hero. I could not stop shaking, though. I pulled my blanket tighter. That did not help either. Candias! One eye sneered like the little shit wasn't about to have a seizure himself. That bonehead goblin don't quit farting around and get his dead ass back here. I'm gonna go strip him bare about to nail him to a chunk of ice. That's creative. Don't be no wise-ass kid, I'll. An especially exuberant gust took off with what he would. It wasn't just the cold making a shake, though nobody would admit that. It was the place, and the mission, and the fact that heavy cloud cover robbed us of even the meager comradeship of starlight. It was goddamn dark, and these stranglers might now be friends with the man who ran shadows. A little bird said. Actually, a big black bird said. We spend too much time in town, I grumbled. One eye didn't respond. Ty Day did, though, with a grunt. But that was a speech for this particular Nguyen Bao. The wind brought the creak of a stealthy footfall. One eye barked, God damn it, goblin! Quit stumping around! You want the whole damned world to know we're here? Never mind that goblin could not be heard five feet away, dancing. One eye refuses to be constrained by mundane reason or consistency. Goblin drifted into place in front of me, squatted. His yellow teeth chattered. All set, he murmured. Whenever you're ready. We'd better do it then, before I break out on a case of common sense. I grunted as I rose. My knees crackled. My muscles did not want to stretch anymore. I swore. I was getting too damned old for this shit. Though at thirty-four, 
I was the baby of the bunch. Move out, I said, loudly enough to be heard by most everyone. You couldn't use hand signals in that darkness. We were downwind and Goblin had done his stuff. Noise was not a worry. The men drifted away, mostly so quietly that I had trouble believing I was alone suddenly except for my bodyguard. We moved too. Ty Day covered my back. The night didn't bother him. Maybe he has eyes like a cat. I had plenty of mixed feelings. This was the first time I had run a raid. I was not sure I was over Digigore enough to handle it. I shied at shadows and remained crazy suspicious of everybody outside the company, for no reason I could understand. But Kroger insisted. So here I was sneaking around in a dark and evil forest with icicles hanging off my butt, directing the first purely company op in years. Only it wasn't so purely company when you considered the fact that all my guys had bodyguards with them. I got over the self-confidence hurdle just by getting myself moving. Hell, it was too late to stop anything. I stopped worrying about me and went to work worrying about how we would look after the raid was over. If we blew it, we could not blame that on Taglian treachery or factionalism or incompetence, the usual sand in the machine. I reached the crest of a low ridge. My hands were frozen, but my body was wet inside my clothing. Light wavered ahead. The deceivers, those lucky bastards, had a bonfire to keep them warm. I paused to listen. I heard nothing. How did the old man know the leaders of the Strangler Bands would gather for this particular festival? It was downright spooky the way he knew stuff sometimes. Maybe Lady was rubbing off. Maybe he had some magical talent he never mentioned. I observed, We're about to find out if Goblin still has that talent. Ty Day did not spend a precious grunt. Silence was common enough. There were supposed to be thirty to forty top deceivers over there. We hunt them relentlessly, and have done so since Narayan snatched Lady and Croker's baby. The old man has eliminated mercy from the company vocabulary, and that fits deceiver philosophy perfectly. Though I would bet those guys up ahead would not think that way in a minute. Goblin still had the knack. The sentries were napping. Still, inevitably, all did not go as planned. I was fifty feet from the bonfire, sneaking along beside this especially big, ugly shelter when somebody went healing and towing out its end like all the devils in hell were after him. He bent under the weight of a big bundle, that bundle wriggled and whimpered. Not Ayan Singh. I knew him instantly. Stop! Right, Mergen. Freeze him with your voice. The rest of the guys recognized him, too. A yell went up. We could not believe our luck, though I had been warned that the big prize might be there to grab. Singh was the number one deceiver. The villain lady and the captain want to spend long years killing, an inch at a time. The bundle had to be their daughter. I yelled orders. Instead of responding, the men did whatever they thought of. Mostly they went after Singh. The racket wakened the rest of the deceivers. The quickest tried to run. Luckily, some of the guys stayed on the job. You warm now? Goblin asked. I puffed heartily as I watched Ty Day shove a skinny blade into the eye of a sleep befuddled strangler. Ty Day doesn't cut throats. He doesn't like the mess. It was over. How many did we get? How many got away? I stared the direction Singh had fled. 
the silence there was not promising. The guys would have raised a real hurrah had they caught him. Damn. I was excited for a while there. If only I could have dragged him back to Taglios. If wishes were fishes. Keep some alive. We'll want somebody to tell us bedtime stories. One eye. How the hell did Singh all of a sudden know we were here? The runt shrugged. I don't know. Maybe his goddess scoosed him and told him to haul ass. Give me a break. Kina didn't have anything to do with it. But I wasn't that sure. Sometimes it is hard to disbelieve. Ty Day gestured. Right, I said. Just what I was thinking myself. One eye looked puzzled. Goblin grumbled. What? My wizards. Right on top of everything. Sometimes I wonder if you guys could find your dicks without a map. The shelter, old timers, the shelter. Don't it seem like that's an awful lot of shack for one runt killer and a kid barely tall enough to bite you on the kneecap? A bit big even for a living saint and the daughter of a goddess. One eye developed a nasty grin. Nobody else came out, did they? Yeah. You want I should start a fire? Before I could answer him, Goblin squealed. I whirled. A shapeless darkness, visible only because of the bonfire, reared out of the shelter entrance. Then I slammed into the ground, felled by Tide. Fire blasted over my head. Lights crackled. Balls of flame darted in from all around. The killing darkness took on a moth-eaten look. Then it came apart. That darkness was why so many of us had been shivering before the attack. But we won this round. I sat up, crooked a finger. Let's see what we've caught. It ought to be interesting. My guys knocked the shelter apart. Sure enough, they turned up a half dozen wrinkled little old men, brown as chestnuts. Shadow weavers running with the stranglers. Now isn't that interesting? The geezers gobbled their willingness to surrender. We had run into their kind before. They never were big on personal heroics. A soldier called Wishbone said, These Shadowlanders are getting good at this I surrender stuff. He sneered. Everybody down there must be practicing their handy Taglian phrases. Except Long Shadow, I reminded. I told Ty Day, thanks. He shrugged, a gesture foreign to the Nguyen Bao. The world did touch him occasionally. Sara would expect it. And that was very Nguyen Bao. He would blame his actions on his sister's expectations rather than on any notion of duty or obligation or even friendship. What are we supposed to do with these guys? Wishbone asked. We got any use for them? Save a couple. The oldest and one other. Goblin. You never said how many got away. Three. Three. That counts Singh, but not the kid. But we're going to get one of them three back on account of he's hiding in the bushes right over there. Collect him. I'll give him to the old man. Sarky one-eye cracked. Give them a little authority. They turn into field marshals. I remember this kid when he was so green he still had sheep shit between his toes. He didn't know what shoes were for. But the humor wasn't in his eye. Every move I made, he watched like a hawk. Like a crow, in fact. Although we had no crows hanging around tonight. Whatever experiment Goblin and One Eye had going in that area was a complete success during this outing. 
Goblin suggested. He's up, Mergen. We'll get the job done. How about some of you lazy asses toss a couple logs on the fire? He began to circle the hidden deceiver in the direction opposite that taken by one eye. They were right. I get too serious under stress. I was a thousand years old already. Surviving Digigore had not been easy. But all the rest of these guys had come through that too. They had seen Mogaba's slaughters of innocents. They had suffered the pestilences and plagues. They had seen the cannibalism and human sacrifices, the treacheries and betrayals and all the rest. And they had come away without letting the nightmares rule them. I have to get a handle on it. I have to get some emotional distance and perspective. But there is something going on inside me that is beyond my control or understanding. Sometimes I feel like there are several of me in there, all mixed up, sometimes sitting behind the real me watching. Watching. There may be no chance for me to recover complete sanity and stability. Goblin came strutting back. He and one eye accompanied a man who was not much more than skin and bones. Few deceivers are in good shape these days. They have no friends anywhere. They are hunted like vermin. Huge bounties ride on their shoulders. Goblin flashed his toad-like grin. We've got us a red-hand man here, Mergen. A genuine black rummel guy with the red palm. What do you think of that? The thought lightened my heart. The prisoner was truly a top strangler. The red hand meant that he had been there when Narayan Singh tricked Lady into thinking she was being inducted into the strangler cult, when in fact the deceivers were really consecrating her unborn child as daughter of their goddess Kina. But Lady had employed a trick of her own, marking every strangler there with the red hand. That could not be denied later. Nothing they tried would take the color away, short of amputation. And a one-handed strangler could not manage the rummel, the strangling scarf. That was the tool of the deceiver's holy trade. The old man will be pleased. A red-hand man would know what was going on inside his cult. I crowded closer to the fire. Tai Day, done helping dispose of redundant shadow weavers, eased in beside me. How much had Dejigore changed him? I could not imagine him ever being anything but doer, taciturn, remorseless and pitiless, even as a toddler. Goblin, I noted, was doing that thing he did lately where he watched me from the corner of his eye while pretending to do something else. What were he and one eye looking for? The runt held his hands out. Fire feels good. Chapter 15 Paranoia has become our way of life. We have become the new Nguyen Bao. We trust no one. We let no one outside the Black Company know what we are doing until we are sure what the response will be. In particular, we prefer keeping the Prabrindra Draw and his sister, the Radisha Draw, our employers, way back there in the deep, dark shadows. They are not to be trusted at all, ever except to serve their own closest interests. I smuggled my prisoners into the city and hid them in a warehouse near the river, a company-friendly Shadar fish place possessed of a very distinctive air. My men scattered to their families or someplace where they could drink beer. I was satisfied. With one quick, nasty stab, we had decimated the surviving deceiver leadership. We almost got that fiend Narayan Singh. I got within spitting distance of Croker's baby. 
in all honesty, I could report that she seemed all right. Tide knocked the prisoners to their knees, wrinkled his nose. You're right, I agreed. But this place don't stink half as bad as your swamp does. Taglios claims the river delta, but the Nguang Bao disagree. Tai De grunted. He could take a joke as well as the next guy. He does not look like much. He is a foot shorter than I am. I outweigh him by 80 pounds, and I am far prettier. He has crudely cropped black hair that sticks out in unkempt spikes. Skinny, lantern-jawed, taciturn, and surly. Tai De is entirely unappetizing. But he does his job. A Shadar fishmonger brought the captain to us. Croker was getting old. We were going to have to call him boss or chief or something. You cannot call the captain the old man once he's really old, can you? He was dressed like a Shadar cavalryman, all turban, beard, and plain gray clothing. He eyed Tai Day coolly. He did not have a Nguang Bao bodyguard himself. He loathed the idea, despite his having to disguise himself whenever he wanted to walk the streets alone. Bodyguards are not traditional. Croker is stubborn about company traditions. Hell, the Shadow Master's officers all employ bodyguards. Some have several. They cannot survive without them. Tai Day reflected Croker's gaze impassively unimpressed by the presence of the great dictator. He might say, He is one man, I am one man. We begin even. Croker examined my prizes. Tell it. I told it. But I missed Narayan. I was this close. That bastard has a guardian angel. There's no way he should have slipped goblin sleep spell. We chased him for two days, but even Goblin and One Eye couldn't hang onto his track forever. He had help. Maybe from his guardian demon. Maybe from his new buddy, the Shadow Master, too. How come they went back to the grove? How did you know they would be there? I thought he would say a big black bird told him. They are less numerous these days, but the crows still follow him everywhere. He talks to them. Sometimes they talk to him, too. So he says. They had to come someday, Mergen. They are slaves to their religion. But why this particular festival of lights? How did you know? I did not press. You don't press, Croker. He has grown cranky and secretive in his old age. In his own annals, he did not always tell the whole truth about personal things, his age especially. He kicked the Shadow Weaver, one of Long Shadow's pet spook doctors. You'd think he wouldn't have enough left to waste them anymore. I don't reckon he expected us to jump them. Croker tried to smile. He produced a nasty, sarcastic sneer instead. He's got lots of surprises coming. He kicked the deceiver. Let's don't hide them. Let's take them to the palace. What's the matter? Ice had blasted my back. Like I was out on the wind of the Grove of Doom again. I didn't know why, but I had a grim sense of foreboding. I don't know. You're the boss. Anything special you want on the annals? You're the analyst now, Mergen. You write what you have to write. I can always bitch. Unlikely. I send everything over, but I don't think much gets read. He asked, What was special about the raid? It was colder than a well digger's ass out there. And that... Walking sack of camel snot, not I on Singh, got away from us again. So that's what you write. 
Him and his kind are going to get back into our story before we're done. When we're roasting him, I hope. Did you see her? Was she all right? All I saw really was a bundle that Singh carried. I think it was her. Had to be. He never lets her out of his sight. He pretended he did not care. Bring them to the palace. That chill hit me again. I'll make sure the guards know you're coming. Ty Day and I exchanged looks. This might get tough. People in the streets would recognize the prisoners, and the prisoners might have friends. And for sure, they did have enemies by the thousand. They might not survive the trip, or we might not. The old man said, Tell your wife I said hello, and I hope she likes the new apartment. Sure, I shivered. Ty Day frowned at me. Croker produced a sheaf of papers rolled into a tube. This came in from Lady while you were gone. It's for the annals. Someone must have died. He grinned. Bang it around and fit it in. But don't polish it so much she gets all righteous again. I can't stand it when she flays me with my own arguments. I learned the first time. One Eye says he thinks he knows where he left his papers from when he thought he was going to have to keep the annals. I've heard that one before. Croker grinned again, then ducked out. Chapter 16 Four hundred men and five elephants swarmed around an incomplete stockade. The nearest friendly outpost lay a hard day's march northward. Shovels gnawed the earth, hammers pounded, elephants swung timbers off wagons and helped set them upright. Only the oxen stood around, lazing in their harnesses. This nameless post was barely a day old, the newest point in the relentless Taglian leapfrog into the Shadowlands. Only its watchtower was complete. The lookout there scanned the southern horizon intently. There was an electric urgency in the air, a heaviness like the smell of old death, a premonition. The soldiers were all veterans. Not a one considered fleeing his nerves. Each had developed the habit and expectation of victory. The sentinel began to gaze fixedly. Captain! A man, distinct for his coloring, dropped a shovel, looked up. His true name was Cato Dahlia. The black company called him Big Bucket. Wanted for common theft in his home city, he had become advisor commander of a battalion of Taglian border rangers. He was a hard-ass leader, with a reputation for getting his jobs done and bringing his people back alive. Bucket scrambled onto the observation platform, puffing. What have you got? The lookout pointed. Bucket squinted. Help me out here, son. These eyes ain't what they used to be. He could see nothing but the low-humped backs of the Logra Hills. Scattered clouds hung above those. Watch! Bucket trusted his soldiers. He selected them carefully. He watched. One small cloud hung lower than the others, dragging a slanting shadow. This rogue thunderhead did not travel the same direction as the rest of its family. Headed right for us? Looks like it, sir. Bucket relied on his intuition. It had served him well during this war without major battles, and intuition told him... That cloud was dangerous. He descended, spread word to expect an attack. The men of the construction company, although not combat soldiers, did not want to withdraw. Sometimes Bucket's reputation worked against him. His rangers had prospered, freebooting across the frontier. Others wanted a share. 
Bucket compromised. He sent one platoon north with the animals, which were too valuable to risk. The other workers stayed. They overturned their wagons in the gaps in the stockade. The cloud advanced steadily. Nothing could be seen inside its shadow and tail of falling rain. A chill ran before it. The Taglian soldiers shivered and pranced to keep warm. Two hundred yards beyond the ditch, teams of two men shivered in covered, concealed pits, lighted by special candles. One man maintained a watch. Rain and darkness arrived. Behind the initial few yards of downpour, the rain slackened to a drizzle. Men appeared. They looked old and sad, ragged and pale, vacant and hopeless, hunched against the chill. They looked as though they had spent their entire lives in the rain. They bore their rusting weapons without spirit. They could have been an army raised from the dead. Their line passed the pits. Behind them came horsemen of the same sort, advancing like zombies. Next came massed infantry. Then came the elephants. The men in the pit spied the elephants. They used crossbows to speed poisoned shafts. The elephants wore no belly armor. The poison caused intense pain. The maddened beasts rampaged through their own formations. The Shadowlanders had no idea why the animals were enraged. Little shadows found the pits. They tried to slither inside. Candlelight drove them back. They left a deeper chill and a smell of death behind. The shadows found a pit where rain had gotten to the candle. They left shrieking, grimacing death in a grave already dug. Lady encountered the northbound laborers. She questioned them, considered the cloud in the distance. This may be what we're after she told her companions. Ride! She urged her stallion to a gallop. Fold in sorceress stables, when she was empress of the north, that giant black outdistanced the rest of her party quickly. Lady studied the cloud as she galloped. Three similar clouds had been reported near sites where ranger companies had been overrun. This was exactly what she had come to investigate. It took only minutes to fathom how the raids were managed. Lines of dark power had been laid down long before the Shadowlanders withdrew from this region. The attackers were controlled through those. They would fight without wills of their own while run by those lines. She could scramble the lines easily now that she sensed them, but chose not to do so. Let the attack proceed. These things cost the Shadowlanders more dearly than they cost Taglios. Long Shadow must realize that. So why did he find the exchange worthwhile? She entered the ranger encampment by leaping her mount over an upturned wagon. She dismounted as an amazed bucket ran to meet her. He looked like a condemned man, granted a last-minute reprieve. It's the howler, I think he said. Why? Lady dragged her gear down from behind her saddle, started changing right there. What can he hope to accomplish? I think it ain't what they're doing, but who they're doing it to that matters, Lieutenant. Though she commanded armies, Lady's company title remained Lieutenant. Who they're doing it to, yes, of course. Every unit lost had been led by company men. Seven brothers had fallen. They're picking us off. The belief that the company is invincible is the backbone of Taglian military morale and the black beast of Taglian politics. That's crafty. Must be Howler's idea. He does love to blindside you. Bucket helped her with her armor. 
That was gothically ornate, black and shiny, too pretty to be much use in close combat. But her job was to fight sorcery, not soldiers. Her armor was surfaced by layer upon layer of protective spells. Rain began to fall as she donned her helmet. Threads of fire snaked along channels etched into the surface of her armor. She followed Bucket up the watchtower. Rain roared down. Sounds of combat grew louder, nearer. Lady ignored those, extended sorcerer's senses in a search for the sorcerer known as the Howler. That ancient and evil being did not betray himself, but he was out there somewhere. She could smell him. Was it possible he had learned to control his screaming? I'll catch up with you, you little bastard. Meantime, she reached down. A fog formed, became dense, slithered between the raindrops, gained color. Pastels swirled, deepened, darkened. Soon the entire storm glowed as though some mad artist had splash-painted it with watercolors. There were screams inside the storm. The weather stopped moving. The shrieks of lost soldiers peaked, faded. The Shadow Master's lines of power, twisting and mutating, had turned lethal. Lady resumed searching for the Howler. She discovered him, stealing southward, flying low and timidly, fleeing the pastel death that had begun eating its way back along the lines of power. She flung a hastily concocted killing spell. It failed. Howler's lead was too great. But he did abandon stealth to run hard. Lady cursed like any frustrated line trooper. The rain faded away. The Taglian survivors appeared one by one, at first awed by the carnage, then grumbling about all the graves that needed digging. Few Shadowlander survivors were found. Lady told Bucket, Tell them to look at the bright side. There will be prize money for the captured animals. The Shadowlander animals, excepting the elephants, had not suffered badly. Lady glared southward, unforgiving. Next time, old friend. Chapter 17 Falling Again Trying to hang on So tired When I get tired the present gets slippery Fragments Not even fragments of today The past not so long ago Freezing my ass off Failing to catch the great villain Narayan Lady at play down south, fish stench, the sleeping man, the screaming deceiver, dead men. Only memories, but happier than tonight. There is too much pain here. It is my apocalypse. Slipping. Can't keep my eyes from closing. The summons is too damned powerful. The pillars might be mistaken for relics of a fallen city. They are not. They are too few and too randomly placed. Nor has a one ever fallen, though many have been gnawed deeply by the teeth of the hungry winds. In the lightning flares, or in the dawns and sunsets, when light steals beneath the edges of the sky, tiny golden characters blaze upon the faces of the columns. It is immortality of a sort. After dark, the wind dies. After dark, silence rules the glittering stone. Chapter 18 Sliding away, a vast whirlpool pulling me down, perhaps a force pushing. Was that a lying promise of an end to pain? I cannot resist. 
All lies, endless lies. Brown pages, torn pages, stiff with blood. Agony, hard to ride that anchor through the storm. Chapter 19 There you are. Were you lost? Welcome back. Come, come. The great adventure is about to begin. The players are all in place. The engines are wound tight. The spells are collected and ready in arsenal number. Oh, it will be a grand night of doom. Look there. Look there. Remember them? Goblin and one eye, the wizards? But is that really them? There are two more just like them right over there. And see this? And that? And there? One, two, three Mergens. No, definitely not. You can't teach those two to suck eggs. They have been in the fooled you business since your granny's great-granny was a stinky little surprise for your however many greats grandpa. They have set glamours all over this part of the city. If you are a Shadowlander soldier, you won't be able to tell the figments from the real thing till one of them sticks a knife in you. Look there. Raven and Silent. They've been gone for years. And there. That is the old captain, dead since Juniper. No, they won't scare any Shadowlanders with who they might be. Not right away. The Southerners never heard of them. What? You are right, absolutely right. Nobody here but Otto and Hagop will know them either. But that doesn't matter. What matters is they can be seen, and hardly anyone will know which ones are dangerous and which are illusions. This is a first trial, a big experiment, saved up special for the night of Shadow Spinner's big attack. Yes, yes, he did hit hard not that long ago, but he wasn't really going for a knockout then. He would have taken it, but that was really a reconnaissance in force, meant to support planning for this attack. It is going to be a grand show. Oh, no, there isn't one ghost anywhere else in Dejigore. Mogaba wouldn't have it. He has no grasp of illusion as a weapon. He has no idea how the company really worked. He clings to his grand notion of chivalrous warfare, the great deadly game, all honor and set rules. He would have settled this mess in a trial by combat between him and any champion the Shadowlanders care to send out. Oh, look, that one is interesting. That ugly sucker is Toad Killer Dog. He was a real nasty devil dog. And the limper, oh yes, brilliant. If the man behind Shadow Spinner's mask is anyone the company has faced before those illusions or provocations, he will have to test. He will betray himself. No, of course the Shadow Masters would not risk an entire kingdom on the outcome of a fight between two men. Their champion might lose. Yes, Mogaba is naive about some things. He is an arrogant, cruel unsympathetic general, too. Ooh, hear those trumpets? The company has its own personal bunch of bad guys down front. Let's go to the ramparts and watch from close up. No, they aren't really bright. Well, you could say that if they were bright, they wouldn't be in that army in the first place, but that wouldn't be fair. Not many of those guys had a choice about signing up. Their only real motivation is their fear of the Shadow Masters. Sure, no argument. That makes them no less deadly. Hell, a rock can fall out of the sky and kill you. Yes, this definitely is the big one. Shadow Spinner is set to send every man. Maybe shadows have come up from Overlook to help. Bats! <laughs> And crows, which is chasing which? Duck, almost got you. They are all over. Never been this many around before. What is that racket? Oh, Bucket, yelling at one of the Mergans to get behind something because he don't want to carry no bodies down no goddamn stairs. And here comes the first barrage. 
And if that racket across town means anything, the Shadowlanders are hitting hard about where the third and fourth cohorts of the First Legion are stationed. Those are good regiments. They will put up a fight. Chapter 20 Like a regular hailstorm, isn't it? Makes you wonder where they got all the goddamned arrows and javelins for their engines. Just stay under the mantlet, you'll be fine. They aren't good at laying plunging fire onto elevated targets. If they let up before they attack, the Jaikuri will come out and collect the missiles and bring them to the soldiers. The Shadowlanders will get them back business end first. No, the Jaikuri do not love Mogaba. They don't love the Taglians or the Black Company either. They wish the whole mob was gone. But they have some dark suspicions about what will happen if Shadow Spinner recaptures the Spurg. So they sort of try to help, but not much. Not yet. They help some. They figure maybe Mogaba might be less likely to kick them out next time he is in one of his moods. The sky dark as the inside of a priest's heart, isn't it? Oh, yes, you're right. It isn't an auspicious sort of night. Never is when they attack without benefit of a full moon. It's devil's work for sure, then. Usually it means the shadow masters want the darkness so they can run their pets to their best advantage. Or they want everybody terrified that there are shadows to come. Look at them scurry. Those Jaikuri are motivated tonight. If they become involved in actual fighting, it could be closer than Mogab or Shadow Spinner expect. Whoa, what was that? Look at that! What the hell is it? That rosy light over the hills. Here they come going to take their whack at breaking the company. You don't think so? Maybe you're right. This could be meant to keep the company pinned while Spinner concentrates somewhere softer. Look at them down there, though, like maggots, and no covering fire now. You're right. The engines will be moving to support the main attack now. Check that light. It keeps getting brighter. No? Now it's going away. And it doesn't seem like anyone else noticed. That is a little too weird. Oh, right again. Must have been a signal to the Shadowlander officers. The racket is getting louder now you mention it. No, I don't like the sound of it either. The attack had become generalized. Oh, look over there. Now we have it there too. What? The light! Don't you see it? There behind the ramparts? Yes, I see. You're right again. It is different. This is kind of like the cold light of a full moon, tinged with a little blue, isn't it? Yeah. It's kind of misty, too. Sort of like we are seeing it through an autumn haze. There. Now it's so bright you can make out the fighting on the far wall. Right. Fighting. That means they have a foothold there already. And Mogaba don't have any reserves to send up. Guess we can bend over and kiss our butts goodbye, friend. Chapter 21 Damn! The shit is about to start flying, but I just realized that when I started putting these notes together, I missed doing the famous formula Croker always used to open a new volume. So here goes. In those days, the company was in service to the Prabrindra Dra of Taglios, a prince whose domain spanned territories more vast than those of many empires. We were participating in the occupation and protection of the recently captured city of Dejagore. And I hope Princey and his skag sister, the Radisha, choke on our memory. Chapter 22 
the shitstorm arrived. Every man defending our section of wall stayed busy returning some of it to the Southerners. The illusory doppelgangers appeared to be hard at work, too. Funny how they could wander around never getting hurt. One eye! Goblin! I yelled. Where the hell are you, peckerheads? What the frack is going on over there? I watched a feeble arrow pass through a murgan a dozen yards away. What's that weird light? Whatever it was, it gave me the feeling that things could get worse than they looked already. I got no response whatsoever from my favorite wizards. Rudy, flip a flare ball out there. Let's see what's sneaking around. Until recently, my now less than favorite wizards had provided spot illumination. Bucket! Where the hell are Goblin and One Eye? Ten minutes ago, I had three pairs underfoot, all of them squabbling. Now they were gone, and the Shadowlanders were quieter than mice below. Red Rudy yelled at Loftus and Cletus. One of their engines thumped. A blazing ball arced outward, its only purpose to betray what the enemy was doing in the darkness. Sparkle piped. I seen them headed downstairs. Suck ass. Why? This was for sure not the time to wander away. Uh, they went to talk to Permi and some of them guys from the horse brigade. I shook my head. I would choke them myself in the middle of a goddamned battle. The fireball revealed that the Shadowlanders had pulled back from the wall. Spending our missiles was a waste. The Southerners were setting up engines capable of throwing grapnels in clusters. That was a stupid way to do business against an 80-foot wall with veteran soldiers on top. But if they wanted to play it that way, we would accommodate them. I was confident that, no matter how many ropes they threw up, we could cut or dislodge their lines before they could climb that high. Then, with lungs ready to fall out and arms too heavy to lift, get busy defending their bridgehead while other equally dim types made the same climb, carrying a half ton of equipment apiece. Goblin! God damn it. I wanted to know what that light was over there. The Shadowlanders had not scaled the wall there. They had attacked off of earthen ramps. Not a surprise. They had been building the ramps from the beginning. That was just... Basic siege work, employed since the dawn of time, and one reason your thoughtful modern prince builds his stronghold on a crag or headland or island. Naturally, the besieger spans the last dozen feet with a bridge he can yank back if a dangerous counterattack develops. The flare ball smashed down four hundred yards out. It continued to provide light until the southerners buried it with sand, originally intended to extinguish fire bombs if we used them. One eye! I'm going to have your wrinkled balls for breakfast! I snarled. Cletus, keep throwing them fireballs. Who's got messenger duty? Feet! Go find Goblin and One Eye. Never mind. One of them brain damaged runs just turned up. One Eye said, You rang, my lord. Are you sober? Are you ready to get to work now? He stared at that nasty light across town without me coaching him. I asked, what is that? The light seemed more sinister now. One eye raised a hand. Kid, why not take this God's given opportunity to exercise your least well-honed talent? What? Be patient, dickhead. The mist or haze or dust started getting thicker. The light grew brighter. Neither happening buoyed my confidence. Talk to me, old man. This ain't the time for any of your bullshit. That haze, 
That ain't no mist, Morgan. The light ain't shining off it. It's making the light. And the mist and light were drifting toward the city. Horse Pucky. You can see where there's a light burning in their camp. That's something else. There's two things going on at once, Morgan. Three things, half-wit. Goblin had arrived, beer breath and all. Presumably all was well at the secret brewery. The arrangements with the cavalry were secure, and he and one eye could take time off to help the black company defend Dejigore. Heaven help them if Mogaba discovered what they were doing with grain supposedly set aside for the horses. I wouldn't have a prayer of saving their butts, nor would I offer one. What? One eye barked. Morgan, the man is a walking provocation. Watch, bonehead, Goblin countered. It's already happening. One eye gasped, suddenly astonished, then frightened. Ignorant in the dark arts, it took me longer to catch it. Shadows snaked through that blazing dust cloud. Thin things, little more than suggestions, but with something flitting back and forth amongst them. I thought both of a weaver's shuttle and of spiders. Whichever, web or net, something was forming inside the blazing dust. They did call him Shadow Spinner. The glimmering cloud grew larger and brighter. The web grew with it. Shit, Goblin muttered. Now what do we do about this? Exactly what I've been trying to get out of you two clowns for the last five minutes. I bellowed. Well, maybe you could pay attention over here if you can't do anything about that. Bucket yelled. Morgan, those fools have gotten so many ropes up that we can't... Shit! Another barrage of grapnels fell amongst us. In moments they showed the strain that meant some moron was trying to climb them. So much for my belief that there was no chance the southerners could scale my wall. Guys were hard at work with knives and swords and axes. Imaginary people stood around looking fierce. I heard a man grumble that if he'd had half a brain, he would have sharpened his knives. Rudy reminded him, If you kept your pecker in your pants more, you'd have time. Some Jaikuri women, naturally, inevitably, did what they had to do to survive. Doing my part, I hacked on ropes, but kept turning to check that light and the webs forming inside it. Goblin howled, creased by a nearly spent arrow. The cut on his cheek was trivial. Arrows have little energy by the time they reach us. He was outraged because fate dared show him the back of her hand at all. He danced around. Words of power virtually dripped from his mouth in pastel colors. He waved his arms. He foamed at the mouth. He jumped up and down, shrieked, flapped his arms. His doppelgangers all did the same. It was quite a show. In all likelihood, the gymnastics and yelling had nothing to do with results eventually achieved. But I don't mind showmanship as long as he produces. Croker was right. Showmanship is the biggest part of the game. Everything hemp within 300 yards burst into flame. That was a happy eventuality where our relationship with our attackers was concerned, but not something likely to wring cries of joy from anyone else, either. Temporary defense works began to fall apart. Our artillery pieces flared and died. They had included lots of rope. Some guys use rope for belts. Some wear sandals made of rope. Hemp is commonplace everywhere. Some fools like one eye even smoke it. Cletus bellowed, God damn you, goblin! I'm gonna chop your ass into cat food! The rest of us just 
pulled our pants up and amused ourselves by dropping masonry bits, mined from our cellars, onto the cursing tangle of limbs wriggling at the foot of the wall. One I ignored all that, though he took a moment to smirk at the side effects embarrassing Goblin. Then he began to stare at the glow rising from the enemy camp and began to stutter. Come on, shithead, I growled. You've played with the stuff for ages. What have we got here? Not that I wanted to know. That web of shadow woven into the light was now obvious to all but the blind. Maybe we might ought to head for the cellar, one I suggested. I promise you me and the runt ain't gonna do nothing with that. Bet you even Long Shadow would be bug-eyed if he was here to see it. The man put a lot of work in, getting that ready. It's going to get real unhealthy around here real soon. Without investing a quarter of the study time, Goblin agreed. If we seal the doors and use the white candles, we can hold out till sunrise. There's some kind of shadow magic, then? Some kind. Goblin agreed. Don't ask me to look so close I catch its attention. Heaven forbid you should actually take a risk. Can either of you come up with a more practical suggestion? More practical? One eye sputtered. We're fighting a battle here. Goblin said, We could retire from the soldiering racket. Or we could surrender. Or we could offer to change sides. Maybe we could offer up a half-pint human sacrifice to one of Geek and Freak's bloodthirsty gods. You know what I really miss about Croker, Mergen? I'm sure you're going to tell me whether I want to hear it or not. Damned straight you are. I miss his sense of humor. Wait a minute. His sense of humor? Are you shitting me? What sense of humor? The man... He knew none of us were going to get out of this world alive, Mergen. He never took himself completely serious. Are you talking about the guy who used to be the old man? Croker, company analyst and chief bone setter in his spare time. Some kind of comedian? While we bickered, the rest of the world bustled along with its business which meant our situation deteriorated by the minute. A human weakness, as old as time, arguing while the house burns down around you. One eye interjected. You gents go ahead and debate if you want. I'm going to invite the boys downstairs, treat them to a beer, and take a turn or two at Tonk. He stabbed a crooked black finger earthward. The gleaming dust with cruel web inside began to arc up over the city. It just might grow enough to net us all. A vast stillness set in. Inside the city and out, friend and foe, people of a dozen races and religions all focused upon that shadow web. Shadow Spinner, of course, was totally involved in creating his deadly artifact. The Shadow Lander assault lost impetus as the Shadow Master's soldiers decided to hunker down and let their boss make their jobs easier. Chapter 23 The web of darkness would span all Dejigore soon. One Eye, Goblin, you guys have any new ideas? Get religion? Goblin suggested. Since you won't let us go den up? One eye mused. You might amble over and see if Mogaba will change his mind about letting us operate his engines. The Taglian crews were ineffective. We might be able to distract Spinner. You did take shadows into account when you spelled the entrances to the underground. I knew they had. 
That was always our biggest concern. But I had to reassure myself. You keep checking on Goblin and One-Eye. Small groups were returning after long, dangerous journeys through the night, searching for rope that had survived. Yeah, for what that's worth. You ready to go down and start starving yet? Bad signs followed ill omens. The situation was grim indeed if one eye and goblin could spare no time to quarrel. A sudden susurrus swept the city and the plain beyond. The blazing diamond of light rose out of the Shadowlander camp. It spun slowly. A core of darkness centered it. From that, blackness pulsed out into the all-spanning web it anchored. Nobody was looking at the hills when the pinkish light returned. No one noticed until it flared so brilliantly that it rivaled the brightness here at hand. It burned behind two bizarre mounted figures. It cast their hideous shadows upon the night itself. Crow shadows circled them. Two huge ravens perched upon the shoulders of the larger figure. Nobody breathed for a while. Not even Shadow Spinner, I'd bet. And I was sure he had no more idea what was happening than I did. The pink flare faded. A cable of pink reached toward Dejagore like a snake probing, stretching. As one end neared us, the nether end broke loose. That whipped our way too fast for the eye to follow, and in an instant screamed into Shadow Spinner's bright diamond. Sun brilliant flash splashed out of that sorcerous construct's far side like suddenly flung barrels of burning oil. Immediately, the dark web overhead began to shrink back into the remnants of the diamond. The air vibrated with the Shadow Master's anger. Goblin! One Eye! Talk to me, boys! Tell me what the hell just happened! Goblin couldn't talk. One eye burbled, I ain't got the faintest fucking idea, kid. But we're downwind of one seriously pissed off Shadow Master, who's probably going to blame you and me for his ulcers. A tremor disturbed the night, more psychic than physical. I am magically deaf and dumb and blind, except for perceived effects, but I felt it. One eye was right. The pink light was gone. I saw no more sign of those bizarre riders. Who were they? What? How? I didn't get a chance to ask. Little brown fellows, carrying torches so they could see where they were running, burst out of the Shadowlander camp. That could not bode well for me, my pals, or anyone else inside the wall. Poor Spinner. I cracked. You gotta feel for the man. Huh? Sparkle was the only man close enough to hear. Don't you hate it when some no-brain vandalizes a work of art? Sparkle didn't get it. He shook his head, grabbed a javelin, and threw it down at a short person with a torch. He missed. Around where those Shadowlanders had gained a foothold on the wall and on the earthen approach ramps, a big racket began to develop. The Shadow Master, peaked, had told his boys to get back to work, and don't be so damned gentle anymore. Hey, Bubba Doo! I shouted at a soldier. Who's got tonight in the pool? There is the black company for you. We've got a pool on what night the city will fall. I guess the winner gets to die with a smile on his ugly mug. Chapter 24 Goblin and One-Eye had chosen to stay close to me. The real Goblin and One-Eye. I checked every few minutes to make sure. Their attention was on the hills, not the excitement across town or any of their own schemes. Strange lights moved out there. A band of Southerners sent out earlier returned at a gallop, half their number missing. They flew as though devils worse than their boss were after them. 
They dared ride the way they did only because Storm Shadow had been obsessive when she leveled the plane and because there was light from the city. Fires were burning. Only a few so far, but fires. Sparkle told me, They're pulling out down below. I leaned over and looked. Nobody tried to pick me off. Maybe they thought I was another ghost. Sure enough, the Shadowlanders were going, leaving us all those wonderful grapnels without ropes. For us to dump on our maybe we can use these someday pile. One eye said, Guess we can put up our swords and go back to our tonk games now. Overlooking the fact that Dejigore was being invaded elsewhere, I observed, This is the second time you've come out with that silliness. What moron is going to play with you? Can't be anybody that dumb still alive. One eye cheats at cards, and he cheats badly. He gets caught every time. Nobody will play with him. Hi, Margan, listen. I've reformed. Really. Never again will I dishonor my talent to why listen. He said it all before countless times. The first thing we do after we swear a recruit into the company is warn him not to play cards with one eye. A party of Shadowlanders, withdrawn from my sector, headed for the hills. They all had torches. It looked like the Shadow Master himself might be driving them. Cletus! Longinus! You guys far enough along that you can drop a barrage on that crowd? The brothers were repairing their engines as fast as they could. Two were ready, cocked and loaded. Not much of a barrage. One eye asked, why do that? Why not? We might get lucky. And can we piss off Shadow Spinner more than he already is? He's already vowed to kill us all. The ballistas thumped. The shafts they hurled did not hit the Shadow Master. Distractedly, he replied with a spear of energy that dissolved several cubic yards of wall far from any of my guys. The racket from across town kept getting louder. Some seemed closer than the far wall. They're inside, Sparkle said. A lot of them, Bucket agreed. This could get to be a big cleanup job. I liked that positive thinking. I shrugged. Mogaba liked to keep the cleanups for himself and the Gnar and their taglions. Fine with me. Mogaba can eat all the pain he can swallow. I really wanted to take a nap. This long day just kept getting longer. Oh well, soon enough I would get to sleep forever. A short while later I got word that small groups of southerners were in the streets murdering anybody they could catch. Sir? Sleepy. What's up, youngster? Sleepy was a Taglian Shadar we swore into the company just before I decided to take up this pen. He always looked like he was having trouble keeping his eyes open. He also looked like he was about 14 years old, which was possible. He was paranoid in the extreme, apparently for good reason. He was a good-looking youth, and pretty boys are fair game amongst Taglian men of all three major religious groups. The Stranglers used their more attractive sons to lure victims to their deaths. Different land, different customs. You may not like them, but you do have to live with them. Sleepy liked our ways better than his own. Sir, he said, the Nar aren't trying to keep the Southerners from heading this way. They don't bother them at all anymore after they get through and off the wall as long as they don't head into Mogaba's barracks area. Is that deliberate? Bucket asked. Someone muttered, Now we ask a stupid question. What do you think? One eye snapped. This is the last straw. If that big-headed, self-important dick shows his face around here... Save it, One eye. This was hard to accept. But I could see Mogaba being capable of channeling the enemy our way so as to resolve questions of precedence inside the company. 
his morality would allow him to picture it as a brilliant solution to several problems. Instead of standing around bitching about it, how about we do some thinking? Best way to fix Mogaba would be to shove his plan up his ass no grease. While the others tried to manage that difficult exercise, thinking, I questioned Sleepy more closely. Unfortunately, he could not add much but the general routes the Southerners were using to push deeper into the city. You couldn't blame the Shadowlanders. Most soldiers at most times jump at the chance to go where resistance is weakest. Maybe we could use that to pull some into some sort of killing pocket. I even got a chuckle out of my predicament. I bet Croker would have seen this coming a month ago, as paranoid as he was about supposed friends and allies. A nearby crow squawked agreement. I should have considered the possibility. I really should have. Far-fetched is not the same as impossible. I should have had something planned. One eye became as serious as he ever gets. You know what this means. If the kid is right. The company is at war with itself. The little guy waved that off like it was just another annoying gnat of reality. Suppose Mogaba is giving them a golden bridge so they can't get rid of us for him. They still have to get through the pilgrims to reach us. I didn't need to think long to see what he meant. That asshole. He's going to make them kill Shadowlanders in self-defense. He's going to use them up, killing his enemies for him. Maybe he's a bigger snake than anybody thought, Bucket growled. It's for sure he's changed a lot since Gaz Lee. This ain't right, I muttered. All those swords would enter the fight on our side, whether or not they wanted to. Other than a few small skirmishes with lost invaders during past attacks, the worst that had happened to the Nyang Bao was that their pilgrimage had gotten them trapped in the middle of somebody else's war. From the first clash of steel, they had worked hard to maintain their neutrality. Shadow Spinner has his spies in the city. He would know the Nguyen Bao had no interest in antagonizing him. What do you think they'll do? Goblin asked. The Nguyen Bao, I mean. His voice sounded odd. How much beer had he put away? How the hell would I know? Depends on how they see things. If they think Mogaba dragged them into it on purpose, it might get unhealthy to belong to the company. Mogaba could see this as a chance to swish us into a crack between a rock and a hard place. I'd better go see their speaker and let him know what's happening. Bucket, make up a 20-man patrol and go looking for Southerners. See if Sleepy is right. One Eye, go with him. Spot for him and cover our guys. Sparkle, you watch things here. Send Sleepy after me if it gets too much to handle. Nobody argued. When things get tight, the guys do become less fractious. I descended the stairway to the street. Chapter 25 I played the game the way I thought the Nguyen Bao would want. Ever since childhood, I have suspected you get along better if you respect people's ways and wishes, regardless of your apparent relative strengths. That doesn't mean you let people walk on you. It doesn't mean you eat their pain for them. You need to demand respect for yourself, too. Dejigore's byways are close and fetid, typical of a fortified city. I went to an obscure intersection where... Under normal circumstances, I could expect to be seen by Nguyen Bao watchers. They are a cautious people. They watch all the time. I announced, I would see the speaker. Harm is headed his way. I would have him know what I know. I didn't see anybody. I didn't hear anybody. I expected nothing else. Someone who strolled into my territory would see and hear nothing either. 
but death would be nearby. The only sounds came from fighting several blocks away. I waited. Suddenly, in that instant when my attention finally wandered, Kidam's son materialized. He made no more noise than a tiptoeing moth. He was a wide, short man of indeterminate age. He carried an unusually long sword, but it remained sheathed across his back. He stared at me hard. I stared back. It cost me nothing. He grunted, indicated that I should follow. We walked no more than eighty yards. He indicated a doorway. Keep smiling, I told him. I couldn't resist. He was always around somewhere, watching. I never saw him smile. I pushed the door inward. Curtains hung two feet inside. Very weak light slipped through a rent. I closed the door carefully once I understood that I would be entering alone before I parted the curtains. Wouldn't do to let light splash into the street. The place turned out to be about as pleasant as you can get in a city. The speaker sat on a mat on a dirty floor near the one candle offering light. There were about a dozen people visible of all ages and sexes. I saw four children, all small, six adults of an age to be their parents, and one old woman of granny age who glowered like she had a special bunk in hell reserved for me, even though she'd never seen me before. I saw nobody who could pass as her husband. Maybe he was the guy outside. Then there was a woman as old as Kidam. A fragile flower. Time diminished to little more than skin-covered sticks, though an agile intelligence still burned in her eyes. You would get nothing past this woman. Of material things, I saw little but the clothing the people wore, a few ragged blankets, a couple of clay cups, and a pot maybe used for cooking, and more swords, nearly as long and fine as that carried by the speaker's son. In the darkness beyond the candlelight, someone groaned. It was the sound of someone delirious. Set, Kidam invited. A second mat lay unrolled beside the candle. In the weak light, the old man seemed more frail than when he visited the wall. I sat. Though I wasn't used to it and my tendons weren't supple enough, I tried to cross my legs. I waited. Kidam would invite me to speak when it was time. I tried to concentrate on the old man, not the people staring at me, nor the smell of too many folks living in too small a space, of their strange foods, nor even the odor of sickness. A woman brought tea. How she made it, I don't know. I never saw any fire. I didn't think about that at the moment, though. So startled was I. She was beautiful. Even in dirt and rags, incredibly beautiful. I brought the hot tea to my lips and scalded them to shock myself back to business. I felt sorrow instantly. This one would pay dearly when the southerners took the town. A small smile touched Kidam's lips. I noticed amusement on the face of the old woman, too, and recognized there a similar beauty, only externally betrayed by time. They were used to my initial reaction. Maybe it was some kind of test, bringing her out of the shadows. Almost too softly to be heard, the old man said, She is indeed. Louder, he added, you are wise beyond your years, soldier of darkness. What was this soldier of darkness crap? Every time he addressed me, he stuck me with another name. I tried a formal head bow of acknowledgement. Thank you for that compliment, speaker. I hoped he would realize that I was incapable of keeping up with the subtleties of proper manners amongst the Nguyen Bao. 
I sense in you a great anxiety, held in check only by chains of will. He sipped tea calmly but eyed me in a way that told me hastiness would be tolerated if I thought it really necessary. I said, Great evils stalk the night speaker. Unexpected monsters have slipped their leashes. So I surmised when you were kind enough to permit me atop your section of wall. There is a new beast loose, one I never expected to see. In retrospect, I realize we were speaking of two different things. One I do not know how to handle. I strove to keep my Tanglian pronunciations clear. Men conversing in a tongue native to neither sorely tempt the devils of misunderstanding. He seemed puzzled. I do not understand you. I glanced around. Did all his people live like this all the time? They were packed in way tighter than we were. Of course we could enforce our claims to space with our swords. Do you know about the Black Company? Do you know our recent history? Rather than await an answer, I sketched our immediate past. Kidam was one of those rare people who listened with every ounce of his being. I finished. The old man said, Time has perhaps made of you shadows of the soldiers of darkness. You have been gone so long and have journeyed so far that you have strayed from your way completely. Nor are the followers of the warrior Prince Mogaba hewing any nearer the true path. I did not hide my thoughts well. Kidam and his woman found me amusing again. But I am not one of you, Standard Bearer. My knowledge has drifted far from the truth as well. Perhaps there is no real truth today because there is no one who knows it anymore. I didn't have a clue what the hell he was talking about. You have wandered long and far, Standard Bearer. But you may yet come home again. His expression darkened momentarily. Though you wish that you had not. Where is your standard, standard bearer? I don't know. It vanished during the big battle on the plane outside. I jammed its button to the earth when I decided to put on my captain's armor in order to pretend that he had not fallen so the troops would rally the old man raised a hand. I think it may be very close tonight. I hate this obscurity crap old people and wizards like to perpetrate. I'm convinced that they do it only because it gives them a feeling of power. Screw the missing standard. It was not germane now, tonight. I said, The Nar chieftain wants to be captain of the Black Company. He does not approve of the ways of those of us from the far north. I paused, but the old man had dried up. He waited. I said, Mogaba is flawless as a warrior, but he has shortcomings in some areas of leadership. Kidam then proved to be less than the totally inscrutable and eternally patient old-timer you are led to expect in these situations. You came to warn me that he has chosen to lessen his problems by letting southerners do his knife work, standard bearer? Huh? One of my grandsons was in a position to overhear while Mogaba debated tonight's actions with his lieutenants Ochiba Sindawe. Ranjal Pirindi and Chalgandagan. Because Taglian conspirators were present, the Na failed to squabble in their native tongue, though Mogaba showed limited facility with the Taglian. Excuse me, sir? What your honor compels you to report to me, although you only harbor suspicions now, 
is far worse than you fear. Overruling strong objections by his Na lieutenants, Morgaba set forth a plan for tonight, which will allow southerners, who reach the ramparts and do not dally there, to have their ways behind the wall. Taglian legionnaires will discourage them from attacking any direction but through our quarter into yours. You knew already. That's what you're saying. Before I got here, you had an actual witness. Tie day. A young man rose. He was an unpleasant-looking, skinny little guy who had a toddler in his arms. Kidam said, He does not speak Taglian well, but he understands it good enough. He overheard the plot being hatched. He overheard the arguments of those who found it dishonorable. He saw an angry Mogapa go so far as to continue during the visit of a man believed to be an instrument of the Shadow Masters. That hit me. It meant that, as of that moment, there existed a tacit agreement between Morgaba and Shadow Spinner, good until me and mine had been obliterated. This is cruel treachery indeed, Speaker. Kidam nodded. Then he told me, There is more, Stone Soldier. Both Ranjal Pirindi and Gandagan are intimates of the Prabrindra Dra. Speaking with the prince's voice, they assured Mogaba that once the siege has been broken and your band has been eliminated, the prince will announce his personal support of Mogaba's captaincy of your company. In exchange, Mogaba will abandon your previous captain's quest to become chief warlord of Taglius. With all powers necessary to prosecute the war, against the Shadowlands. Man, that was some job of eavesdropping. Tide almost smiled. And some job of treachery put together by Brother Mogapa. I could see why Ochiba and Sindawe would argue against it. It was a betrayal almost beyond comprehension. Mogaba had indeed gone through some dark changes since Gea's Lee. I asked, What does he have against you people? Nothing. Politically, he should be indifferent to us. We have never been a factor in Taglin affairs. But we mean nothing to him in any other way either. He is eager to spend us like found coin. If the southerners attack you after fighting his forces, then us, huge numbers of his enemies, and us, resource-gulping undesirables, will have been eliminated. Once I admired this man greatly, Speaker. Men change, Standard Bearer, and this one more than most. He is an actor, and but one wicked purpose impels all his acting. Speaker, this Mogapa is the center of and the reason for everything that Mogapa does. Mogapa will sacrifice his best friend upon an altar to himself, though probably not even a god could convince the friend that the possibility exists. Mogapa's every wicked order draws another veil off the black blotch devouring his soul. He has changed, as the most perfect pomegranate will change when the mould gets inside its skin. Here we go, talking old-timer sideways again. Standard bear! Though I know of the black danger to my people already, I am honored that you believed us worthy of a warning, however pressing your other concerns. That was an act of generosity and friendship. 
we do not forget those who have extended their hands. Thank you. I am pleased by your response. You better believe. And if Mogaba allows you to be attacked, the problem is upon us already, Stone Soldier. Sadhanas are dying right now, only yards away. Once it became evident that we were trapped here, we all learned every nuance of the ground upon which we might fight. This is not our swamp, but the principles of battle remain the same. We have been prepared for this night for many weeks. It remained to be seen only who would choose to become our enemy. Huh? I could be stupid as a stone when I ran into something cold. You should rejoin those who look to you for leadership. Do so, secure in the knowledge that you have the friendship of the Nguyen Bao. An honor. Or curse. The old man chuckled. Does that mean your people will actually talk to mine? That might be a little too much. He chuckled again. His wife smiled too. What a wild joker he was. The man was a laugh riot. He said, Taide, go with this man. You may speak if spoken to, but only as my mouth. Bone warrior, this is my grandson. He will understand you. Send him to me if you have a need to communicate. Do not be frivolous. I understand. I tried to get up, embarrassed myself by failing to get my legs untangled. One of the kids laughed. I dared glance around for a reaction from the dream woman who brought the tea. Sure, I was not fooling Kidam. A baby slept in her lap. The toddler dozed under her left arm. She was awake, watching. She looked tired, frightened, confused, and determined. About like the rest of us. Whenever that moaning came from the darkness, she winced and looked that way. The pain was a part of her. I bowed myself out. The Nguyen Bao Tai Dei led me back to familiar territory. Chapter 26 I don't know, I told Goblin when he asked about my Nguyen Bao shadow. He don't talk much. I had not gotten a word out of him yet. His all-purpose vocabulary seems to be the non-committal grunt. Anyway, the visit wasn't necessary. The Nguyen Bao know more about the coming shit rain than we do. The old man admits it's all Mogaba's fault and says we're off the hook. Goblin made as though to look over his shoulder, like he was trying to check his own behind. Yep, I agreed. Strap on your chastity belt. What's happening? I didn't see Bucket or Sparkle. Not much yet. Spinner and his bunch just got to the hills. And all kinds of excitement broke out out there. A strong pink light cast silhouettes on the night again. Goblin said, They look exactly like the life-taker and widow-maker costumes Lady made for her and Croker. Hey, how come you look like you got bit on the ass by a ghost? Because maybe I did. They do look exactly like what you say. Only... If you remember, I took the Widowmaker armor off Croker after that arrow got him. I put it on and pretended to be him, and failed because I started too late. So? So last week somebody stole the Widowmaker armor, right out of my quarters while I was laying there asleep. I thought I had it hidden where nobody but me could ever find it, but somebody came in, stepped over me, got it dug out, and got out of there with the load, and I never saw or heard a thing. And neither did anybody else. And that was definitely scary. 
Is that why you were asking all those weird questions the other day? Goblin squeaked. He could sound like a stomped mouse when he was distressed. Yeah. How come you never said anything? Because whoever took the armor had to use sorcery to get past me. I figured it was one of you guys. And I wanted to find out which one so I could cut him off at the ankles before he knew it was coming. One eye came puffing up the stairs. Not bad for a guy two hundred years old. What gives? How come the grim faces? Goblin filled him in. The little black wizard grumped. You should have told us, Margan. We might have picked up a hot trail. Not likely. The only evidence I had found was one small white feather and a glob of what looked like bird shit. It don't matter now. I know where the armor is. Out there! I pointed at the hills which lay beneath what looked like a premature pink dawn. What did you do? We killed off a bunch of goddamned southerners, that's what we did. Mogaba must be selling them tickets over there. The little suckers are thicker than lice. Anyway, we got out before we used up our luck. Them Nguyen Bao are really going bugfuck. He gave Tai Day the fish eye. Looks like they're trying to make the Shadowlanders want to go chomp on Mogaba's rear. Serve the asshole right, he gets ate up by his own plot. What the hell is going on up there? He meant the pink-soaked hills. Goblin replied, That's something we weren't looking for. A god of darkness reared against the pink. Human figures tumbled within it. They flared, burned like bright, brief-lived stars. Moments later, an earth tremor rocked the city. I lost my footing briefly. One I observed. For once you're right, Runt. There's a player in the game we didn't know about. A pair of crows a few yards off went into hysterics. They jumped into the darkness, kept laughing as they flapped away. Surprise, surprise, I muttered. What with all that booming and crashing and crap in those hills? Come on, guys, tell me who. The rest even a dummy like me can figure out, so just tell me who. We're gonna work on that, one I promised. Maybe we'd even start now if you went away and left us alone. Come on, Runt. While him and his frog-faced buddy got to work, I turned my attention to the excitement still festering inside Dejigore. Possibly thousands of Shadowlanders had crossed the wall now. A lot of fires were burning. I asked Kidam's grandson, Will the light be trouble for your people? He shrugged. This fellow was no gossip. Chapter 27 There was no night now. Fires burned everywhere. They burned in the Shadowlander camp, set by Mogaba's beleaguered artillerymen. They burned in the city, set by the Shadowmaster's soldiers. Conflagrations blazed in the hills, hinting of surprise volcanoes, or powers of a magnitude unseen since the company went up against the Dark Lords of Ladies' Empire. It was too much light for the middle of the night. How long till dawn? Anybody know? Too long, Bucket grumbled. You really think anybody is actually worrying about keeping time tonight? Way back, centuries earlier in the evening, one eye or goblin or somebody expressed dawn as a goal too remote for hope. The general level of optimism remained that low. Reports came in, none of them good. Innumerable southern soldiers were inside the city. 
They had orders to drive toward us, wipe us out, then continue on around inside and atop the wall, the long way, till they got back where they had started. But the Nguyeng Bao were not cooperating. Neither were my guys. So the invaders were blundering around, doing any damage they could, till somebody killed them. Against the Jaikuri, cowering in their homes, hoping to be overlooked despite all their experience with the Shadow Masters, the Southerners enjoyed some success. You could not fault them for not going all out after us. They did not want to get killed either. And Mogaba should not have been surprised when some of the villains he let through turned on him. Our guys held their positions. The doppelgangers and illusions drove the Southerners crazy. They never knew which threat was real. But the big reason our side held up well was that there was no choice. We had nowhere to run. Shadow Spinner was no help to his people. He was out in those hills intent on undoing that mystery personally. Clearly, he regretted having made the choice. Once again, a band of riders came flying back, silhouetted by pink light. The Shadow Master did not appear to be with them. Goblin! One-Eye! Where the hell are you now, you little shits? Has something happened to Shadow Spinner? Goblin materialized, his breath heavy with the smell of beer. He and One-Eye had a few gallons stashed somewhere nearby then. He dashed my hopes. The Shadow Master is alive, Mergen. But maybe he's messed his drawers. He giggled. Oh, shit, I muttered. The little toad had gotten deep into the home brew. If one I had to, I might have one truly interesting rest of the night. It was possible those two would forget everything and pick up the few they have had going for a hundred years. Last time they got drunk and went after each other, they tore up a whole city block in Taglios. All the while, the speaker's grandson hung back in the shadows and watched like one of those goddamned crows. There were a lot more of those around now. Old Weezer came puffing up from the street. He had to take a break before he got to the top. He hacked and coughed and spat blood. He was from the same part of the world as One Eye. They have nothing else in common except a taste for beer. Weezer had been to the barrel a few times, too. He came on up top as I surveyed the city and tried to guess how bad things really were. We were getting very little pressure right then. Weezer hacked and wheezed and spat. A new generation of pink lights erupted at the feet of the hills. They cast two shadows against the sky. There was no doubt they were shadows of Widowmaker and Lifetaker the dread alter-egos Lady created for herself and Croker so they could scare shit out of Shadowlanders. This isn't possible, I told my tame wizards. One eye was back. He used one hand to support Weezer, who seemed to be suffering an asthma attack along with the effects of his tuberculosis. In his other hand, one eye clutched something pole-like wrapped in rags, I continued, that can't be Croker and Lady because I saw them go down with my own eyes. A handful of horsemen drifted toward town. Among them was a blob of darkness that had to be Shadow Spinner. He was staying busy. Pink fireflies swarmed around him. He had trouble fending them off. As though they realized their boss would be in a foul temper when he got back, the Southerners' attack suddenly picked up. I'm not sure, Goblin mused. He sounded like he'd been scared sober. I can't get any sense of the one in the Lifetaker armor. There's a shitload of power there, though. 
Lady had no power left. I reminded him. The other one does feel like Croker. Couldn't be. Weezer finally gasped. Mokaba! Several men spat at mention of the name. Everybody had an opinion about our fearless war chief. Listening to them, you might have concluded that Mogaba was the most lusted after man in town. A writhing pink thread reached for Shadow Spinner's party. The Shadow Master batted it away from himself, but it slew half his party. Parts of bodies flew in all directions. Shit, somebody said, pretty much capturing the popular feeling. Weezer barked. Mogaba wants to know if we can free up a few hundred men to counterattack the enemy who are inside the city. How stupid does that bastard think we are? Sparkle grumbled. Goblin asked, Don't that camel's wife know we're on to him? Why should he think we might suspect him? He's got such a tall opinion of his own brain. I think it's funny, Bucket crowed. He tried to screw us and only ended up with his own ass in a sling. Even better, maybe the only way he can pry it out is to have us do it for him. I asked Goblin, what's one eye up to? One eye looked like he was praying over one of the ballistas with Loftus. Rags lay scattered around their feet. A gruesome black spear lay in the engine's trough. I don't know. I checked the nearest gate. The Nar there could see us. Mogaba would know I was lying if I claimed we were too beat up to send help. I asked, Anybody think of a reason we should help Mogaba? To hold my sector, besides the old crew itself, I had 600 Taglian survivors from Ladies' Division and an uncertain and changeable number of liberated slaves, former prisoners of war, and ambitious Jaikuri. Everyone replied in the negative. Nobody wanted to help Mogaba. As I approached the engines, I asked, How about if we do it just to save our own butts? If we let Mogaba get stomped, we could end up facing the rest of the Shadowlander mob by ourselves. I glanced at the gate. And those people over there can see everything we do. Goblin looked, too. He shook his head to lessen the beer buzz. We'll have to think about that. What are you doing, One-Eye? I was beside him now. One-Eye indicated the spear proudly. Little something I've been working on in my spare time. It's ugly enough. Nice to know he could do something useful without being told. He had begun with a black wooden pole and had worked it for a lot of hours. It was covered with incredibly ugly miniature seams along with writing in an unfamiliar alphabet. Its head was as black as its shaft, darkened iron finely traced with silver runes. There was some color on the shaft too, although so fine as to be almost invisible. Very nice. Nice. Sigh. You heathen. He pointed. Loftus looked, so did I. Shadow Spinner's party, sadly depleted, surrounded by swarms of pink sparkles and mocking crows, was getting close. One eye snickered. This here is my Shadow Master Blaster Bastard. He howled. He must have put away a lot of that beer. Nothing he couldn't stop on a lazy afternoon. But this ain't no lazy afternoon, is it?
Loftus shoots this stick, won't be in the air five seconds. That's all the time he'll have to figure out what's coming and what to do to unravel the spells that are there to keep him from turning it. And look how busy that asshole is already. Loftus, my man, get ready to carve you a big victory notch on this thing. As anybody with any sense does, Loftus ignored one eye. He laid his weapon with an artist's care. One eye babbled. Most of the spells are designed to penetrate his personal protection, counting on him not having time to do anything actively. Because I wanted to concentrate on piercing one point in a passive, I shut him out. Goblin, any chance this will work? The runt's not exactly a heavyweight. It's workable, tactically. If he really worked that hard on it, Say one eye is an order of magnitude weaker than Shadow Spinner. That really only means that it takes him ten times as long to get the same work done. An order of magnitude? So that was one eye's problem. More like two orders, really, probably. He lost me. And I didn't have time to wring an explanation out of him. Loftus was satisfied he was leading his target perfectly. He had the range, whatever. Time, he said. Chapter 28 Loose, I suggested. The ballista offered its distinctive thump. Silence spread along the wall. The black shaft darted across the night. The occasional spark floated behind it. One eye said five seconds of flight. The truth was more like four, but they took forever. There was ample firelight to illuminate the Shadow Master. Shortly he would disappear behind one of the enfilading towers. He stared back at the hills as he rode. Those bizarre riders out there were on the plane now. Daring someone, anyone, to answer their challenge. I gasped. Widowmaker carried the lance. The standard itself was not apparent, but that was the lance on which it had ridden from the day the Black Company left Katovar. Every single analyst has kept close track, although the reason for doing so has been forgotten. I focused on Shadow Spinner in time to see One-Eye's treasure arrive. Later, Goblin told me Spinner sensed the threat as the missile hit the peak of its arc. Whatever he did then, it was the right thing. Or he was lucky. Or a higher power decreed that this was not his night to die. The spear changed course by scant inches, Instead of striking Shadow Spinner, it hit his mount's shoulder and ripped through the beast as though it was no more substantial than air. The wound glowed red, flickered. The red spread. Shadow Spinner bellowed in rage as the animal threw him. He fell in a heap, lay there twitching long enough for one eye to start nagging Loftus about hitting him with a barrage of regular shafts. Then he scuttled off like a crab to escape the stallion's pounding hooves. I recognized that animal then. It was one of those magically bred monster horses Lady brought south with the company out of her old empire. They vanished during the battle. The horse screamed and screamed. A normal animal would have perished in moments. I stared at those two riders out there. They walked toward the city slowly, offering their challenge. Now I could see that they too were mounted on ladies' stallions. I told Goblin, but I saw them killed. One eye grumbled. We got to check this boy's eyes. Goblin said, I told you before, that's not Lady. You look real close. You can see differences in the armor. 
The troops were seeing that. There was a stir among the Taglians. And you don't know about the other one. What are they talking about over there? No, it could be the old man. Sparkle went to see why the Taglians were excited. Shadow Spinner's horse collapsed but continued screaming and kicking. Wisps of greenish steam rose from its wound. That continued to grow. The beast's death was a long time coming. The sorcerer would have died more slowly and gruesomely still had one eye shaft struck home. Sparkle came to say, They're all excited because that armor is an exact match for some goddess named Kina in her battle avatar. That's the way she's always portrayed in paintings about her war with the demons. I had no idea what he was talking about, only that Kina was some sort of death goddess in these parts. I wondered when the Shadow Master would snipe back at one eye. He won't, Goblin assured me. The moment he gave it attention enough to be effective, those two out there would cut his legs off. I watched Shadow Spinner limp out of sight. His embarrassment spurred his soldiers to increase their efforts again. Somebody would pay for his indignity and pain. Understandably, they preferred that we pick up that tab. Some of them seemed to recognize the life-taker armor, too. I heard the name Kina shouted more than once below the wall. Tide, time for a message to your grandfather. I want to bring part of my force through his area so I can help drive the southerners out of the city. The Nguyen Bao stepped out of the shadows just long enough to listen. He stared at those riders, troubled. Then he grunted, descended to the street, and trotted off into the night. Listen up, people. We're going to save our fearless dickhead leader. Bucket. Chapter 29 I stepped into a dark alleyway, planning to set up shop behind a southern company with Goblin to do his hoodoo on them, and it was like I stepped off the edge of the world into an abyss without bottom, like some great psychic flyswatter slapped me down into the void. Goblin barked something in the instant it took to go, but I did not understand him. I had that moment to feel seasick, to be bewildered, to wonder who had ambushed me with what sorcery and why it seemed to twist me like a wet rag being wrung out. Had Mogaba taken his treachery to another level? Chapter 30 Something had hold of me. It pulled so virulently there was no resisting it. I lost track of who I was and where. I knew only that I was asleep and did not want to wake up. Mergen! A far voice called. The pull strengthened. Mergen, come on! Come home! Fight it, kid! Fight it! I fought. But it was that voice I fought. It wanted me to come somewhere that much of me did not want to go. Pain awaited me there. The pull redoubled as the force dragged at me with inescapable power. That did it, somebody shouted. We have him back now. I knew that voice. It was like coming out of a coma, except that I remembered where I had been in every detail. De Jigore. Every little ache, every horror, every fear. But already the sharp edges were going dull. The ties were slipping. I was here now. Here. Which, when, and where was here? I tried opening my eyes. My lips would not respond. I tried to move. My limbs refused to be troubled. He's all here. 
Pull that curtain. I heard heavy cloth being moved. Will it keep getting harder? I thought we were supposed to be over the worst, that he couldn't recede so far that we would have this much trouble bringing him home. Oh, that voice belonged to Croker, the old man. Only the old man is dead because I saw him killed. Or did I? Didn't I just leave Widowmaker? Alive long past his time? Well, he didn't listen. But it can't do anything but get better now. We're around the corner, over the hump. Unless he wants to stay lost. I got an eye open. I was in a dark place. I had never seen it before, but it had to be in the palace at Trogo Taglios. Home. Never have I seen that kind of stone used anywhere else. And there was nothing astonishing about not being able to recognize parts of the palace. The princes of Taglios all add on a bit during their reigns. Supposedly only the old royal wizard Smoke ever knew his way around the whole place. And Smoke isn't with us anymore. I don't know what happened to him afterward, but several years ago he got torn up when a supernatural creature he disagreed with tried to eat him. Handy, because about then was when we discovered that he had been seduced by Long Shadow and had gone over to the Shadow Masters. I was amazed at me. Although I had a headache like the mother of all hangovers, my mind suddenly was crystal clear. He's got an eye open, Chief. Can you hear me, Mergen? I tried my tongue. Blurted, fluent gibberish. You had another one of your spells. We've been trying to bring you back for two days. Croker sounded put out, like I was inconveniencing him on purpose. All right. You know the drill. Let's get him up and walking. I remember doing this part several times before. I was less confused now, more able to grasp quickly the distinction between past and present. They got my feet under me. Goblin got under my right armpit. Croker wrapped his arm around me from the left, lifted. I said, I remember what to do. They did not understand. Goblin asked, You got a grip on when you are, Mergen? Ain't going to drift off into the past on us again? I nodded. I could communicate that way. Maybe I could use the deaf and dumb speech. Did you gore again? Croker asked. I had the connections all made inside. Even plenty I didn't want made. I tried talking again. Same night. Again. Later on. Set him down. He'll be all right now, Croker said. Mergen, you get any clues this time? Anything we can latch on to to break you out of this cycle? I need you here. I need you full time. Not one damned thing. I paused to catch my breath. I was adapting faster this time. I don't even know when it hit me. I was just there, suddenly like a poltergeist or something, with no thoughts of any future at all. Then after a while I was just... Mergen, with no awareness, no anomalies like I get now. Anomalies? Startled, I turned. One eye had materialized from somewhere. I saw that curtain still stirring. It closed off half the room. Huh? What do you mean by anomalies? When I concentrated, I really didn't know what I meant. I shook my head. I don't know. It's gotten away from me. When am I? Croker and the wizards dealt a hand of significant looks between them. Croker asked, 
Do you remember the Grove of Doom? Sure. I'm still shivering. A chill did touch me. Then I recalled the key thing. I had no memories of having visited this room before, but I should have had them. Because I was still in my yesterdays. I just wasn't as far away as I had been at Dejagore, which was years ago. Then I tried to remember the future. I remembered too much. I whimpered. Do we need to get him up again? Goblin asked. I shook my head. I'm solid. Let's think. How long between this spell and the last one? How long since we got back from the grove? Croker said, You got back three days ago. I told you to bring your prisoners to the palace. You tried. You lost the Shadow Weaver along the way. In circumstances so questionable, I issued orders for all company people to stay especially alert. He was old. He just died of fright. One I said, ain't nothing mysterious about that. My headache was not improving. I had vague recollections of those events, but they were not as clear as my memories of other events immediately before previous seizures. I don't recall much of it. The Red Hand Deceiver got here all right. We meant to start questioning him that night, but you went back to your apartment, supposedly just walked through the doorway and collapsed. Your mother-in-law, uncle, wife, and brother-in-law all agree. Probably the first, last, and only time that will happen. Probably. The old lady is like one eye. She disagrees just to be disagreeable. Aye. Kid. Quiet. Croker told him. So you just fell down and went rigid. Your wife got hysterical. Your brother-in-law came for me. We took you out of there to ease the stress in your family. Ease the stress. Those people never heard of the word. Besides, sorry was the only one of them I considered family. Goblin said, Open your mouth, Mergen. He turned my face to the best light and stared down my throat. No damage in here? I knew what they thought. Epilepsy? I had considered that myself. I had asked about it of anyone who would listen. But no epileptic I ever heard of got bounced into the past from a seizure. Into a past that was never exactly like the past I had lived already. I told you it isn't a disease. Croker growled. When you find the answer, it'll be right there inside your own field, and you'll probably feel stupid about not having seen it earlier. If there's anything to be found, we'll find it. One I promised. Which left me wondering what he had up his sleeve. Then I knew that I had to know already because they were going to tell me pretty soon. But I could not recall that future clearly enough to grasp it. Sometimes it was spooky being me. Was that headless character there again? Croker asked. After figuring out what he meant, I said, yes. But he was faceless, boss. Not headless. He had a head might represent the source of the problem. One I suggested. You ever remember any features, anything at all? Tell somebody. Or get it written down right away. Croker told me, I don't want this to happen to anybody else. Can you imagine managing a campaign when your people can fade out on you any minute for days at a time? I felt confident that that would not happen. But I didn't say so because they would press me on it, and I did not feel like being poked and prodded. I need something for a headache, please. A hangover kind of headache. Did you have this headache the other times? Croker demanded. 
You never mentioned it. It was there, but not this bad. Just a minor discomfort. A four-beer hangover kind of headache. If it was beer brewed by Willow Swan and Cordy Mather, that mean anything? Croker smiled at the reference to the world's second worst beer. Between me and Goblin, we watched you almost every minute since you got back from the Grove of Doom. It seemed likely that this would keep happening. I didn't want us to miss anything. And that keyed a serious question. Since while I am in this time, I can remember the future occasionally, how come I never remember the trips to the past that I'm going to make? And how could they watch me that closely? I never noticed them. And I try to stay alert. You never know when a deceiver might pop out of a shadow swinging his strangling scarf. So what did you get? We didn't see a thing. I am on the job now, though, one eye said, preening. Now that really inspires me with confidence. Everybody's got to be a wise ass anymore. One eye complained. I remember when young people respected their elders. That was in the days when they didn't get a chance to know the old folks very well. I have work to do, Croker said. One eye, stick with Mergen when you can. Keep talking about Dejagore and what's been happening to him. There'll be clues there somewhere. Maybe we don't recognize them yet. If we keep at it, something will pop. He left before I could say anything. Something had passed between Croker and One Eye about and beyond me. And maybe we all had cause to be concerned. This time, I could not remember much about where I was. Things seemed to be new, first time. Yet some shaking, terrified little creature way back in the night warrants of my mind insisted I was still reliving yesterdays, and the worst of those were yet to come. One eye said, I think we'll just take you home now, kid. Your wife will have the cure for what ails you. She might. She was a miracle. Even one eye, who seems incapable of offering respect to anyone, treated her and spoke to and of her as though he considered her an honored lady. She is, of course. But it is nice to have others confirm that. Now that's the first thing you've said that I wanted to hear. Lead on, brother. I didn't know the way. I cast a backward glance at Smoke and the covered deceiver. What in the hell? Chapter 31 My in-laws make very little effort to improve anyone's opinion of Nguyen Bao. Mother Gota, in particular, is a major pain in the ass. The old battle axe barely tolerates even me, and that only because the alternative is to lose her daughter entirely. She is very nasty toward the old man. Still, Sari and I rated enough for Croker to insist we swap quarters when her folk showed up last month, in town slumming from their glamorous swamps. But they won't make it back to paradise if Mother Gota doesn't control her lip in the street. The old man never reacts to her constant complaints. He told me, I've had thirty years of goblin in one eye. One crabby old woman, hurting from gout and arthritis, is nothing. You did say she's only here for a few weeks, didn't you? Right, I did say that. I wondered how those words would taste with soy sauce, or maybe a lot of curry. Now that lady is in the south most of the time, emptying her cornucopia of rage onto the Shadowlands, Croker has had no need for a large apartment. Our old space was little more than a monk cell. There is just room enough for him, lady, when she visits, and a cradle that was given to lady by a man named Ram 
who later died trying to protect her and her baby from Narayan Singh. Ram made that cradle himself. Most likely he died because, like almost every man who spends much time around Lady, he fell for the wrong woman. Croker gave me his apartment all right, but it came with limitations. I could not turn it into the new home of the Nguyen Bao. Sara and Tai De belonged. Mother Gota and Uncle Doge were welcome for visits. And not one freeloading cousin or nephew more. People who accuse the captain of using his position to feather his nest ought to take a close look at the nest. The Liberator. Mr. By golly, military despot of all the Taglians and their many conquests and dependencies, lives just the way he did back when he was only the company physician and analyst. Also, he moved me to provide me adequate workspace. He sets great store by these annals. My books are not coming out so good. I don't always get stuff down the best way. In his time, when he was on the mark, Croker was really good. I can't help comparing my stuff to his. When he tried to be captain and analyst at the same time, his work suffered. And Lady's writing strikes me as too direct, too curt, and sometimes mildly self-indulgent. Neither was honest all the time, and neither considered trying to be consistent with the other with their predecessors, or even with their own earlier selves. If you read either one closely and you spot some of their slips, neither will admit any screw-up. If Croker says that it is 800 miles from Taglios to Shadowcatch and Lady calls it 400, who is correct? Both say they are. Lady says the discrepancy is because they grew up in different places and times where different weights and measures were in use. What about character? They for sure see with different eyes there. You will never catch Croker portraying a willow swan who is not bitching about something. Lady makes swan energetic and rattle-mouthed and a lot more mellow. And the difference could be that both Croker and Lady know Swan's interest in Lady is not brotherly. And consider how they saw smoke. You wouldn't think they were writing about the same animal. They looked at that traitor so differently. Then there is Mogaba and Blade, both black-hearted traitors too. There is nothing in Croker's annals because he was no longer writing when Blade deserted, but in daily life, constantly, he shows you that he hates Blade with a blue-assed passion, on no rational basis. Meantime, he seems almost willing to forgive Mogaba. Lady sees those two the other way around. She would broil Mogaba right in the same pot with Narayan and probably let Blade go. Blade was another case like Ram and Swan. I guess you don't need to agree on everything to be lovers. They wrote differently, too. Croker mostly kept his annals as he went along, then went back later to fill in after he heard from other sources. He tended to fictionalize his secondary viewpoints, too, so his annals are not always absolutely straightforward history. Lady wrote her entire book, after the fact, from memory, while she was laid up waiting to have her baby. Her alternate viewpoint material is mainly second-hand hearsay. I am replacing her more dubious stuff with material I consider more accurate, while I am in the process of putting all the confused stuff into a uniform format. Lady is not always pleased with my efforts, he understated. My major fault is getting trapped in elaborate digressions. I have trouble leaving things out. I spent some time with the official historians in Taglios' royal library, and those guys assured me that the real keys to history are the details. Like 
the entire course of history can veer sharply because one man gets dinged by a random arrow during a minor skirmish. My writing room is 15 feet by 22. That gives me space for all my references, for copies of the old annals, and for a large trestle table where I work on several projects at once. And there is an acre of floor space left for Ty Day and Uncle Doge. While I write and study and revise, he and Ty Day clack away with wooden practice swords or squeal and kick and bounce off the walls. Whenever one of them lands in my space, I toss him back. They are amazingly good at what they do. They ought to be with all that practice. But I think they are more likely to hurt each other than any seriously large person, like our old crew guys. I like this job. It beats the hell out of being standard bearer, though I am stuck with that too, still. The standard bearer is always the first guy into a scrape, and he always has one hand tied up keeping a big-ass pole from falling over. I worry about not catching details the way Croker did. And I envy him his naturally sardonic tone. He claims he did good only because he had the time. In those days, the Black Company was just a raggedy-ass gang sneaking around the edge of things, and there wasn't much going on. Nowadays, we are in the deep shit all the time. I don't like that. Neither does the captain. I cannot imagine a man less pleased about having the power that has fallen into his lap, mostly by default. He keeps it and uses it only because... He doesn't believe anyone else will take the company where he is convinced that it has to go. I managed to get along for several hours without falling down a well into the past. I wasn't feeling badly. Sari was in an excellent mood despite all her mother could do to ruin our day. I was lost in my work, as comfortable with existence as ever I get. Somebody came to the door. Sari showed the captain into the apartment. Uncle Doge and Ty Day continued clacking away. Croker watched for a minute. Unusual, he said. He did not sound impressed. It's not military, I told him. It's fencing for loners. Yuang Bao are big on lone wolf heroes. Not so the old man. His belief that you need brothers to guard your back amounts to a religious conviction. Yuang Bao fencing technique consists of brief but intense flurries of attack and defense separated by inactive periods during which the fighters freeze in odd stances, shifting almost imperceptibly as they try to anticipate one another. Uncle Doge is very good. I'll grant you they're graceful, Mergen. Almost like hutch dancers. By marrying into Sari's clan, I bought into Nguyen Bao fighting styles. No choice, really. Uncle Doge insisted. I am not terribly interested, but I go along to keep the peace, and it is good exercise. It's all stylized, Captain. Every stance and stroke has its name. Which I consider a weakness. Any fighter that set in his ways ought to be easy meat for an innovator. On the other hand, I did see Uncle Doge deal with real enemies at Dejigori. I changed languages. Uncle, will you permit my captain to meet Ashwand? They had taken the measure of one another long enough. Ashwand is Uncle Doge's sword. He calls it his soul. He treats it better than he would any mistress. Uncle Doge disengaged from Tai Day, bowed slightly, departed. In moments he was back with a monster sword. It was three feet long. He drew it carefully, presented it to Croker lying along his left forearm, where the steel would not contact moist or oily skin. He bowed slightly as he did so. 
He wanted us to believe he spoke Notaglian. A vain pretense. I knew him back when he was fluent. Croker knew something about Nguyen Bao customs. He accepted Ashwand with proper care and courtesy, as though deeply honored. Uncle Doge ate that up. Croker grasped the two-hand hilt clumsily. On purpose, I suspect. Uncle Doge darted in to demonstrate the proper grip, the way he does with me during every training session. That old boy is fry. He has ten years on Croker, but moves more easily than I do, and he possesses remarkable patience. Fine balance, the captain said in Taglian. It would not surprise me to learn that he had picked up Nguyen Bao, though. He has an easy way with languages. But this had better be superior steel. Because the blade was thin and narrow. I told him, he says it's four hundred years old and will cut plate armor. I guarantee it cuts people just fine. I saw him use it more than once. During the siege... Croker studied the blade near the sword's hilt. Yes. Hallmark of Din Luk Dok. Eyes suddenly narrow. Usually stolid expression, shoved aside by surprise, Uncle Doge reclaimed his lover quickly. That Croker might know something about Nguyen Bao's swordsmiths apparently troubled him. Croker might not be nearly as stupid as foreigners were supposed to be. Uncle Doge harvested one of his feeble crops of hair, drew it across Ashwan's edge with predictable results. Croker observed, A man could get cut and never know it. It happens, I told him. You wanted something? Sorry brought tea. The old man accepted even though he doesn't like tea. He watched me watch her, amused. Whenever Sarah is in a room, I have trouble paying attention to anything else. She gets more beautiful every time I see her. I cannot believe my luck. I keep being scared that I will wake up. Cold shivers. You have a definite prize there, Mergen. Crocker had told me so before. He approved of Sari. It was her family that troubled him. How come you married the whole caboodle? For that, he shifted to Fossberger. None of the others spoke that northern tongue. You had to be there. Which is really all you can say about Dejigore. The Nguyen Bao and old crew became alloyed by the living nightmare. Mother Goda materialized. All oh, four feet ten inches of bile. She glared at the captain. Aha! The great man himself! Her Taglian is an abomination, but she refuses to believe that. Those who have failed to understand her do so on purpose, to mock her. She circled Croker, walking her bow-legged walk. Nearly as wide as she is tall, without being really fat, ugly, waddling that waddle, she looked like a miniature troll. And her own people call her the troll behind her back. And she has the personality. She could test the patience of a stone. Taide and Sara were very late children. I pray my wife will not come to resemble her mother later, in character or physically. Like her grandmother would be fine, though. Cold in here. Why so hard you push my Sarah's man, ho, oh, Mr. So High and Mighty Liberator? She hawked and spat to one side, the meaning of that no different in Wang Bao than anyone else. She rattled faster and faster. The faster she yacked, the faster she waddled. You think maybe he slave me? Warrior not? No time for grandmother to make of me, him always a way to do for you. She hawked and blank spat again. She was a grandmother, all right. 
but none were mine and none were alive anymore. I didn't remind her. No need attracting her attention. An hour earlier she'd climbed all over me because I was a no-good, bonehead, lackwit layabout who wasted all his time reading and writing. Hardly the sort of thing a grown man does with his time. Nothing ever satisfies Mother Goda. Kroger says that is because she hurts all the time. He pretended he could not fathom her broken taglion. Yes, it really is lovely weather for this time of year. The agricultural specialists tell me we will make two crops this year. Do you think you'll be able to double harvest your rice? Hawk and spit. Then a lapse into ferocious Nguyen Bao, liberally spiced with imaginative epithets. Not all of them native to her birth tongue. Mother Goda hates being humored or ignored more than she hates everything else. Somebody pounded on my door. Sari was busy doing something somewhere that kept her from being close enough to her mother to become embarrassed. I went. I found one eye stinking up the hallway. The little wizard asked, How you doing, kid? Here. He shoved a smelly, ragged, grubby bundle of papers into my hands. The old man here. What kind of sorcerer are you if you don't know the answer to that? A lazy sorcerer. I stepped aside. What's this mess? I lifted the bundle. Them papers you've been after me about. My notes and annals. He ambled over to the captain. I stared down at the mess in my hands. Some of the papers were moldy. Some were water-stained. That was one eye. Four years late. I hoped the little rat did not hang around. He would shed lice and fleas. He takes a bath only if he gets drunk and falls in a canal. And that damned hat. I am going to burn it some day. One eye whispered to the captain. The captain whispered back. Mother Gota tried to eavesdrop. They changed to a language she did not know. She sucked in a bushel of air and went to work. One eye stopped talking and stared at her. This was their first encounter, close up and personal. He grinned. She did not faze him. He was two hundred years old. He had had obnoxious, down to a fine art, generations before Mother Goda was born. He gave her a thumbs up, sidled over to me, grinning like a kid who had stubbed his toe on the pot at the end of the rainbow. In Taglin, he asked, Want to make a formal introduction here, kid? I love her. She's great. Everything I've ever heard. She's perfect. Give us a kiss here, lover. Maybe it was because Mother Goda was the only woman in Taglios shorter than him. That was the only time I ever saw my mother-in-law at a loss for words. Tai Day and Uncle Doge seemed taken aback, too. One eye stalked Mother Goda around the room. Finally, she fled. Perfect. One eye crowed. She's absolutely perfect. The woman of my dreams? Are you ready, Captain? Was he high on something? Yeah. Croker separated himself from his barely tasted tea. Mergen, I want you to come with us. It's time to teach you some new tricks. I started to shake my head. I don't know why. Sorry slipped her arm around me. She was back now, avoiding her mother by being where I was. She felt my reluctance, squeezed my arm. She looked up at me with those gorgeous almond eyes, asking why I was troubled. I don't know. I figured we were going to interrogate the red-hand deceiver. That was not work I would enjoy. 
Uncle Doge astonished me by asking, May I accompany you, husband of my niece? Why? I blurted. I wish to inform my curiosity about what it is you people do. He spoke to me slowly as though to an idiot. I do suffer from a severe birth defect, by his thinking. I was not born Yuang Bao. At least he does not call me Bone Warrior and Stone Soldier anymore. I never did figure that out. I translated for the old man. He didn't bat an eye. Sure, Mergen. Why not? But let's get going before we all die of old age. What the hell? This was the guy who was sure the Nguyen Bao were up to no good. I looked at the mass of paper one eye passed off on me. It smelled of mildew. I would try to make something of it later, if anything could be made of it. Knowing one eye, it could well be written in a language he no longer remembered. Chapter 32 one Eye's annals were as terrible as I expected, and then some. Water, mold, vermin, and criminal neglect had left most of his recollections irretrievable. One recent memoir, though, did survive except for a page in the middle which was just plain missing. It will serve to illustrate what One Eye considers to be an adequate chronicle. He made up the spellings of most of the place names. I corrected to standard where I could, from the maps, figure out where he had been. In the fall of our third year in Taglios, the captain decided to send the Kusavir Regiment to Prebelbed, where the Prabrindra Dra was campaigning against a bevy of minor Shadowlander princes. Me and several company comrades were told to go along to give the new regiment backbone. The traitor blade was in the region. The regiment proceeded through Ranji and Goja, Jaikur and Kantile, then Bakur, Danjil, and other recently captured towns until, after two months, we overtook the prince at Praipurbet. There, half the regiment split off to escort prisoners of war and booty back to the north. The rest of us went west to Asheran, where Blade caught us by surprise, and we had to barricade the gates and throw a lot of the natives off the wall because they might be spies. With my talent, we were able to hold out, even though the green troops were terrified. In Asheron, we found a large store of wine and wound away the hours of the siege. After a few weeks, Blade's men began to desert because of the cold and hunger, and he decided to go away. It was a very cold winter. We suffered a great deal, and often had to threaten the natives to get enough food and firewood. The prince kept us moving mostly far from the heavy fighting, because the regiment was not experienced. In Meldermai, three men and I got drunk and missed marching when the regiment moved out. We had to travel almost a hundred miles, counting only upon ourselves in order to catch up. Once we took four horses from a local lord after we stayed over the night in his manor. We took his brandy, too. The noble complained to the prince, and we had to give the horses back. We spent a week in Forngal. Then the prince ordered us south to Hainangal where we were supposed to join the fourth house in trying to drive Blade's bandits into the Ruderal Canyon. But when we got there, we found only one old woman in the whole territory, and nothing to eat but rotting cabbages, most of which the peasants had buried in the earth before they fled. Then we went up to Silure by way of Balichore, and in the forest there we found a tavern, almost like those in the north, while we were drunk, an enemy witch sent an attack of poisonous toads against us. Next day, we had to walk several miles through swamps and melting snow and cold mud in a low place where warm water runs out of the earth and keeps everything from freezing. 
After a few leagues, we came to the fortress of Trassil, where a regiment recruited from former Shadowlander soldiers were besieging their Trassili cousins. They had been there a long time, so it was difficult to find provisions anywhere nearby, even when we offered to pay. I worked three days in the field hospital there, where, because of the cold, they treated many cases of frostbite. The cold killed more soldiers than did the enemy. From Trassel, we marched up to Melopil, with the prince's own guards, and laid siege to the local king's fortress, which stands on an island in the middle of a lake. The lake was frozen. It was very cold, and the ice was very thick, and every time we tried to go forward against the enemy, their missiles came bouncing over the ice. Shadowlanders were slaughtered with great vigor, along with our men, by engines atop the walls, until the garrison inside got the gates closed. Then the howler came up from Shadowcatch on his flying carpet, and the magics flew around like lightning in a thunderstorm, and we had to run away. Many were captured by the enemy. After two weeks passed, orders came to march to join the siege at Rani Orthol. On the way we found some wine, and that ended in disaster, for the natives stole our packs while we slept. Forces gathered from all over, on both sides, and I began to fear a major battle. That would draw the howler to Rani Orthol. After the city was surrounded, the enemy made several attacks on our breastworks and trenches, which resulted in heavy losses for them. After two weeks, when it was starting to show spring, we launched a surprise attack at night, which carried the outer works right up to the stone wall. The soldiers killed everybody, so angry were they, and so frightened to be fighting at night. When they reached the top of the wall, they threw down everyone, even the women and children. Then the howler came up from Shadow Catch, and with him a small swarm of shadows, and we had to abandon everything we had captured. The howler and shadows went away when the sun rose, and the Pabrindra Dra himself went forward to tell the enemy we were going to attack come evening, and this time no mercy would be shown. But the attack never took place, because the enemy king decided to throw in his lot with Taglios. The city gates were opened, and the town given over to the soldiers for one night, but the men were allowed no weapons except their daggers. The soil in those parts is very poor. The crops are not of a delicate nature. They eat much cabbage and roots, and rye is the common grain. When we were in garrison at Thruthal War for a month, I befriended the landlord's son, a boy of about eleven, and found him intelligent but ignorant of both religion and of reading and writing. His father reported that the Shadow Masters have banned all religious practice and all education throughout their empire, and there were rewards out for books, especially older books, which were burned as soon as they were turned in. And likewise, there were rewards for priests who tried to serve their faith, who were also burned as soon as they were turned in. This rule must have pleased Blade very much. After a month in garrison, orders came for the regiment to return to Jaikur, where a lady was gathering an army for a summer campaign in the east. At Jaikur, I left the regiment and traveled north to Taglios where I was received with great joy by my old companions of the Black Company. The record of that campaign appears to be one eye's most careful and detailed. The remaining fragments suggest stories much less coherent. Chapter 33 the captive red-hand deceiver awaited us in a room guaranteed proof against sorceress espionage. One I swore he had woven the spell so well 
even Lady in her heyday could not have picked through them to eavesdrop. Croker grumbled. What Lady could do back when doesn't concern me. I'm worried about the Shadow Master now. I'm worried about Soul Catcher now. She's lying low, but she is out there, and she does want to know everything about everything. I'm worried about the Howler now. He wants a big bite of the company. That's all right, one I insisted. The Dominator himself couldn't bust in here. What do you want to bet? That's exactly what Smoke thought about his spy-proof room. I shuddered. So did one eye. I had not witnessed Smoke's destruction by the monster that got into his hidden place through a pinhole in his protection, but I had heard. Whatever became of Smoke? I asked. The monster had not killed him. Croker lifted a finger to his lips. Right around the corner. I thought we were going back to the room where Goblin, One-Eye, and the old man wakened me from my last seizure. I just assumed they had the red hand strangler there behind the curtain. Not so. We arrived at what seemed to be a different place entirely, and the deceiver was not alone. The Radisha Dra, sister of the ruling prince, the Prabrindra Dra, leaned against the wall and stared at the prisoner in a way that suggested she enjoyed a conviction that the liberator was soft on villains. Small and dark and wrinkled, like most Taglian women who make it past thirty, she was one hard woman, and too bright besides. They say the only time she ever lost her composure was the night Lady killed all the senior members of Taglios's various priesthoods, ending religious resistance to her participation in the war effort as a key player. There has been a lot less intrigue since that demonstration. Our allies and employers now seem inclined to leave our destruction to us. If you polled the Taglian nobilities and priesthoods, you would find that most of the upper classes believe the Radisha makes the princely decisions, which is near the truth. Her brother is stronger than is commonly supposed, but he prefers to be off-soldiering. Behind the Radisha stood a table. Upon the table lay a man. Smoke? I asked. My question was answered. Smoke was still alive, and still in a coma. He had all the muscle tone of a bowl of lard. Behind him was the other side of the curtain, identical to the one I saw when I awakened. Then this was the same room, approached from a different direction. Strange. Smoke. Croker agreed, and I realized I was being made privy to a major secret. But this character said anything interesting. Croker asked the Radisha, cutting me off. She must have been amusing herself with the prisoner. And there must be some reason the captain did not want her paying too much attention to smoke. No, but he will. The strangler faked a sneer. A brave man, but a fool. He, of all people, would know what torture could do. Once again, I got that spine chill. I know. Let's do it, One-Eye. Mergen kept us waiting long enough. The annals. He held it off just so I could get it into the annals. He did not have to bother. I am not a big torture enthusiast. One eye started humming. He patted the prisoner's cheek. 
You're going to have to help me out here, sweetheart. I'll be as kind as you let me. What's this thing you stranglers got going here in Taglios? One eye looked to the captain. When's Goblin coming back, chief? Get on with it. One eye did something. The strangler spasmed against his bonds. His scream, not much more than a breathless squeak. One eye said, But I found him the perfect woman, boss. Ain't that right, kid? He leered evilly, bent over the deceiver. That brown raisin of a man wore nothing but a filthy loincloth. So that was why One Eye was so excited about Mother Gota. He wanted to use her as a practical joke on Goblin. I should have been angry. I guess maybe for Sara's sake, but I could work up no indignation. That woman begged for abuse. One Eye crooned. You understand your position here, sweetheart? You were with Narayan Singh when we caught you. You have the red hand. Those things tell me. You're one of those very special deceivers that the captain really wants. He indicated Croker. The word for captain he used was Jamadar, which has strong religious connotations to the deceivers. Lady got taken in by them, but she fixed them by marking their top men permanently with the red hand. That made them stand out in the crowd these days. One eye sucked spit between the stumps of his teeth. Somebody who did not know him might have believed he was thinking. He said, But I'm a swell guy who hates to see people hurting. So I'm going to give you a chance not to end up like this cockroach over here. He jerked a thumb at smoke. Fire crackled between the fingers of his other hand. The strangler screamed the kind of scream that rips your nerves out raw and salts their ends. You can make this last forever, or you can get it over quick. All up to you. Talk to me about what the deceivers are up to here in Taglios. He leaned closer, whispered. I can even fix it so you can get away. The prisoner gaped for a moment. Sweat ran into his eyes, stung him. He tried to shake it away. I bet that she'd think that Goblin is just as cute as a bug. One I said. What do you think, kid? I think you'd better get on with it. Croker snapped. He was not happy dealing in torture and had no patience left for the games Goblin and One Eye play with one another. I'll oh, keep your damn pants on, Chief. This guy ain't going nowhere. But his friends are up to something. I glanced at Uncle Doge to see what he thought of the bickering. His face was stone. Maybe he didn't understand Taglin anymore. One eye barked. You don't like the way I do my job? Fire me and do it yourself. He prodded the prisoner. The deceiver tensed in anticipation. You! What's up here in Taglios? Where are Narayan and the Daughter of Night? Help me out here. I tensed up myself. I felt a big chill. What was it? The prisoner gulped air. Sweat covered his entire body. He could not win. If he knew anything and talked, as he must eventually, his own kind would show him no mercy later. Sufficient unto the day the evil thereof. Croker told him, sensing his thoughts. My sympathies all lay with the old man. Even if he ever does get his daughter back, 
he won't find what he is looking for. She has been a deceiver from the day she was born, raised to be the daughter of night, who will bring on Kina's year of the skulls. How? They consecrated her to Kina while she was still in the womb. She would be what they wanted her to be, and that would be a darkness to break her parents' hearts. Talk to me, sweetheart. Tell me what I need to know. One I tried to keep it one-on-one, -on -one, just him and his client. He gave the strangler a moment to reflect. The rest of us watched without expression, maybe a thimble full of pity among us. This was a black rummel man. In strangler terms, generally, that meant he was guilty of more than thirty murders without remorse. Unless he strangled a black rummel man and thus gained a claim by the most direct route. Kina is the ultimate deceiver. She enjoys betraying her own on occasion. An argument one I did not think to present to our pet deceiver. The strangler screamed again, tried to gurgle something. You'll have to speak up, one I told him. I can't tell you. I don't know where they are. I believed him. Narayan Singh was not staying alive by announcing his itineraries in a world where everybody really is out to get him. Petty. So just tell us why we have deceivers here in Taglios after all this time. I wondered why he kept going back to that. The Stranglers had not dared to operate in the city for years. One Eye and the old man must know something. But how? The prisoner screamed. The Radisha observed. The ones we catch are always ignorant. Don't matter, Croker said. I know exactly where Singh is. Or at least where he'll be when he stops running. As long as he doesn't realize that, I know he'll always be right where I want him. Uncle Doge's eyebrow twitched. Must be getting exciting for him. The Radisha glared, frowned, stared. She liked to believe that hers was the only working brain in the palace. Us black company types are just supposed to be hired muscle. You could almost hear the creaks and groans as her mind turned over. How could Croker know something like that? Where is he? Right now, he's busting his butt trying to join up with Mogaba. Since we can't stop him, because he's moving as fast as any message we could send after him, let's forget him. I considered offering a word of suggestion about crows. Croker talks to crows. And crows fly faster than even a deceiver can run. I was not paid to think, and I was not there to talk. Forget him! The Radisha seemed startled. Just for the moment. Let's find out what his cronies are up to here. One eye resumed work. I glanced at Uncle Doge, who had stayed out of the way and quite longer than I had thought possible. He noticed my glance. In Yuang Bao, he asked, May I question the man? Why? I would test his belief. You don't speak Taglian well enough. Little dig there. Then translate. Just for fun, or maybe to nudge Uncle Doge, Croker said, I don't mind if he does, Mergen. He can't do any damage. 
His remark demonstrated clearly his familiarity with Nguyen Bao dialect. There had to be a message in that, meant for Uncle Doge, particularly when taken with his earlier observation about Ash Wan's provenance. What the hell? I was confused, and getting more than a little paranoid myself. Had I come back to my own world after my most recent seizure? In Taglian, as passable as I recalled him having, Uncle Doge shot quick, amiable questions at the deceiver. They were questions of the sort most people answer without thought. We learned that the man had a family, but his wife had died in childbirth. Then he realized he was being manipulated and controlled his tongue. Uncle Doge stamped around like a merry troll, chattering, and winkled out much of the prisoner's past, but not once did he get any closer to the facts of any new strangler interest in Taglios, the city. Croker, I noticed, paid more attention to Uncle Doge than he did the prisoner. The captain, of course, lives in the eye of a tornado of paranoia. Croker leaned close to me. In a midnight whisper, he said, You stay when the others leave. He did not tell me why. He went on to say something to one eye in a tongue even I did not understand. He spoke at least twenty languages. He had been with the company so long. One eye probably spoke a bunch more, but shared them with nobody but Goblin. One eye nodded and continued about his business. Pretty soon, the runt wizard began edging Uncle Doge and the Radisha toward the door. He did it so gently and smoothly that they never complained. Uncle Doge was a guest to begin with, and the Radisha did have pressing business elsewhere, and one eye went about it so unlike his usual abrasive self that he had them thinking it was their own idea. In any event, they left. Croker went with them, which helped, but he was back in five minutes. I told him, Now I've seen everything. There are no wonders left. I can get out of this chicken outfit and go ahead with my plan to start a turnip ranch, which was only halfway a jest. Whenever the company stops moving, guys begin developing plans. Human nature, I guess. The turnip is unknown here, but I have seen vast tracts of land perfect for cultivating turnips, parsnips, and sugar beets. And Otto and Hagop are not far away, so seed should be available soon. Maybe they will even bring some potatoes. Croker grinned, told One Eye, This weasel isn't going to tell us anything we can use. You know what it is, Chief? I'll bet you. He's stalling. He's got something he's trying to hold on to just a little while longer. That's what goes through his head every time I hurt him. He thinks he will endure it just one more time, and then just one more time. Let him get thirsty for a while. Croker shoved the deceiver's chair over against the wall, tossed a piece of ragged linen over him as though he was discarded furniture. Morgan, listen up. Time is getting tight. Things are going to start happening. I need you in the first rank, healed or not. I don't like the sound of that. He didn't feel like joking. We've discovered some interesting things about smoke. Suddenly, he was speaking the Jewel Cities dialect, unknown outside the company here, unless Mogaba was lurking around. We stalled because of your lapses, and what they might signify, but we have to move on. It's time to take chances. There are some new tricks you need to learn, old dog. You trying to scare me? No. This is important. Pay attention. I don't have time to work smoke anymore. Neither does one eye. 
The arsenal is eating up all his time. And I don't trust anybody else but you to help with this. Ha, you're going too fast for me. Pay attention. And by that, I mean keep your ears and eyes open and your mouth shut. We may not get much time. The Radishak could decide to come back and torment the deceiver again. She likes that sort of thing. He told One Eye, Remind me to see if we can't get Cordy Mather assigned here permanently. She doesn't get underfoot when he's around. He's supposed to be back in town soon, if he's not here already. That there is my intelligence, Chief, Croker told me, pointing at one eye and shaking his head. Blind in one eye and can't see out the other. I glanced at the cloth-covered villain. He had begun snoring. A good soldier seizing his rest when it was available. Chapter 34 Hours passed. Croker left, then returned. Now he slapped me on the back. See how easy it is, Mergen? Ever seen such a big trick that was this simple? Nothing to it, I agreed. Like falling off a log. Or like falling into a bottomless pit, maybe. Which I have had enough involuntary practice doing. Nothing is ever as simple as somebody tells you it is going to be. I knew this would be no exception when I tried it myself, amazing as it was. At least now I understand how you got so damned spooky, knowing things you shouldn't. Croker laughed. Go ahead. Showing off his astonishing discovery had put him into a grand mood. Try it. I gave him a look he chose to interpret as my not really understanding what he meant. Nothing to it, like falling off a log. Maybe. Only one eye is not a very good teacher. Do what one eye showed you. Decide what you want to see. Tell smoke, but be damned careful how you do that. You have to be precise. Precision is everything. Ambiguity is deadly. That's the way the magic goes in every story I ever heard, Captain. The ambiguity screw you every time. You think so? You might be right. I must have touched a nerve. He became thoughtful suddenly. Go ahead. I was reluctant. This whole thing is too much like what keeps happening to me when I fall down the rabbit hole to Dejigore. Could Smoke be doing that to me somehow? Croker shook his head. No way. It's not the same. Go ahead, I insist. You're wasting time. Go look at something you always wanted to know about for the annals. We'll be right here to cover you. How about I go look for Otto and Hagop? I know where they are. They just passed the first cataract. They'll be here in a few days. Try something else. Hagop and Otto had spent the last three years traveling back north with a Taglian delegation and letters from Lady to those she had left behind. Their mission was to learn anything possibly known there about the Shadow Master Long Shadow. One of the dead Shadow Masters, Storm Shadow, had turned out to be a refugee from Lady's old empire, Stormbringer, previously thought dead, and two other big and nasty sorcerers, long believed perished, also have turned up and remain burrs under our saddles. The Howler and Lady's mad sister, Soul Catcher. And there was Shapeshifter too, but we took care of him. That Otto and Hagop managed to survive so incredible a journey was to me a major miracle. But Otto and Hagop are blessed. I expect they'll have whole new collections of scars to talk about. Croker nodded. He seemed a little grim now, a little anxious. Time to get on with my training. 
An unexplained tragedy of the past caught my imagination. There had been some grotesque, horrible, senseless killings in a village called Bond that never got connected with anyone or anything to my recollection. I was sure they had to be important somehow and was baffled that, even today, the slaughter remained unsolved and unresolved. I gripped Smoke's hand, blanked my mind, spoke careful instructions in a whisper, and away I went, out of my body, so suddenly I almost panicked. For a moment I thought I recalled doing all this before, but I could not remember what was going to happen. The old man was right. This was not the same as my unwanted plunges into my own past. In this nightmare, I was aware and in control. I was a disembodied vision racing toward Bond, but my mission remained clear in my mind. That was a big distinction. When I floated over Dejigore, I lacked identity and control till I merged with myself of the past. Then I forgot the future. Bond is a hamlet on the south bank of the River Main, facing the Vedna Bota Ford. For centuries the Main has been the traditional boundary of the Taglian heartland. The peoples who live below the river share the languages and religions of Taglios, but are considered only tributary cousins by the Taglians themselves. The non-agrarian part of Bond's economy revolved around a small remount station for the military courier post. A minimal garrison of Shadar cavalrymen managed the station and kept watch on forward traffic. Bond was the kind of duty soldiers dream about. There were no officers and very little work. The river was low enough to ford only about three months a year. But the garrison got paid all year round. Smokes's soul slipped back to that long-ago disaster. I stayed with him, carrying a load of fear despite all of Croker's reassurances. It was very dark that night in that bond gone by. Horror stalked out of the night, and those nightmares where men are more often prey than predator. A monster padded through the hamlet, headed toward the army stable. I watched from a place where I could offer no warning. One solitary soldier had the watch. He was nodding. Neither he nor the horses sensed their danger. The latch rose inside the stable door. No animal mind knew enough to pull a string. The soldier started awake just in time to see a dark shape with scarlet eyes hurtling toward him. The monster fed, then padded into the night. It killed again. Screams wakened the garrison. The soldiers seized their arms. The monster, like an oversized black panther, loped to the river, swam to the northern shore. I knew something now. The killer was a shapeshifter. The acolyte of the sorcerer shapeshifter whom we had destroyed the night we captured Dejagore. She got away, trapped in the animal shape. Why just this one incident in more than four years? I wanted to follow the panther, to discover what had become of it, but Smoke could not be coaxed to go. The comatose wizard had no will or ego I could detect, but apparently he did have limits or constraints. Funny, though. I felt no real emotion until I returned to the reality of the palace. Then it hit me in a wave, hard, leaving me breathless. I asked, Is whatever I see out there true? We haven't seen any evidence otherwise. Croker's caution meant he had reservations. Always suspicious, our captain. You look bad. You see something nasty? Very. One eye was gone, and the strangler had fouled himself. 
I wrinkled my nose. I can use smoke to look anywhere. Almost. Some places he can't or won't go, and he can't go back to any time before he went into the coma. You can catch the annals up now, eyewitness style, if you will. But always remember to be careful about pointing him right. Wow. The implications had begun to sink in. This is worth more than a veteran legion. Now I knew how we had pulled off some really startling coups lately. If you can perch on your enemy's shoulder, nothing is going to go his way. It's worth a lot more. And that's why you're going to keep your mouth shut, even around your dearly beloved. Does the Radisha know? No. You, me, and one eye may be goblin, if one eye just had to share it with somebody. And that's the limit. One I found it by accident when he was trying to pull smoke out of his coma. Smoke has been to overlook. He's walked around inside. He's actually met Long Shadow. We wanted to ask him some questions. We decided they could wait. You don't tell anybody. Understand? There you go, being suspicious of my in-laws again. I'd cut your throat. I get the message, boss. Don't brag it up to my deceiver drinking buddies. Shit. This could win us the war. It won't hurt. As long as it's secret. I have business with the Radisha. Practice using him. Don't worry about working him too hard. You can't. He squeezed my shoulder, left the room with a stride that seemed both determined and fatalistic. Must be facing another budgetary conference. Depending on whether you were the Liberator or the Radisha, the military either never had enough or always wanted too much. So, there was just me and one halfway-dead wizard and one stinky strangler under a linen rag. I considered using smoke to find out what Stinky's buddies were up to in Taglios, but reasoned that the captain would not have had him interrogated if smoke had been able to provide useful answers. Maybe you not only had to be precise in your instructions, you had to have some idea what you were seeking. You could not find your own elbow, if you could not guess what directions to give to get you there. The point, old smoke was a miracle, but he had major limitations, and most of those would exist right inside our own heads. We would become the beneficiaries or victims of our own imaginations. What should I go see then? I was excited now. I was up for an adventure. So what the hell? Why not go straight for the biggie? How about taking a peek at the Shadow Master himself? Long Shadow. Number one boy on the Black Company shit list. Chapter 35 Long Shadow could have pranced right out of my fantasies. He was a deadly freak. He was tall and thin and twitchy, given to flights of rage and subject to sudden spells resembling malarial shakes. He wore a sort of loose, black, floor-length chemise that concealed a deathly gauntness. He ate infrequently and then only picked. He could have been a famine victim. Threads of silver and gold and glistening black, embroidered or woven into his robe, protected him with dozens of static sorceries. At first blush, he seemed a hundred times more paranoid than Croker. But he did have reason. There was just a whole world full of folks who wanted to roast his skinny ass, 
and he had no friends closer than Mogaba and Blade. The Howler was not a friend. He was an ally. One of Long Shadow's obsessions was the Black Company. I did not understand. The kind of enemies we were should not have troubled him at all. We were no world killers. His face, which he kept masked, except when he was alone, was skull-like. His waxy, pallid features were frozen in a permanent expression of fear. There was no guessing his birth race. His eyes were a washed-out gray, with splotches of pink around the edges. But I don't think he was an albino. I exploited Smokes' ability, fluttered about through time to find out all the interesting stuff fast. I did not catch Long Shadow completely out of costume once. The man did not bathe. He did not change clothing. He wore gloves all the time. The last of the four Shadow Masters, now THE Shadow Master. He was the unquestioned tyrant of the city Shadowcatch, and a demigod within his fortress overlook. His slightest whim could set a hundred terrors and ten thousand men scrambling to appease him. And still, he was a prisoner doing life without hope of parole. Overlook is, but for one, the southernmost work of man. I tried pushing past that fortress. Somewhere in the mists beyond Overlook is Katovar, toward which we have marched for years. Just a glimpse would be marvelous. Smoke refused to go any farther south. Smoke had been crazy about Katovar while he was still healthy. Katovar was the reason he deserted the Radishah and Prabhindradra years ago. His fear of Katovar must have impressed itself upon his very flesh and soul. Long Shadow's fortress was gargantuan. Overlook dwarfed every human construction I have ever seen, including the lady's monstrous tower at Charm. Already two decades in the building, Overlook's construction had become the main industry of Shadowcatch. The city that was called Kialune, before the coming of the Shadow Masters. Kialune meant Shadow Gate in the local dialect. The builders worked day and night. They knew no holidays. Long Shadow was determined that his fortress be complete before his enemies overtook him. If he won that race, he believed he would become master of the world. No power of heaven or hell or earth ought to be able to reach him inside a finished overlook. Not even the darkness that brushed him every night with its terror. Overlook's outer walls reared a hundred or more feet high. Where are you going to find a ladder that tall? Brass and silver and gold characters shone on the steel plates that sheathed the rude stone of the wall face. Battalions of workmen did nothing but keep those runes polished and gleaming. I could not read them, but I knew they anchored massive defensive spells. Long shadow spell work overlaid everything that was part of Overlook, layer upon layer. If he was allowed enough time, every exterior surface of the fortress would be hidden beneath and behind impenetrable tangles of sorceries. Once the sun went down, Overlook became a conflagration of light. Bright crystal chambers topped every tower, making the place seem a fortress of lighthouses. The crystal domes were places whence Long Shadow could observe safe from his terrors. The overpowering lights left no places for shadows to hide. He feared that which he mastered far more than anything else in the world. Even the Black Company, for him, was a buzzing mosquito of a nuisance. Even unfinished overlook daunted me thoroughly. 
What sort of hubris-driven madmen were we to chart a course that must run through and beyond that stronghold? But Long Shadow had enemies not as easily daunted as I. For some of those, no earthly fortress, nor even time itself, meant much. They would devour him, now or later. The moment his guard fell. He had chosen to play for the ultimate stakes in a game where the risks were as grim as the potential winnings were great. It was too late to get out. He would be victor or victim. Long Shadow lived inside the crystal chamber that topped Overlook's tallest central tower. He slept seldom for fear of the night. He spent hours and hours just staring southward at a plain of glittering stone. A screech ripped the air over the grim city. The people of Shadowcatch ignored it. If they thought about their master's strange ally at all, it was probably to hope that a fate would catch up and rob Long Shadow of this potent weapon. The inhabitants of Kialune were a broken people, spiritless, without hope, worse even than the Jaikuri at their lowest ebb during the siege of the Jagore. Almost all of them were too young to recall a time when there was not a shadow master there exercising more power over their lives than had their lost gods. Even Long Shadow could not extirpate rumor. Even at the heart of his empire, some people had to travel, and travelers always carry tales. Some stories are even true. The people of Shadowcatch knew that a doom from the north was coming. The name of the Black Company lay at the heart of every rumor. That made no one happy. Long Shadow was the very devil, but many of his people feared his fall would be but the precursor to a far bleaker season. Man, woman, and child, the people of Shadow Catch were privy to the one true secret of the universe. There is always a darker shadow lurking beyond the one whose face you can see. Long Shadow reached out and inflicted pain and fear because he himself was the victim of a thousand terrors. It was ugly out there. So ugly, I wanted to go back somewhere where it was warm and there was someone to hold me and tell me that the dark was not always the lurking place of terror. I wanted my sorry, my light in the night that rules the world. Smoke. Take me home. Chapter 36 Croker did warn me. Be precise, he said. He warned me several times, in fact. I was ripped this way and dragged that, to and through the place of blood and burning, papers browning, blackening, curling in such slow motion. Blood pooled deep where I lay in my own vomit. The slap of running feet was like the slow, booming footfalls of giants. I heard screams that had no end. Croker warned me. I was thoughtless. What he did not tell me, or maybe did not understand, was that the concept home could, in one man's mind, become defined by emotional pain. Torn. Shredded. Smoke took me to Taglios only for that minute in the real now that is like the end of all time. I reeled and flung away from there with such revulsion that I threw myself and the hateful shreds and the disoriented smoke all the way to hell. He had no will and no identity, so he could not and did not laugh as I floated down into the lake of pain. Hell has a name, 
Its name is Dejagore. But Dejagore is only hell's lesser face. From the greater hell I escaped. One more time. No identity and no will. The wind blows, but nothing moves in the place of glittering stone. Night falls. The wind dies. The plain yields up its heat as shadows waken. Moonlight settles upon the silence of stone. The plain runs east and west, north and south, without discernible bounds, viewed from within. Though its ends be uncertain, it had a definite center. That is, an epic structure built of the same stone as the pillars and plain. Within that fastness, nothing moves either, though at times mists of light shimmer as they leak over from beyond the gates of dream. Shadows linger in corners, and way down inside the core of the place, in the feeblest throb of the heart of darkness. There is life of a sort. Chapter 37 No will, no identity. Now, no smoke. Now, just pain. So much smoke drifted away. Now just slavery to the memories. Now at home in the house of pain. Chapter 38 There you are. So here we are again. You were missed. Faceless thing that nevertheless seems to be smiling, pleased with itself. It has been a night full of adventures, has it not? And the fun continues. Look there! The Black Company and their auxiliaries have begun making life especially unpleasant for Shadowlanders, so bold as to have taken up residence inside Dejigore's wall. See how they use the doppelgangers and imaginary soldiers to lure the Southerners into deadly traps, to get them to betray themselves? Oh, and come back to the wall. This is a small thing, but it could become the stuff of epics. The fighting has all shifted to the east side of the city. Hardly anybody is over there now. A few men to watch from the ramparts is all. And some unenthusiastic Shadowlander scouts down there in the darkness, not really paying attention. Otherwise, how could they miss this spidery little figure rappelling down the outside of the wall? Why on earth would a 200-year-old fourth-rate sorcerer want to climb down a rope to go where very unfriendly little brown men might decide to dance on his head? The wounded stallion of mysterious sorceress breed has stopped screaming. At last, it's dead. Green, misty stuff still rises from its death wound. The wound still glows at its edges. Out there, yes, look at them. Two very devils they are, aren't they? Cloaked in their pink mists. They don't seem to be coming to devour the city, though, do they? What is that? The Shadowlanders out there are scattering like the foxes in the henhouse. Their cries are filled with pure terror. Amongst them something dark moves swiftly. Look. It pulled a man down there, didn't it? There is so little light now that the focus of battle has shifted. The old man is as black as the heart of the night itself. Think any mortal eye will notice him sneaking around among the dead? Where is he headed? Shadow Spinner's dead horse? Who would expect that? It's the act of a madman. The creeping darkness is moving toward the dead horse, too. See how its eyes flash red when the fires in the city flare up? Look at that fool running toward it instead of away. There go his guts. 
stupidity can be fatal. The little black man has vanished because he has stopped moving. There he is. He heard something. There he goes, trotting toward the dead stallion. He wants his spear back. And maybe that does make some crazy sense. He worked hard making it. He has stopped again, eye huge as he sniffs the night and catches an almost forgotten odor. At the same moment, the deadly darkness catches wind of him. A panther in roar of triumph stills hearts all across the plain. The darkness begins moving faster and faster. The little black man grabs his spear and runs for the wall. Will he make it? Can two stubby ancient legs carry him there fast enough to escape the death racing toward him? The thing is huge, and it is filled with joy. The little man reaches the rope, but he is still eighty feet down from safety, and he is hauled and winded. He whirls. His timing is perfect. The head of his spear reaches out just as the monster leaps. The beast twists in the air, evading the killing thrust, but taking a cruel wound from its snout back through its left ear. It howls. Green mist boils off its red glowing wound. The beast loses all interest in the old man, who begins his long climb to the ramparts. That bizarrely carved spear is slung across his back now, held there by a mundane length of cotton string. No one notices. No one cares. The fighting has gone elsewhere. Chapter 39 The Southerners seem to have just closed their eyes and shoved their heads into a beehive, don't they? What? Why so reluctant? Come see, this is amusing. Everywhere you look, the Southerners are falling back. Sometimes they're running, sometimes just slinking away through the shadows before death overhauls them. Look there. Shadow Spinner, the king enemy himself, all but crippled paying no attention to anyone or anything but those two pink-limbed archetypes come out of the hills to devour him. And Mogaba. Watch him be the master tactician. Watch him be the ultimate warrior, exploiting the enemy's every weakness. Now that there is no chance to accomplish the devil tree that moved him earlier in the evening. See that? No southerner, however great his reputation, dares come near Mogaba. Even their great heroes are like novice children when he steps forward himself. He is way bigger than life, this Mogaba. He is the triumphant centerpiece of his own imagined saga. Something has gone out of the southerners. They wanted to conquer... They knew they had to conquer because their master shadow spinner would not tolerate anything less. He has a particular lack of understanding when it comes to failure. His followers are established solidly inside the city. Mild stubbornness will give them success. But they're on the run. Something has grabbed hold of them and convinced them that it is not possible for even their souls to survive if they stay Inside Dejigore. Chapter 40 You all right, Mergen? I shook my head. I felt like a kid who had spun around about twenty times, intentionally trying to make himself dizzy before jumping into some silly competition. I was in an alley. Runt Boy Goblin was beside me, looking extremely concerned. I'm fine, I told him. Then I fell to my knees, stuck my hands out to grab the alley walls so I would not spin around anymore. I insisted, I'm all right. Of course you are. 
Candles. Keep an eye on this dork. He tries to take over. Get deaf. He's got too tender a heart. I tried not to let my ego become engaged. Maybe I was too tender, too much of a sucker. The world sure isn't kind to the man who tries to be gentle and thoughtful. Its spin slowed down till I no longer had to hold on. A scuffle broke out behind us. Someone cursed in a nasal liquid tongue. Somebody else growled. This asshole is fast. Whoa, 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 I yelled. Let the man alone. Let him come up here. Candles didn't knock me over the head or contradict me. The short, wide Nguyen Bao guy, who had shown me to key Dom's hideout, marched up to me. The fingers of his right hand rubbed his right cheek. He seemed utterly astonished that somebody had laid a hand on him. His ego suffered again when he spoke in Nguyen Bao, and I said, Sorry, old timer. No speaky. Gonna got to be Taglian or Grogor with me. In Grogor, which my maternal grandmother spoke because Grandpa captured her from those people, I asked, What's happening? I knew maybe 20 words in Grogor, but that was 20 more than anyone else within 7,000 miles. The speaker sends me to lead you to where the invader is most vulnerable. We have watched closely and know. Thank you. We appreciate it. Lead on. Shifting languages, I observed. Marvelous how these guys suddenly talk the lingo when they want something. Candles grunted. Goblin, who had sneaked forward for a look around, returned just in time to offer me directions to the same weak point the Nguyen Bao had in mind. The squat man seemed a little surprised we could find our butts with our hands, maybe even a touch disgruntled. You got a name short and wide? I asked. If you don't have one you prefer, I guarantee you, these guys will hang one on you and I promise you won't like it. Hear, hear. Goblin agreed, chuckling. I am Doge. All Nguyen Bao call me Uncle Doge. All right, Uncle. You going up there with us? Or did you just come over to direct traffic? Already Goblin was whispering instructions to the guys creeping up behind us. No doubt he had left a few soft spells of sleepiness or confusion amongst the southerners as he was scouting. Little discussion was needed. We would drive into their soft spot kill anything that moved, split them in half, butcher anybody who didn't run away. Then we would back away, before Mogaba began feeling too confident. I will accompany you, although that stretches the speaker's instructions to extremes. You bone warriors surprise us continually. I wish to watch you at your work. I never considered killing people to be my profession, but did not care to argue. You speak Taglian very well, uncle. He smiled. I am forgetful, though, stone soldier. I may not remember a word after tonight. Unless the speaker jogged his memory, I supposed. Uncle Doge did a great deal more than watch us hack and stab southerners. He turned into a one-man cyclone, flailing around with a lightning sword. He was as sudden as the lightning, but as graceful as a dancer. Each time he moved, another Shadowlander fell. Damn, I told Goblin a while later. Remind me not to get into a quarrel with that character. I'll remind you to bring a crossbow and let him have it in the back from thirty feet is what I'll do after I put a deafness and a stupidity spell on him to even things up a little. Don't be surprised if it's me distracting you someday, 
when One-Eye sneaks up and offers you a cactus suppository. Speaking of the runt, tell me, who's being conspicuously absent without leave lately? I sent messages to the various units, suggesting that we had done our part to relieve Mogapa's troops. We should all go back to our part of town, patch ourselves up, take naps, like that. I told the Nguengbao elder, Uncle Doge, please inform the speaker that the Black Company extends its gratitude and friendship. Tell him he is free to call upon that at any time. We will extend ourselves as much as possible. The short, wide man bowed far enough that his movement had to mean something. I bowed back, almost as deeply. That must have been the right move, because he smiled slightly, bowed shallowly for himself, hustled off. Runs like a duck, Candles observed. I'm glad that duck was on our side, though. You can say that again. I'm glad that duck... Ah! Candles had me by the throat. Somebody help me shut him up! That was just the start of what became a wild night of blowing off tensions. I got no chance to participate myself, but I heard it was a banner night for the Jaikuri whores. Chapter 41 Where the hell have you been? I snarled at one eye. The company just fought through its nastiest episode in, oh, just days, and you were obviously absent every stinking second. Not that his presence would have made any difference. One-Eye grinned. My displeasure did not bother him a bit. He had outlived or outstubborned a parade of snot noses like me. Shit, kid. I had to get my Shadow Master sticker back, didn't I? I've got a lot of work in that thing. What's the matter? Huh? For a moment I saw a little black louse scuttling across a gray landscape from a height unattainable anywhere in Dejagore, even atop the citadel, where old crew guys were not welcome anymore. Never mind, Runt. I'd like to kick your ass, but it wouldn't do any good now. So you were out there? What became of Widowmaker and Life Taker? While I was arranging a quieter life for our leader, those two vanished without a trace. I wonder how Mogapa would write all this if he was keeping the annals. One eye. What? Now he sounded irritated. You want to answer me? What happened to Widowmaker and Life Taker? You know something, kid? I don't have the faintest freaking idea. And I don't care. I only had one thing on my mind. I wanted my spear back so I could use it next time that sucker ain't looking. Then I had to worry about dodging a gang of raggedy-ass Shadowlanders who tried to jump me. They went away somewhere, all right? And none of us could fathom that. Because they vanished just when the Shadowlander confidence was rockiest. Shadow Spinner had his tail between his legs, and his boys could have been broken. I grumbled. If that was the old man and lady, they would have kept coming till they broke the whole show wide open, wouldn't they? I glared at an albino crow perched not twenty feet away. Its head was cocked. It stared at me with malign intelligence. There were a lot of crows tonight. Other agendas were being pursued. I was just one pawn, caught up in tides of intrigue. But if we were careful, the company need not get swept away. Mogaba and the Nar and their Taglian troops stayed busy for days. 
Maybe the Shadow Masters decided to make Mogapa pay for his failure to fulfill his end of the implicit bargain. Which was just one more example of the way people down here go bugfuck when they're involved with the Black Company. It could make a guy nervous if he thought about everybody within a thousand miles seeming to wish he'd never been born. My guys enjoyed Mogaba's situation, and he could not squawk about their attitudes. We gave him exactly what he asked. We saved his ass and set him up, so all he had to do was chase a few Shadowlanders out of town. I had to see him almost every day at staff meetings. Again and again, we showed ourselves to the soldiers, pretending to be brothers marching shoulder to shoulder against our evil foe. Not once was anybody fooled, except maybe Mogaba. I never took it personal. I took a stance I believed the analysts of the past would approve. Just picturing Mogaba as not one of us. We are the Black Company. We have no friends. All others are the enemy, or at best, not to be trusted. That relationship with the world does not require hatred or any other emotion. It requires wariness. Perhaps our refusal to remonstrate, or even to acknowledge Mogava's treachery, was the final straw, or perhaps the backbreaker was his awareness that even his NAR compatriots now believed the real captain might still live. Whatever. The ultimate and perfect warrior drifted across a boundary from beyond, which he could not return. And we did not discover the truth until we had paid in treasures of pain. It took ten days for Dejagore to return to normal, if normal was our state before the great attack. Both sides had suffered terribly. I believed Shadow Spinner would now just lick his wounds and let us get hungry for a while. Chapter 42 Got something for you, kid. I started awake. What? What happened? I don't drift off that way. One eye had a big, shit-eating grin on, but it evaporated when he looked at me closer. He darted in, grabbed my chin, turned my head right and left. You just have one of your spells? Spells? You know what I mean. Not exactly. I just had their word for the fact that I went spooky sometimes. You've got a kind of psychic shimmer. Maybe I caught you just in time. He and Goblin kept talking about doing experiments to find out what is happening, but there never seemed to be time to actually do anything. What do you have? The work party is broken to the old catacombs this morning, Longo told me. Everybody's charging around in there all excited. I can imagine. Find any treasure yet? One I looked put upon. For such a black-hearted toad, he can manage a truly impressive show of self-righteous injury. I take it not. We found some books, a whole pile, all sealed up neat and everything. Looks like they've been there since the Shadow Masters first came. Makes sense, since they always burned the books and the priests. You find any priests lurking down there? Not hardly. Look, I gotta get back. Before somebody grabbed the treasure out from under him, no doubt. I got a couple of guys lugging them books up for you. Gods for fend, you should have lifted anything yourself. You got a serious attitude problem, kid. I'm an old man. One eye did a fade. He has that knack when he's about to find himself in an indefensible position. A city seldom is buttoned up so tight that no news gets in from outside. 
Sometimes it seems almost mystical, but the word does come through. In the Jagore, rumor seldom brought in anything Mogaba wanted to hear. I was studying the discovered books, so intrigued I was letting duty slide. They were written in Jaikuri, but the written form thereof is almost identical to written Taglian. Goblin stepped in. You doing all right? No more dizziness? No. You guys worry too much. No, we don't. Look, some new rumors are going around. There's supposedly a relief column headed our way. Blade, of all people, is in charge. Blade? He isn't. He's never run anything bigger than a reduced company. Before we ever got here. Fighting guerrilla style against amateurs. I don't make them up. I just report them. He did do well. So did Willow Swan and Cordy Mather. But that was accident and luck and Shadowlander stupidity more than anything those three actually did. Why on earth is he commanding an army? He's supposedly Lady Second in Command. Not much doubt anymore that she survived. She's also pissed off and putting together a new army. Bet Mogamba's jumping for joy. Running around hollering, we're saved, we're saved. You might say he's jumping. Over the following few days, we heard a thousand wild stories. If a tenth were true, some really bizarre changes were underway out there in the world. You heard the latest? Goblin asked me one night when I took a rare break from the books to examine that outer world from the wall. Lady ain't lady after all. She's the incarnation of some goddess named Kina. A real badass, too, apparently. She would be. Tide. You know Kina, don't you? Tell us about her. Tide wasn't allowed into our warrens, but he always turned up whenever I came up for air. He forgot all three words of Taglian he had admitted to knowing. The name of that goddess scrubbed his brain clean. I said, that's what happens when you mention Kina to any of these people. I can't even get our prisoners to talk about her. You would think she belonged to the Black Company. Must be a real charmer. Bucket opined. Oh, she is, she is. There's one. I meant a shooting star. We were keeping count also of enemy watchfires. The Southerners had scattered in small unit encampments around the plain recently. I guess they were afraid we might sneak away. You know something about her, then? Goblin asked. From those books you guys found. The men were bitter. The books and some sealed jars filled with grain were the only treasures they unearthed. The Guni were the majority religion in Jaikur, and the Guni do not bury their dead. They burn them. The minority Vedna do bury their dead, but do not include any grave goods. Where their dead are bound, they have no need of luggage. In paradise, everything is provided. In hell, too. One was a compilation of Guni myths in variants from all over. The guy who recorded them was a religious scholar. His book wasn't meant to get out where it might confuse ordinary people. I'm confused, and there ain't nothing ordinary about me, Bucket observed. So what's the scoop, Mergen? How come they won't tell us about this bitch? Whoa, did you see that one? It exploded. All right, I told them. The Guni religion is the most common one around here. I think we know that, Mergen, Goblin said, just making the point. Most people down here believe in Kina. Even if they're not Guni, they believe. Here's the story. The Guni have lords of light 
and lords of darkness. They've been doing their lording since the beginning of time. Sounds like standard stuff. It is. Only the value systems are different from what we knew back home. The balance between darkness and light is more dynamic here and isn't weighted the same emotionally as our struggle between good and evil. Moreover, Kina is a sort of self-elevated outside agency of decay and corruption that attacks both darkness and light. She was created by the Lords of Light to help defeat a horde of really nasty demons they couldn't handle any other way. She helped by eating the demons. Naturally, she got fat and apparently wanted dessert because she tried to eat everybody else, too. She was stronger than the gods who created her? Guys, I didn't make this stuff up. Don't ask me to rationalize it. Goblin, you've been everywhere. You ever seen a religion that can't be picked to shreds by any non-believer with brains enough to tie his own bootlaces? Goblin shrugged. You're as cynical as Croker was. Yeah, good for me. Anyway, there's a lot of typically murky mythological stuff about mothers and fathers and vicious, hideous, probably incestuous carryings on among the other gods while Kina kept getting stronger. She was real sneaky. That's one of her attributes. Deceit. But then her main creator, or father, tricked her and put a sleep smell on her. She's still snoring away somewhere, but she can touch our world through her dreams. She's got her worshippers. All Goonie deities do. Big, little, good, bad, indifferent. They all have their temples and priesthoods. I can't find out much about Kina's followers. They're called deceivers. The soldiers won't talk about them. They flat refuse like naming Kina might actually waken her, which, I gather, is the holy mission of her worshippers. Too weird for me, Bucket grumbled. Goblin said, That explains why Lady scares the shit out of everybody whenever she dresses up. If they really think she's turned into this goddess. I figure... We should find out everything we can about this Kina. Crack plan, Mergen. How? If nobody will talk. Yeah. Even the boldest Taglians threatened to get the vapors if I pressed. It was obvious that they were not just terrified of this goddess. They were scared of me, too. One Eye brought heartening news. The stuff about the relief force is gold, boss. Every night now, Spinner is sneaking troops out through the hills like he don't think we can see them go if it's dark. Could he be giving up the siege? The troops are all headed north. Home ain't north. I did not offer another alternative. One Eye would not have come if he was not sure. Of course, one eye being sure never meant that one eye was right. He was one eye. I thanked him, sent him to do a small chore, found Goblin, and asked him what he thought. The little wizard seemed surprised I would bother. Did one eye stutter or something? No, but he's one eye. Goblin could not contain his big frog grin. That made perfect sense to him. Nobody relayed the news to Mogaba. I thought it would go easier for everybody if he didn't know. But Mogaba heard rumors, too. Dejigore was a nightmare town, filled with factions only loosely united in defiance of the besiegers. Mogaba's forces were the strongest. The Jaikuri were most numerous. We old crew, with our auxiliaries, 
were less numerous and less powerful. But boy, were we strong in our righteousness. And then there were the Nguyen Bao. The Nguyen Bao remained an enigma. Chapter 43 Kidam's family occupied the same dismal, filthy, smoky, pungent hole until the deluge drove them out. The perquisites of power did not appeal to the speaker. He had a place to get out of the rain. That was enough. Maybe that was more than he had had back in the swamp. He did share with a troop of descendants who stopped bickering only when the outsider came around. And then the children restrained themselves only for a while. On successive afternoons, Kidam summoned me to consult on trivial matters. We faced each other over tea, served by the beautiful granddaughter, while the children quickly lost their awe of me and resumed brawling. We traded information on friends and enemies. That fevered character in the shadows moaned and groaned. I did not like that. He was dying. But he was taking a long, long time getting it done. Every time he cried out, the beautiful one went to him. I ached in sympathy. She was so haggard. Second visit, I said something to indicate sympathy. One of those things you toss off without much thought. Kidam's wife, whom I now knew to be named Hong Tre, glanced up from her tea, startled. She said three soft words to Kidam. The old man nodded. Thank you for your concern, stone soldier, but it is misplaced. Don welcomed a devil into his soul. Now he pays the due. A burst of rapid liquid Nguyen Bao erupted from the shadows. A squat old woman waddled into the light. She was bow-legged, ugly as a warthog, in a vicious humor. She barked at me. She was Ki Gota, the speaker's daughter and my Shadow Tai Day's mother. She was a dark legend among her own people. I have no idea what she was on about, but I got the feeling that she laid all the ills of the world squarely at my feet. Kidam said something gently. It did not get through. Hong Tre repeated his words more gently in a whisper. Silence fell instantly. Kigota scurried into the shadows. The speaker offered, In all our lives we enjoy successes and failures. My great sorrow is my daughter Gota. She has within her a cancer of agony she cannot conquer. She insists on sharing it with the rest of us. A tiny smile touched his lips. This was self-deprecating humor, meant to inform me that he was speaking metaphorically. Ha! Ah, great failure. The wellspring of heartbreak for all of us was her hasty choice of Sam Dan Q as the husband for her daughter. He indicated the beautiful flower. The flower betrayed a blush as she knelt to refill our cups. There was no doubt that all these people understood Taglian perfectly. Kidam added, That is the one great error that Gotha cannot deny, a culmination of deficiencies that is like a brand. She was widowed young. She arranged the marriage, hoping to enjoy her elder years, luxuriating on the wealth of the Sams. The speaker showed me that little smile again, probably sensing my incredulity. Wealth and Yuang Bao are contradictory concepts. The old man continued. 
Dan was clever. He concealed the fact that he had been disinherited because of his cruelty and wickedness and treachery. Gotha was too much in a hurry to investigate harsh rumours, and Dan's evil only grew worse after the nuptials. But that is enough about me and mine. I asked you here because I wish to keep an eye on the character of the leader of the Bone Warriors. I had to ask, Why do you call us that? Does it mean anything? Kidam traded looks with his wife. I sighed. I get it. It's more of the Black Company claptrap everybody does. You think we're something our predecessors were supposed to have been 400 years ago. Only probably weren't because oral history exaggerates ridiculously. Speaker, listen. The Black Company is just a gang of outcasts. Really. We're plain old mercenary soldiers caught up in circumstances we don't understand and really don't like. We're just passing through. We came this way because our captain has a bug up his ass about the company's history. Most of the rest of us couldn't think of anything else. We wanted to do more. I told him about Silent and Darling and others who had parted with the Brotherhood rather than hazard the long journey south. I promise you, whatever scares everybody, and I wish somebody would tell me what that is, it would have to involve way more work than I'm willing to put into anything. The old man eyed me, glanced at his wife. She said and did nothing, but something passed between them. Kidam nodded. Uncle Doge materialized. The speaker told me, Perhaps we misjudge you. Even I allow prejudice to guide me at times. There is a chance I will know better when next we speak. Uncle Doge made a small gesture. Time for me to leave. Chapter 44 Goblin caught me hitting the Jaikuri books. Mergen! I started. Huh? About goddamn time. What? What are you talking about? I've been standing here watching you for ten minutes. You never turned a page. You never blinked an eye. I couldn't tell if you was breathing. I started to make an excuse. Won't sell. I had to yell four times and slap you on the back of the head to get your attention. So I was thinking. Only I could not recall even one thought. Yeah, right. Mogaba wants your scrawny ass over to the Citadel. A lot of Southerners have sneaked off to meet this relief column. I told Mogaba. At first, I thought they were trying to trick us, pull back and hit us when we tried to take advantage. But Goblin and One Eye promised me they've just kept going. There can't be a relief army, though. Where would the soldiers come from? Who would lead them? Would Mogaba believe that I had not heard the more interesting rumors? He heard more than I did and Croker survival probably figured in a lot of those. What would he do if the old man turned up alive? I was pretty sure Mogaba thought about that a lot. I was thanked and told to return to my people with no other comment. I did not find out why he sent for me. Mogaba did just what I feared. He launched a recon in force, maybe trying to find new weak spots. He employed only his own most trustworthy men. And I was content to sit atop my part of the wall watching and wondering why Mogaba was so sure we would desert if we got outside. I tend to ignore Mogaba here. 
He was a much greater part of everyday life than I show. He was misery on the hoof. My dislike makes it impossible to write about the man rationally, so I discuss him only when I must. Of all the Nar in those days, only Sindawe ever made the effort to be civil. Anyway, Mogaba thought he had a chance to hurt the Shadow Master, but the planners outside were getting the hang of how his head worked. He did not let a lack of success discourage him. There was that about Mogaba. He never became discouraged. No setback ever shook his conviction that he was invincible. If his plans fizzled, he just recalculated. Mogaba's soldiers began to desert without benefit of escape from the city, coming to hide out with friends among Artaglians. They complained that Mogaba was too profligate with soldiers' lives. Mogaba responded by ordering special rations and preferential access to prostitutes for his most dedicated men. We found those sealed jars of grain left over from the Shadow Master's first siege. Whether to share generated considerable debate. One I insisted that Mogaba would not be satisfied just to share. He would want to know all about our find. He would want to see for himself. Did we want him wandering around our warrens? No. So what does the little shit do? He turns right around and starts selling fresh-baked bread for twenty times what a loaf cost before the siege. I found a nice quiet spot for just one eye and me, atop the wall on a lazy afternoon. There were fresh rumors of a battle up north, but that was not our topic. I asked, What did you tell me about why we shouldn't let Mogaba share the stores we found? Huh? This was not the hassle he expected. You were extremely persuasive. All that stuff about not letting the man get into our hideout. He grinned, proud of himself. So? You stand by what you said? Sure. Then what the fuck are you doing selling his men bread when we're not supposed to have no grain to grind for flour? He frowned. The connection eluded him. Making a profit? You really figure Mogaba is so stupid he won't notice that bread? You really figure he won't ask questions? You got too rigid a way of looking at things, kid. You keep up your crap. You're really going to think rigid. You get me killed? I'm going to haunt your ass forever. You probably would. There's times I think you're halfway a haunt already. What's that supposed to mean? The spells you have. When you have them, it's like there's somebody else looking out from behind your eyes. It's like there's some other soul swirling around you. I never noticed. Would I notice? If we had us a skilled necromancer or a spirit talker, we might be surprised what we found. You wasn't born twins, was you? His stare was fierce. A chill stalked my spine. The hairs on my neck stirred. I did feel spooky sometimes, but he was just trying to change the subject. Goblin joined us uninvited. There's something going on with the Shadowlanders, Mergen. A crow nearby made a sound like laughter. I asked, They aren't setting up for another big attack. I thought Mogaba screwed their main ramp. I couldn't get close enough to catch any details. Mogaba is staying out where people can see him. But I think there was a battle. And I think Shadow Spinner's creeps got whipped. We may have friends out there, ready to bust us out. 
Calm down, don't start packing your gear. One Eye snickered. That's the runt all over, counting his chickens when he ain't even stole no eggs yet. I grumbled. You remember what we were just discussing? Stupid moves? And you'd dare get down on Goblin? Of course he would. That was his great mission. What's going on? Goblin demanded. Uncle Doge materialized. His presence ended the discussion. That man could be spookier than any shade he moved so fast and quiet. Speaker says, tell you, southerners carrying tools instead of weapons are assembling south of the city. And what's that over there? From our perch, most of the activity was hidden behind the curve of the wall, but it looked like a big engineering party had begun to gather north of the city as well. You see any prisoners or slaves out there? Huh? What's that? That was the sparkle of sunlight off metal in the hills. The sparkle repeated itself. People were moving out there, not carefully enough. Shadow Spinner's men had no need to sneak. I told Goblin, pass the word, full alert come sundown. Uncle Doge considered the hills. You have good eyes, Bone Warrior. Know something, Stubby? I'd a whole lot rather be called Mergen. The squat man smiled thinly. As you wish, Mergen. I have come on behalf of the speaker. He says, tell you. Hard times are coming. He says, prepare your hearts and minds. Hard times. One eye laughed. The party is over, kid. Now we got to pay for loafing around and getting fat while the hooris slithered all over us. Keep it in mind next time you're tempted to do some profiteering. Ah, you can't eat money, one eye. Kill joy. That's me all over. Tell Weezer to hike over to the Citadel and tell Sindawe the Southerners are up to something. Sindawe might be all right. I could talk to him without having to conquer an urge to squeeze his throat. And this would cover me on keeping Mogaba informed. What would happen if the Shadow Master just up and walked away, leaving us to sort ourselves out? Sounded like the smart thing for him to do. Chapter 45 Weezer barely made it to the top. Then he spent five minutes hacking and wheezing before he could talk. That old man had no business soldiering at his age. He ought to be off living off his grandchildren. But like the rest of us, he had nothing outside the company. He would die under the death's head standard, under what passed for a standard today. It was sad, pathetic even. Weezer was an anomaly. Usually the mercenary life is brutal and short, pain and fear and misery only occasionally interrupted by a fleeting moment of pleasure. What keeps you sane is the unfailing comradeship of your brethren. In this company. In lesser bands. But they're not the black company. Croker and I both put a lot of effort into sustaining that brotherhood. In fact, it looked like time to resurrect Croker's habit of readings from the annals so the men would remember that they were a part of something more enduring than most kingdoms. I told Weezer, you better take a couple hours off. He shook his head. He would go on the best he could until he could go on no more. The Nar, Lieutenant, Sindawe, 
sends greetings. He said, We better look out tonight. He mentioned why. He sort of hinted that Mogaba might try some big stunt after dark. Mogaba was always trying some big stunt. Shadow Spinner ought to let him set himself up. One raid too many at the wrong time, and Mogaba would find out personally why Spinner was called a Shadow Master. Weezer said something in his native tongue. Only one eye understood him. Sounded like a question. One eye muttered a few clicky syllables in reply. I figured the old man wanted to know if it was all right to talk in front of the Nguyeng Bao. One eye gave him the go ahead. Weezer said, Sindawi said, Tell you guys, the rumors about a big battle are probably true. We owe Sindawe, guys, I said. That sounds to me like him telling us he won't back Mogaba a hundred percent anymore. Tai Day and Uncle Doge sucked up our conversation like Nguyen Bao sponges. Tension built for hours. With no real evidence, we began to feel this night would be critical. Mostly the guys worried about new nastiness from Mogaba. We didn't expect trouble from the Shadow Master any time soon. I kept an eye on the hills. One eye snapped. That it is. He shared my anticipations. Pinkish light flared. Lightning crackled around a bizarre rider. She's back, somebody said. Where's the other one? I did not see a widowmaker right away. Panic swept the plane. The apparition had taken the scattered Shadowlander camps unawares. Sergeants shrieked orders. Messengers galloped around. Soldiers stumbled into one another. There he is, Bucket yelled. There who is? Widowmaker, he pointed. The old man. The Widowmaker figure shimmered back in the hills, larger than life. Goblin grabbed my arm. I don't know where he came from. Look over there! He indicated the Shadowlander main camp. We could not see the camp itself, but a pale, gangrenous glow rose from its approximate location. The light intensified steadily. Spinner wants to play, I observed. Yeah, he's sending a big one. A big what? Do we need to get our heads down? Wait and see. I waited, and I saw. A nasty ball of green fire streaked toward the hills. It hit near where Life Taker first showed herself. Earth flew, stone burned, all to no avail. Life Taker was long gone. He missed. What an eye! Life Taker didn't play fair. She didn't stand still. He made a stupid choice of tools, one eye sneered. You can't expect somebody to just hang around and wait for you. Maybe that was his best go. He hasn't been healthy. I sidled away. In a few minutes, Goblin and one eye would start bickering. The confusion on the plane worsened. The Southerners were more rattled than seemed reasonable. What I could get from their chatter suggested that they had been caught just starting something big of their own, and their disarray left them virtually unable to defend themselves. In hushed tones, too, I heard Kina mentioned. Life Taker, who resembled that goddess of corruption, vanished. Maybe she lost interest. She did not reappear. Shadow Spinner pasted the hills with any sorcery he could slap together. Other than starting a few brush fires, he had no obvious impact. The fox was in the henyard.
Southerners scooted all over, their panic feeding on the panic of others. When one got close, my guys took turns sniping. Goblin said, They keep cussing about their feet getting wet. I heard that too. It made no sense. Holy shit! I don't know who said it, but I could not have agreed more. Scores of brilliant white fireballs erupted straight up above the Shadowlander main camp. They obliterated the darkness completely. They seemed a tool of more use to a Shadowmaster's enemies than to the villain himself. A huge uproar followed. Uncle Doge vanished. One moment he was beside me, the next a shadow running through the street below, then gone. One eye told me, This time, I'm sure it's Lady. His tone alerted me. But what? But the other one ain't the captain. Widowmaker had been visible for less than one minute. Tell me it ain't so, I muttered. What? That we got two sets? Each one only half the real thing? A crow nearby cackled. I asked, what kind of sorcery would do that? Split them in two. I wish I could tell you something you want to hear, kid. But I've got a very bad feeling there's stuff going on we don't even want to know about. Chapter 46 One Eye Was a Prophet Although I did want to know, and thanks to the Nguyen Bao, I heard a story. The light across town faded. The attendant racket subsided. Part of that drifted toward the hills. The rest fell back toward Mogaba's part of town. The crackle of small sorceries rippled across the plain. The whole expanse glistened silver. That was a strange one. One eye. What say we build a watchtower on top of one of the enfilading towers? That way, we could get high enough to see what Mogaba and Spinner are doing. You got Nguyen Bao to spy for you over there. Suppose I don't ask you to do any work yourself? The idea sounds a lot better already. But I still think the Nguyen Bao could be your eyes. You play it right. You don't need to get as paranoid as Croker. Just look at what they bring you, so you see whose purpose it might serve. Consider what might be missing the same way. Sometimes I'm as lazy as you are, I told one eye. Only with me, it's mental. That sounds like a lot of thinking and I'd rather see stuff with my own eyes anyway. Just like the old man, he grumbled. You got to read them annals all the time. How about you read some that was written by somebody besides Croker? I was looking forward to a little relief from his righteousness. So we were back to the black market bread scheme. The goblin turned up. Pretty exciting stuff happening over there. Yeah, like what? I got up on the wall over there. For a while. Mogaba's guys weren't worried about getting caught letting me peek. He led this raid in person. Just tell us about it, one I grumbled. You all the time got the flap on about stuff that... A huge bug landed in one eye's mouth. Goblin's smirk hinted that he might have been involved in the insect's errant navigation. That Doge character can tell you more than me. Some of his guys snuck out there behind Mogaba's gang. Why? I think Mogaba was trying to bushwhack Spinner. But he stumbled into Lady instead. You're shitting me. When that bunch of flare balls went up, there she was, her and about fifteen guys. They were right outside the camp gate, practically crawling over Mogaba's mob. At least that's what I heard, 
I didn't see it myself. So where is Uncle Doge? Probably checking in with the speaker. Probably. Yeah. Look, we've got a bunch of deserters from the first. See if some will sneak back to find out more. Here comes Chunky Boy now. We talked right in front of Ty Day, like he was deaf. Or like we didn't care squat what he heard. Uncle Doge brought a couple other Nguyen Bao. They surrounded another Chunky Boy. This one, a wide little Taglian. He seemed more prisoner than companion, though no weapons were in evidence. It amazed me that Uncle Doge could climb to the ramparts without breathing hard. Maybe he used some wild sorcery that stole Weezer's breath. That sounded like something out of the Goonie myth book. What have you got, Uncle? I stared at the squat Taglian. He was indifferent to my gaze. An outsider. The speaker sent Bon and Bin to watch the black men who wanted to attack the Shadow Master himself. But they ran into others from the outside, pursuing a similar goal. This one left his party and joined those running for the wall when the flares went up. The outsider group may have been betrayed intentionally, so this one could become separated in the confusion. I continued to study the outsider. He was a goonie more stockily built than anyone in these parts. Maybe he worked at that. He seemed possessed of a powerful arrogance. I asked, is there anything special about him? Uncle Doge seemed strongly interested in him, too. He bears the mark of Kadi. That took a moment. Oh, yeah. In the books from the catacombs, Kadi was an alternate or regional name for Kina. There were quite a few of those. If you say so, I don't see it myself. Point it out. Uncle Doge's eyes narrowed. He drew a deep breath, exasperated. Even now, you refuse to reveal yourself, soldier of darkness. Even now, I don't have any fucking idea what you're raving about. I am tired of hearing it. I was developing suspicions, though. Instead of sputtering and fussing and offering cryptic grumbles, why don't you say something I can understand? Pretend I'm what I say I am and can't call down the lightning to part your hair. Who is this guy? Who do you think I am? Come on, uncle. Talk to me. He is a slave of Kadi. Uncle Doge glared at me, daring me not to understand that. He did not want to be more explicit. That made no sense to me, but I am not a superstitious man. Did he believe his one mouth had the power to raise the she-devil alone? Kina must be one badass bitch, I told one eye. She's got Uncle drizzling down his leg. You. You got a name. I am Sindu. I am of the staff of the warrior woman you call Lady. I was sent to observe the situation here. He continued to meet my gaze. His eyes were colder than any lizard's. Sounds reasonable enough, if taken with a block of salt. Lady. This is the lady who was second in command in the Black Company? That lady. The goddess has smiled upon her. I asked Uncle Doge, is she a liaison man then? Between us and lady? He may tell you so, but he is a spy for the Tug. He will not speak truth when a lie will do. Uncle, old buddy, you and me and the old man need to sit down and try to talk the same language for a while. What do you think? Uncle Doge grunted, which could mean anything. 
The Tug will not speak truth when a lie will do. Sindhu was amused. The man struck me as a complete false face. I said, Goblin, find this guy some place to sleep. I shifted languages, and don't let him out of your sight. I have chores enough already. Somebody's sight, all right? I don't like him at all. I don't think I'm going to like him even this much tomorrow morning. He smells like trouble. One I agreed. Big trouble. Why don't we just chuck his hairy ass off the wall, then? Goblin can be pragmatic in the extreme. Because I want to find out more about him, I think we've called right up to the edge of the mystery that has hung us up ever since we got here. Let him run free. We'll play dumb and keep track of every breath he takes. I was sure I could count on the speaker's help with that. My two wizards scowled and grumbled. Hard to blame them. They always end up carrying the load. Chapter 47 I was snoring heroically down deep in our warrens, having gone to nod confident I could sleep in. Tomorrow, nobody would have the ambition to get up to any mischief. I was down there so far and so far out of the way that not five people knew where to find me. I was on a mission to catch up on my sleep. If the end of the world came, the guys could celebrate without me. Somebody shook me. I refused to believe it. It had to be a bad dream. Mergen, come on. You got to come see this. No, I didn't. Mergen! I cracked an eyelid. I'm trying to get some sleep here, Bucket. Go away. You ain't got time. You gotta come see. I gotta come see what? You'll see. Come on. There would be no winning this. He would pester me till I lost my temper, then get his feelings hurt. But the long climb to the sunshine was not an inducement to rise. All right. All right. I got up and got myself together. They didn't need to drag me out, but I understood the impulse. Things had changed. Radically. I stared at the plane, mouth open. Only what plane? Dejagore was surrounded by a shallow lake that featured the tops of burial mounds as small islands. Each mound boasted its handful of disconsolate animals. How deep is it? I asked. And, there any chance we can catch some of those critters for the pot? With all that water down there, no southerner would be guarding against sorties. Right now, five feet, Goblin said. I had men go down and measure. Is it still coming up? Where is it coming from? Where's Shadow Spinner? Goblin pointed. I don't know about Spinner, but there's the water. Still coming in. I have good eyes. I made out the water boiling and foaming as it roared out of the hills. The old aqueduct came down there, didn't it? Two major canals had irrigated the hill farms and fed aqueducts to Dejagore before the fighting started. The company cut those when the southerners were on the inside. Now the city survived on rainwater and the contents of large, deep, very stagnant cisterns we knew nothing about back then. Exactly. Clayton and his brothers figure they diverted the entire river into the canal. Same thing south of town. Dejagore sits on a plain below the level of the country beyond the hills. Modest rivers run both west and southeast of the hills. I presume the boys are studying the engineering aspects? I asked. Them and three dozen Taglians who had some skills the guys could use? Any conclusions yet? Like? 
Like, how high will the water get? Are we going to drown? If that was Shadow Spinner's plan, it indicated major changes in his thinking. Before, he wanted Dejagore recovered intact. This seemed a more practical and final answer to his problems, though more destructive of property, which of course was more valuable than any number of lives. They're trying to figure that out right now, I grunted. I take it Spinner pulled out after Lady left. No, one I responded. They hung around to swim. They don't get to a lot of beach parties where they come from. Man's not as stupid as we thought, I mused. Ah! He floods the plain. Even if he don't drown us, he locks us up so tight, he don't have to use hardly any men to keep us under control. He can chase Lady all he wants. We can't help her and she can't help us. For him, it's better than getting reinforcements out of the Shadowlands. Long Shadow soldiers couldn't be trusted behind his back. Tide showed up. He always turned up soon after I came out, which indicated how closely we were being watched. Tai Day was a waste of manpower. He didn't carry many messages. He didn't understand any of our languages well enough to be a good spy for the speaker. But he was always, always just a few steps away. There would be a reason. The speaker would do nothing without consideration. I just did not grasp his view of the world. The longer I stared at the flood, the more questions I came up with that needed answers soon. Most critical, how high would the water rise? How long would it take to do so? The rate of rise would slow down substantially as each vertical foot required more water volume because of the fallback of the hills, evaporation from the larger surface area, and absorption by more covered soil. I told Goblin and One-Eye, Dig up every educated man in town and give him to the brothers. I thought about building boats and heightening towers and securing stores. I thought about our vast and wonderful warrens and the likelihood that thousands of man-hours would go for naught. I thought about how we would have to prepare ourselves mentally for lots worse if we were going to survive. I thought about Kidam and his talk of hard times to come. Tide stepped over when nobody else was near. Grandfather would speak with you, soon if possible. His manners were impeccable. He did not call me Stone Soldier, even once. The old man must want something badly. As you wish. I noticed the outsider Sindhu on the battlements off toward the western gate. I could feel him watching me. One eye. What? You don't need to bark. If you want to bark, I'll see if I can have the Shadow Master turn you into a dog. One eye was startled. Huh? You guys keeping an eye on our guest? Geek and Freak are taking turns. He ain't done much yet. Wandered around town, talked to people, tried visiting with the Taglians here and over with Mogaba. Ours wouldn't have anything to do with him. The Al Kul company ran him off with their swords drawn. Would anybody talk about him? One eye shook his head. It's the same old shit. Maybe even worse. You better make it clear. Him being here wasn't your idea. Tide, listening, murmured something that sounded Kabbalistic. He followed with a gesture resembling that, meant to avert the evil eye. Hi, one eye said. Something can bother these guys after all. I'm going to go listen to their boss talk. You're in charge but only because everybody else around here is less trustworthy than you. Thanks a shitload, kid. 
You make a guy feel like he's on top of the world. Try to have something left when I get back. Chapter 48 The vertigo hit me in the same alleyway as before, just yesterday. I remembered it as the darkness closed in. This was more of a sneaking, gentle, enveloping blackness than the thunderbolts that got me before. My thoughts scrambled, but I did recall several minimal episodes since the big blackout, just moments when I was out of my head, and I came back as soon as somebody said something. This one was stronger. Tide's hands closed on my left bicep. He spoke, but his words were sounds that had no meaning. The light faded. My knees went watery. Then there was no sensation at all. There was a place that was brighter than day, although it was daytime. Huge mirrors gathered sunlight and splashed it onto one tall, gaunt individual in black. The gaunt man stood upon a windswept parapet high above a darkening land. A scream ripped through the air. A dark rectangle slanted toward the tower from high above and far away. The gaunt figure fitted a stylized mask to its face. Its breathing increased pace, as though it needed more air to face visitors. Another scream tore the air. The gaunt man muttered, Someday. The ragged flying carpet settled a short distance away. The masked man remained motionless, glaring at every hint of shadow around the device. The wind tugged at his robe. Three persons rode the flying carpet. One was a tiny thing, bundled in dark, stinking rags crumbling with mildew. He was masked, too, and shook continuously. He could not control the occasional scream. He was the Howler, one of the world's oldest and most wicked sorcerers. The carpet was his creation. The Gaunt Man hated him. The Gaunt Man hated everybody. He had little love for himself. He mastered his hatreds for short periods only, entirely through the implacable exercise of will. He had a powerful will, as long as he was not threatened physically. The rag ball gurgled as it stifled a scream. Howler's nearest companion was a short, skinny, filthy little man in a ragged loincloth and grubby turban. He was frightened. His name was Narayan Singh, living saint of the deceiver cult alive only because of Howler's intercession. Long Shadow considered Singh less than a flop of buffalo dung. Nevertheless, he had potential as a tool. The reach of his cult was long and lethal. Singh's opinion of his own new ally was of no supreme elevation either. Beyond Singh was a child, a pretty little thing, though filthier than the Jamadar. She had huge brown eyes, eyes like the windows of hell, eyes that knew all evil of old and would revel in it now and forevermore. Those eyes troubled even Long Shadow. There were whirlpools of darkness that pulled Pulled, twisted, hypnotized. A sudden sharp pain in my left knee sent wires of agony searing through my flesh. I groaned. I shook my head. The stink of an alleyway penetrated my awareness. I seemed blind. But my eyes, apparently, were adapted to brilliant sunlight. Hands gripped my left arm, pulling, lifting. My vision began to return. I looked up. A gaunt face looked back, startling me. 
I retained a legacy of fear from my vision. Though what that had been was fading already. I tried to hang on, but the pain in my knee and Tide talking shattered my concentration. I'm all right, I said. It just hurt my knee. I tried to stand. When I took a step, the knee almost folded. I'll manage, damn it! I pushed his hands away. The vision was gone except for a memory that it had happened. Had it been the same with my other blackouts? Were there visions that flew away so thoroughly that I could not recall having had them? Did they have any connection with reality? Vaguely, I recalled seeing lots of familiar faces. I would discuss it with Goblin and One-Eye. They ought to know what to make of it. They picked up a little loose change interpreting dreams. Tide started gabbling the moment we entered the speaker's presence. Kidam considered me speculatively, his expression deepening oddly as Tai Dei chattered. The old man appeared to be alone when we walked in, but as Tai Dei talked and Kidam became unusually attentive, other Nguyen Bao came out of the shadows to study me. Hong Tre and Ki Gota were the first. The old woman settled by her husband. Kidam said, I hope you do not mind. Sometimes she is able to part the veil of time. Gota said nothing. I suspected that that was unusual. The beautiful woman appeared. She got right into the tea service business. Tea is a big thing with the Yuen Bao. Did she serve any other function in the family? The guy in the shadows wasn't moaning and groaning today. Had he left us? Not yet, the speaker said, reading my glance. But soon. Again, he sensed a question. We sustain our share of the marriage vow, even though he betrayed his. We will stand before the judges of time without stain on our karma. I had a notion what he meant only because I was studying the Jaikuri scriptures. You're a good people. Kidam was amused. Some might argue. We do strive to be an honorable folk. I understand. We so strive in the Black Company. Excellent. I came because Taide said you want to talk. I did. I waited. My gaze kept straying to the woman making tea. Stand up, bear. I started. No, I said softly, unaware that I was speaking aloud. I hadn't fallen into one of those black fugues. I'd just become distracted momentarily. Couldn't blame a man for that. Not with a woman like that to distract him. I said, thank you, speaker, for not labeling me with one of those unappealing names you tend to employ. I couldn't resist a small smile that told him I knew he wanted something badly enough to keep me in a generous mood. He nodded in turn, acknowledging my awareness. Damn, I was turning into an old man myself. Maybe we could sit here grinning and grunting and nodding and arrange the whole future of the world. Thank you, I said, when the pretty woman presented my tea. That surprised her. She looked me in the eye for a moment, startling me. Her eyes were green. She neither smiled nor acknowledged me in any other way. Remarkable, I said to nobody in particular. Green eyes. Then I controlled myself and waited while the speaker sipped some tea before he started circling in on his problem. He told me, Green eyes are rare and greatly admired among Yuang Bao. He took a ritual sip. 
Hong Tre may part the veil occasionally, but her visions are not always true or not always fixed. Or they may be visions that have not yet come to pass. She does not see recognizable people, so it is hard to determine when the visions might be taking place. Um... The woman in question sat with eyes downcast, slowly turning a jade bracelet that hung loose upon her left wrist. Her eyes were green, too. She foresaw the flood. We believed that would prove to be a false vision because we could imagine no way so much water could be brought to Jaikur. But we're in the middle of a lake now, the world's widest moat. The Shadowlanders won't bother us anymore. It took the old man a minute to understand that I wasn't serious. Oh, he chuckled. Hong Tre looked up and smiled. She had gotten the joke first. I see, yes. But it will serve the Shadow Master, not us. Any attempt to leave will require rafts or boats, easily spotted, which cannot move enough men to force a breakthrough. The old boy was a general, too. You got it. Shadow Spinner had found an ingenious solution to his manpower problem. Now he could challenge Lady, confident that we would not jump on his back. The reason I wish to confer is that in her vision, Hong Tre saw the water rise to within ten feet of the battlements. That would make seventy feet of water. I glanced at the old woman. She seemed to be studying me in a way that had nothing to do with curiosity. That's a shitload. There is another problem, which is... We try to calculate how many structures will rise above the waterline. Uh-oh. I see. I saw... Dejagore enjoyed a vertically oriented architecture, as walled cities do, but not many buildings overtopped the wall. And most surviving structures, even many that were partially burned, were occupied by someone. There would not be much housing available if the city flooded. Luckily for us old crew, our quarter boasted a lot of tall tenements. Uh oh, indeed. In this area, there are enough such structures to house our few pilgrims. But elsewhere, it will go hard for the Jaikuri when the black men and their soldiers finally understand how much space they will need. No doubt. I thought a moment. Hell, people could camp out on the wall. Them getting in the way would not be a problem militarily. Still, whatever we did, life would become pure hell if the water rose that high. Presents a dilemma, doesn't it? Possibly a larger dilemma than you suspect. How so? If preparations are not initiated immediately, much that might prove useful will be lost. But if you tell Mogava this then it is likely the strong will rob the weak and leave them to suffer. There is now no need to exercise restraint because of potential attack. I see. Actually, I had foreseen the scramble for stores and high ground, but I did overlook the fact that Shadow Spinner, extricating himself, also freed Mogaba to manage internal frictions in a manner more to his liking. You have something in mind? I wish to examine the possibility of a temporary alliance until Jai Kaur is relieved. Has Hong Tre foreseen that as well? No. I was surprised by the black despair that collapsed upon me. 
she has seen nothing one way or the other. I brightened. A very little. I am reluctant to undertake such an obligation, Kidam confessed. It was not my idea. It was Sarah's. He indicated the beautiful tea server. But she trusts you for no reason she will explain. And moreover, her arguments make sense. Entre wore a bemused expression. There was, in the way she looked at me, a hint that she foresaw much that she didn't share. I shivered. Kidam continued, We have no hope if we assume a traditional Nguyen Bao stance and depend upon ourselves alone. You have little hope if your Mokapa does not feel he needs your arms any more. I stared at the beautiful one, though that was bad manners. She blushed. The attraction was so powerful suddenly that I gasped. I felt as though I had known her several lifetimes already. What the? This didn't happen to me. Not anymore, anyway. I was no sixteen-year-old. Hell, I never felt like this when I was sixteen. My soul was trying to tell me I knew this woman as well as a man ever knew any woman, when, in truth, I had only just heard her name spoken for the first time. There was something else over there, with her. That was more than one lovely daydream. I knew another one just like her. Someone else. The darkness came. It was sudden and absolute, and I had no time to decide if I was running away or being pulled down. Chapter 49 There was a long, long time in the dreamless dark. A time without an eye. A time neither warm nor cold. A time with no happiness or fear or pain, in a place no tortured soul would want to leave. But a pin pricked a hole in the envelope. The tiniest thread of light found its way in and fell upon an imaginary eye. Movement. A rush toward a point which swelled and became a passageway into a world of time and matter and pain. I knew who I was. I staggered under the crushing weight of a host of congruent memories surfacing all at once. A voice spoke to me, but I could not comprehend its words. I floated like gossamer through golden caverns where old men sat beside the way, frozen in time, immortal but unable to move an eyelid. Madmen, they. Some were covered with fairy webs of ice as though a thousand winter spiders had spun threads of frozen water. Above, an enchanted forest of icicles grew downward from the cavern ceiling. Because I had memories of memories within memories, I recalled having read words very much like those somewhere in something I didn't believe had yet been written. Come! The power of the call was like the punch of a thunderbolt. Darkness came. I tumbled away, ceased being I. Nevertheless, before I faded from that cavern, I sensed a startled presence coming alert and striving to direct its attention my way. Somehow, I had gone somewhere where no mortal was welcome to travel and still come away. Memory fled, but pain went along on the journey. Chapter 50 Light in the darkness again. I began to be I, though without a name. I shied from the light. The light was not a pleasant place. 
The pain would be waiting. But something farther beneath my surface turned to the light like a drowning man fighting toward life-saving air. I became aware that I was flesh. I felt my muscles tightened till some were cramped. My throat was painfully dry. I tried to talk. Speaker, I rasped. Someone stirred, but no one replied. I was slumped in a chair. The Nguyen Bao had no furniture in their place, which was little more than an animal den. Had they returned me to my own people? I forced an eye open. What the hell? What was this place? A dungeon? A torture chamber? Had Mogaba snatched me? There was a skinny little taglion over there tied into a chair just like mine, and another man was strapped onto a table. That was smoke. The taglion royal wizard. I levered myself up. That hurt. A lot. The prisoner in the chair watched me warily. Where am I? I asked. His wariness redoubled. His lips pursed. He said nothing. I looked around. I was in a dusty, almost barren chamber, but the nature of the stone answered my question. I was in Taglios. This was the royal palace. There is no stone like this stone anywhere else. How? Ever seen paint run down a wall? That's what happened to reality. Right in front of my eyes, it ran and dribbled and streaked. The man in the chair squeaked. He shook. I have no idea what he thought he saw, but reality drifted away, and I was in a gray place, confused, filled with memories of things never experienced or seen. Then the confusion began to sort itself out, and the gray washed away, and in a short time, I was in a room somewhere in the palace at Trogo Taglios. Smoke lay on his table, breathing slowly and shallowly as always. The deceiver was in his seat. He earned a narrow-eyed glare because of the way he was sweating. What was he up to now? His eyes bugged. What did he see when he looked at me? I rose, aware that I had to be recovering from one of my spells. But there was no one here who could have brought me back. Didn't it take Croker or One-Eye to drag me up out of the depths of darkness? Hints of memory stirred in the deeps of my mind. I snatched at them and tried desperately to hang on. Something in a cavern. A song of shadow. Waking up once in a past long ago, but still only a moment earlier in this time, I was weak. This business was debilitating, and thirst was becoming a rage within me. I could do something about that. A pitcher and metal cup stood on the table beside Smoke's head. Beneath the cup, I found a scrap of paper torn from a larger sheet. It carried a message in Croker's tight script. No time to coddle you now, Mergen. If you wake up on your own, drink this water. There is food in the box. One eye or I will be back as soon as possible. The scrap might have come from a procurement request. The old man hates to waste any fragment of blank paper. Paper is too damned dear. I checked the tin box on the other side of Smoke's head. It was filled with heavy, unleavened cakes of the sort my mother-in-law bakes, despite all pleas to desist. In fact, on closer examination, I knew no one else could have baked them. If I survived here, I would owe Croker a swift kick in the slats. P.S. checked the strangler's bonds. He nearly got away once already. So that was what he was doing when I woke up. 
He wanted to warm him out so he could murder me and my pal Smoke and then make a run for it. I drank from the pitcher. The deceiver looked at me with a longing you could almost smell. Want a sip? I asked. Just tell me what's going on. The man wasn't ready to sell his soul for a drink of water. Soon after I wolfed down one of Mother Gota's sinkers, I felt my strength returning. Let's get you cinched up good and tight, I told my companion. Wouldn't want you wandering off and getting hurt. He stared at me in silence while I fixed him up. He didn't need to speak to let me know what was on his mind. I told him, this is the risk you took when you signed on with the bad guys. He wouldn't argue, but he refused to agree. I was confused. I was the bad guy because I wasn't blazing hot on the effort to bring Kina back into the world. I patted his head. You could be right, brother. But I hope not. Here. I snatched up the cloth and drew it back over him where it belonged. Then I drank some more water and ate part of a roll, and when I got to feeling frisky, I decided to return to my apartment. It was subjective as hell, but it was an age since I had seen my wife. In reality, it couldn't have been more than a few hours. I got lost. If you enjoyed this audiobook, the rest of Glenn Cook's Black Company series is available today. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.